Chapter 11. Clash. They hesitated for a moment. Dominic's warning was followed by a shout from Micah, and the others hurried down the stair. Halfway to the ground floor, Dominic faltered, swaying a little on his feet. Something approaches. Reaching the main floor, Aretha and the others hurried to the door and looked out. In the sky above, more of the glowing objects streaked overhead with unbelievable speed. First from one quarter of the sky, then another, they sped, their strange, ominous droning filling the night. Faster and faster they shot through the air, streaks of blue, green, yellow and red, angry flashes of brilliance ripping through the dark. What are they? shouted Jimmy. Magic sentinels of some kind, answered the abbot. I can sense they are searching the area they pass over. Slowly, the pattern changed. Instead of passing directly overhead, they began to curve and fly off at a tangent to their original course. Those below could see that the objects were slowing in their flight. The curving course tightened until the glowing objects sped through the night in great arcs overhead. Then they slowed even more, gaining definition. They were large spheres, pulsing with a bright inner light, and inside could be seen strange dark shapes, somehow disturbing in appearance. They continued to slow until they hovered and spiralled, forming a circle above the abbey courtyard. Once the circle was formed, twelve glowing spheres could be seen hanging silently and motionless over the courtyard. Then... With a deep snapping, buzzing sound, painful to the ears, lines of energy shot across the gap between each pair, and six lines joined the spheres. Then a line formed around the periphery, so that now the spheres formed a dodecagon. What are these things? Gardan wondered aloud. The twelve eyes, the abbot said in awe. An ancient and evil spell of legend. No one living is said to have the power to form this thing. It is both a vehicle for seeing and a weapon. Then the spheres slowly began to move. Gaining speed, they began weaving an intricate pattern, the lines twisting maddeningly beyond the ability of the eye to follow. Faster they spun until they became a blurring solid of light. A shaft of energy shot down from the centre, striking some invisible barrier above the roofs of the buildings. Dominic screamed in pain and had to be caught by Martin. The monk's hands pressed hard against his temples and he said, So powerful! I can scarcely believe! He opened eyes running with tears and said, The barriers are holding! Father John said, Brother Dominic's mind is the keystone to the mystic defences of the Abbey. He is being sorely tested. Again, angry energies shot downwards to be scattered across the invisible barrier, like a multicoloured shower above their heads. Shards of mystic rainbow light streaked down the sides of the magic barrier, defining the dome above the Abbey for the eye to see. But again, the barrier held. Then another and another, and soon Aretha and the others could see that the barrier was being pushed lower each time. With each assault, Dominic would cry out in pain. Then, with explosive fury, a single shaft of blinding white light struck the barrier and broke through, searing the ground with an angry hiss and acrid odour. With the attack, Brother Dominic stiffened in Martin's arms and groaned. It is entering, he whispered, before he passed into unconsciousness. As Martin lowered the monk to the floor, Father John said, I must go to my vestry. Brother Micah, you must hold it. Micah told them, Whatever is out there has breached a mystic defence second only to that at our Father Temple. Now I must face it. I am armed and shielded by Ishap, the old monk said in ritual as he unlimbered the war hammer at his belt. A roar of impossible volume, like a thousand lions voicing rage at once, shook the abbey. 
It began as a teeth-jarring shriek and ran down the scale until it seemed to grind at the very stones of the building. Bolts of energy lashed out, seemingly in random directions, and where they struck, destruction ensued. Stones seemed to crumble under the onslaught. Whatever was flammable was set afire, and any water touched by the bolts exploded into clouds of steam. They watched as Micah left the building, striding out to stand below the spinning disc. As if anticipating, he raised his hammer above his head as another bolt of energy lashed downwards, blinding those who watched from the door. When the initial blaze of white died down, they could see Micah standing upright, hammer held overhead as the crackling energies cascaded around him, scattering in broken spectrum, so that all the colours of the rainbow danced within the inferno. The very ground at his feet smoked and burned, but he was unharmed. Then the flow of energy halted, and in an instant Micah had pulled back his hammer and made his throw. Almost too quick for the eye to follow, the hammer left his hand and became a blur of blue-white energy as bright and blinding as its target. Higher than was possible for a man to throw, the bolt of flame sped, striking the blazing disc dead centre. It seemed to bounce off the disc and the blue bolt returned to Micah's hand. The thing lashed out at Micah again, but once more he was protected by the hammer's mystic powers. Again, he cast his hammer as soon as the rain of light ceased, striking it at the heart. As the hammer returned, those inside the abbey could see that the thing was beginning to wobble slightly as it spun. A third time he cast his hammer and it struck. Suddenly there was a rending sound, a tearing so loud that Aretha and the others were forced to cover their ears. The circling spheres shattered and from the centre of each plunged small alien shapes. With a wet plopping noise they struck the ground, wiggled grotesquely and began to smoke. A high keening shriek filled the night as they erupted into brilliant flame. No one could discern the true forms of the creatures from the spears, but Aretha was filled with a sense it was something best left undiscovered. For in the instant they ignited, the shapes resembled nothing so much as horribly disfigured babies. Then the night was silent, as a rain of sparkling colours, like fine motes of glass star stuff, began to fall on the abbey. One by one the motes flared and winked out, until the old monk stood silently in the court, his war hammer held before him. Those who stood in the shelter of the abbey looked at one another, astonishment on their faces. For a long moment they said nothing. Then they began to relax. That was... incredible, said Laurie. I don't know if I could find the words to describe it. Aretha was about to speak, but something in the way Jimmy and Martin both cocked their heads to one side made him stop. Jimmy said, I hear something. They all stood silent for a moment, then could hear a distant sound, as if some great bird or bat flapped giant wings in the night. Jimmy ran from the building before anyone could stop him, nearly spinning as he scanned every quarter of the night sky. Looking back over the roof of the abbey towards the north, he saw something that made his eyes widen. Bernath! he exclaimed, and dashed to where the old monk still stood, unmoving and silent. Micah seemed in some sort of trance, eyes closed. Jimmy gripped his arm and shook him. Look! he shouted as the monk opened his eyes. Micah looked to where the boy pointed. Blotting out the large moon in the night sky was something that flew towards the abbey, propelled on giant, powerful wings. Instantly, the monk shoved the boy away. Run! The push sent Jimmy away from the abbey, so he raced across the courtyard to where a lone wagon sat, filled with fodder for the stables, and dived under it. With a roll and a turn, he lay still, watching. A thing of despair, fashioned in a shape of utter horror, descended from the sky. 
Wings a full fifty feet in width flapped lazily as it dropped down to where the old monk stood. It was a twenty-foot-tall composite of everything loathsome to sane beings. Black talons extended from grotesque parodies of birds' claws, atop which rose legs reminiscent of a goat's. But where haunches should have been, only great wattles of fat, huge rings of blubber shook and quivered, hanging impossibly down from below a man-like chest. Over the body, a thick, wet-looking substance oozed downwards in rivulets. In the centre of the thing's chest, a blue-coloured but otherwise normal-looking human face stared out in wide-eyed horror, constantly twitching and screaming in gibbering counterpoint to the thing's own loud bellows. Each arm was powerfully fashioned, long and ape-like. It shimmered in faint light, rapidly changing, first red, then orange, yellow and onward through the spectrum until it was again red and from it emitted a mixture of foul odours, as if the vile smell of every decaying and festering thing in the world had been distilled down and infused into the creature's being. Most horrid of all was the head, for in supreme cruelty whatever or whoever had fashioned the misshapen monster had adorned it with a woman's head, large to fit the body but otherwise normal and the ultimate jest was in the features of that face, for, in precise imitation, the thing bore the likeness of Princess Anita. Wild tresses seemed to blow in all directions, framing her features in a cloud of red hair. But its expression was one of a street whore, lewd and wanton, as the thing salaciously licked its lips and rolled its eyes towards Aretha. Blood-red lips split into a wide grin, showing long fangs in place of human eye-teeth. Aretha looked on the thing with a disgust and loathing that rose up to banish any thought save to destroy this obscenity. No! he shouted as he began to pull his sword. Gardan was instantly upon him, driving him to the floor of the building, bringing his strength to bear to hold him down, yelling, That's what they want! Martin lent his strength to stop Aretha, and he and Gardan pulled the prince away from the door. The creature turned to look at those within the door, absently flexing its claws. Pouting like a little girl, it suddenly leered at Aretha, then stuck out its tongue, wiggling it suggestively. Then, with a bellowing laugh, it rose up to its full height and roared at the stars, arms stretched high overhead. With a single step, it moved towards the doorway where the prince waited. Then suddenly, it rocked forwards, shrieked in pain, and turned around. Aretha and his companions looked past it to see a blue-white bolt of energy returning to Brother Micah's hand. He had struck the first blow while the thing had been distracted. Again, he cast his hammer. In a blur, it flashed to strike the thing in its huge stomach, bringing another bellow of pain and rage as a trickle of steaming black blood began to flow. My, my, came a voice from behind Aretha. Laurie saw that Brother Antony had come up from some deep vault beneath the abbey and was peering intently at the creature. Laurie said, What is that thing? Showing no emotion except curiosity, the archivist said, I believe it to be a conjured creature, something fashioned by magic means, brewed up in a vat. I can show you some references in a dozen different works on how to create them. Of course, it could be some rare, naturally occurring beast, but that seems highly improbable. Martin rose, leaving Gardan to restrain Aretha. He unlimbered his ever-present bow, quickly strung it, and fitted an arrow to his bowstring. The creature was advancing upon Brother Micah when Martin let fly. The archer's eyes widened as the arrow seemed to pass through the creature's neck without effect. Brother Antony nodded. Yes, it is a conjuration. Notice how it is impervious to mundane weapons. The creature swung one of its mighty fists down at Brother Micah, but the old fighter simply raised his hammer as if to block. The creature's blow halted a full foot above the monk's upraised hammer, recoiling as if it had hit stone. 
it bellowed in frustration. Martin turned to Brother Anthony. How do you kill it? I don't know. Each of Micah's blows draws energy away from the spell used to create it, but it is a product of tremendous magics, and it might last a day or longer. Should Micah falter... But the old monk was firm on his feet, answering every blow with a parry and wounding the creature seemingly at will. While it seemed pained by each wound the hammer made, it gave no sign of being weakened. How do you make one? Martin asked Brother Antony. Aretha was no longer struggling, but Gardan still knelt with his hand upon his shoulder. Antony, caught up for a second in Martin's question, said, How do you create one? Well, it's rather complex. The creature became increasingly enraged by Micah's blows and hammered uselessly at the monk. Tiring of this tactic, it dropped to its knees as it levelled a blow at Micah overhand as if driving a spike with a hammer. But, at the last instant, it shifted its aim and slammed its massive fist down on the ground next to the monk. The jolt caused Micah to stumble slightly, which was the only opening the creature needed. Instantly sweeping its hand sideways, it knocked Micah across the courtyard. The old monk hit the ground heavily, rolled awkwardly and lay stunned, his hammer bouncing away from him. Then the thing was again moving towards Aretha. Gardan leapt to his feet, pulling his sword as he dashed forwards to protect his prince. The veteran captain stood before the thing, which grinned hideously down at him. The terrible parody of Anita adding a sickening element to the confrontation. Like a cat playing with a mouse, the creature poured at Gardan. From out of an inner door, Father John reappeared, holding a large metal staff topped with an odd-looking seven-sided device. He stepped before Aretha, who was trying to move to aid Gardan, and shouted, No! You can do nothing! Something in his voice told Aretha it was futile to attempt to engage the thing, and the prince retreated a step. The abbot turned to confront the conjured creature. Jimmy crawled out from under the wagon and came to his feet. He knew the uselessness of drawing his dirk. Seeing the supine figure of Brother Micah, he ran to see how he fared. The old monk was still senseless, and Jimmy pulled him back towards the relative safety of the wagon. Gardan hacked uselessly at the creature while it played with him. Jimmy cast about and saw the mystic hammer of Brother Micah lying off to one side. He dived for it and grabbed the haft on the fly, coming to rest on his stomach, eyes upon the monster. The thing had not noticed the boy's recovery of the weapon. Jimmy felt surprised when he lifted it, for it was twice the weight he expected. He rose to his feet and ran to stand behind the monster, confronted by its foul, fur-covered hind quarters, arching above his head as it reached forward to grab Gardan. The captain was seized in a mammoth hand that lifted him towards the widening mouth. Father John raised up his staff, and suddenly waves of green and purple energy flowed from it, washing over the creature. It howled in pain and squeezed Gardan, who cried out in concert. Martin shouted, Stop! It's crushing Gardan! The abbot ceased his magic, and the thing snorted as it tossed Gardan at the door, seeking to injure its tormentors. The captain slammed into Martin, Brother Antony and the abbot, knocking them to the ground. Aretha and Laurie both sidestepped the flying bodies. The prince turned to see the leering parody of Anita's face bending towards the door. The creature's wings prevented it from entering the abbey, but long arms came snaking through the door, reaching for Aretha. Martin rose, helping the shaken abbot and brother Antony to their feet. The archivist said, Yes, of course, the face in its chest. Kill it there! Martin had an arrow knocked in an instant, but the crouching thing hid the target. It reached through the door for Aretha. Then, suddenly, it was sitting back on its haunches, howling in pain. 
For an instant, the face in the chest was visible, and Martin pulled back as he said, Killian, guide my arrow, and let fly. True to the aim, the shaft flew and struck the insane face in the chest square in the forehead. The eyes in that face rolled up and closed as red human blood billowed from the wound. The creature stopped rock still. As all watched in wonder, the creature began to quiver. It grew instantly more brilliant in colour as the lights within flashed rapidly. Then all could see it was becoming transparent, insubstantial, a thing of coloured glowing smokes and gases swirling in a mad dance as they slowly dissipated on the night wind. Their lights faded until once again the courtyard was empty and silent. Aretha and Laurie came up to Gardan, who was still conscious. What happened? the captain asked feebly. All eyes turned to Martin. He indicated Brother Antony, who responded, It was something the Duke asked. How one of those things is made? All the foul arts to make such a being require some animal or human to work upon. That face was all that was left of the poor demented soul who had been used as a focus to create the monster. It was the only mortal part, subject to mundane injury, and when it was killed, the magic unravelled. Martin said, I'd not have made that shot had it not reared back like that. Most fortunate, said the abbot. Fortune had little to do with it, said a grinning Jimmy. He held Brother Micah's hammer as he approached. I stuck it up the arse. He indicated the stunned Micah. He'll do all right, he said as he gave the hammer to the abbot. Aretha was still shaken by the sight of Anita's face atop that horror. Laurie, with a weak smile, said, Father, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, have you some wine we might drink? That was the worst smell I have ever endured. Ha! said Jimmy indignantly. You should have tried it from my end. Aretha watched the dawn break over the Calastius Mountains, the rising sun an angry red orb. In the hours since the attack, the Abbey had returned to a semblance of order and quiet, but Aretha felt only turmoil within. Whatever lay behind these attempts upon him was powerful beyond anything he had anticipated, despite clear warning from Father Nathan and the High Priestess of Lim's Cragmer. He had grown incautious in his haste to discover a cure for Anita, and such was not his nature. He could be bold when needed, and boldness had won him several victories, but of late he had not been bold, only headstrong and impulsive. Aretha felt something alien, something he had not endured since he was a boy. Aretha felt doubt. He had been so confident in his planning, but Mamandamus either had anticipated every move or somehow could react with unbelievable speed each time Aretha made a step. Aretha came out of his musing to see Jimmy beside him. The boy shook his head. Just shows you what I've always said. Despite his concerns, Aretha found himself slightly amused by the boy's tone. What is that? No matter how canny you think you are, something come along, bam, and put you on your prat. Then you think, that's what I forgot to consider. Eagle eye hindsight, old Alvani the Quick used to call it. Aretha wondered if the boy had been reading his thoughts. Jimmy continued. The Ashapians are sitting up here, mumbling prayers to themselves, and convinced they've got a real magic stronghold, and nothing can breach our mystic defences, he mimicked. Then, along come those balls of light, and that flying thing, and whoops, we didn't consider this or that. They've been jabbering about what they should have done for an hour. Well, I guess they'll have something stronger around here soon. Jimmy leaned back against the stone wall facing the cliff. 
Beyond the walls of the abbey, the valley was emerging from the shadows as the sun reached higher in the sky. Old Anthony was telling me that the spells necessary for last night's show took some doing, so he don't think any magic will come this way for a while. They'll be strong in their fortress. Until something comes along that can kick down the gates again, as it were. Something of a philosopher, are you? Aretha smiled slightly as Jimmy shrugged. Scared to pissing in my trousers is what I am, and you'd do well to be scared as well. Those undead things in Crondor were bad enough, but last night, well, I don't know how you feel about it, but if I were you, I'd consider moving to Kesh and changing my name. Aretha smiled ruefully at that, for Jimmy had made him see something he had denied. Now, to be honest, I'm just as scared as you, Jimmy. Jimmy looked surprised at the admission. Truth? In truth. Look, only a madman would not be fearful of facing what we have, and what may come. But what matters isn't whether or not you're frightened, but how you behave. My father said once that a hero is someone who simply got too frightened to use his good sense and run away, then somehow lived through it all. Jimmy laughed, boyish glee making him seem as youthful as his years, rather than the man-boy he looked most of the time. That's the truth, too. Me, I'd rather do what needs to be done quickly and get on to the fun. This suffering for grand causes is the stuff of sagas and legends. Aretha said, See, there's a bit of the philosopher in you after all. He changed topics. You acted swiftly last night, and bravely. Had you not distracted the monster so Martin could slay it, we'd be on our way back to Crondor with your bones, assuming it didn't eat them, finished Jimmy, with a wry grin. Don't look so pleased at the prospect. Jimmy's grin broadened. I'd not be. Fact is, you're one of the very few I've met worth having around. By most standards, this is a merry bunch, though the times are grim. I'm sort of having fun, if the truth be known. You have a strange sense of fun. Jimmy shook his head. Not really. If you're going to be scared senseless, might as well enjoy it. That's what thieving's about, you know. Breaking into someone's home in the dead of night, not knowing if they're awake, and waiting with a sword or club to spread your brains out on the floor when you stick your head in at the window. Being chased through the streets by the city watch. It's not fun... But it sort of is, you know. Anyway, it's exciting. And besides, how many can boast they saved the Prince of Crondor by goosing a demon? Aretha laughed hard at that. Hang me, but that's the first thing I've had to laugh aloud at since... since the wedding. He placed his hand upon Jimmy's shoulder. You earned some reward this day, Squire James... What shall it be? Jimmy's face screwed up in a display of hard thinking. Why not name me Duke of Crondor? Aretha was thunderstruck. He started to speak, but stopped. Martin approached from the infirmary, and seeing such a strange expression on Aretha's face, said, What ails you? Aretha pointed to Jimmy. He wants to be Duke of Crondor. Martin laughed uproariously. When he quieted, Jimmy said, Why not? Julanix here, so you know his retirement's not bogus. Phony don't want the post, so who else are you going to give it to? I've a fair wit and I've done you a favour or two. Martin continued laughing while Aretha said, For which you have been paid. The prince was caught between outrage and amusement. Look, you bandit! I might think about having Liam give you a minor barony, very minor, to take charge of when you reach your majority, which is at least three years away. For now, you'll have to settle for being named Senior Squire of the Court. Martin shook his head. He'll organise them into a street gang. Well, said Jimmy, at least I'll have the pleasure of seeing that ass Jerome's face when you give the lacy the order. Martin stopped his laughing and said, I just thought you'd like to know Gardan will be fine, as will Brother Micah. Dominic is up and about already. The abbot, 
And Brother Anthony? The abbot is off somewhere doing whatever abbots do when their abbeys have been desecrated. And Brother Anthony is back looking for Silverthorn. He said to tell you he'll be in Chamber 67 if you wish to speak with him. Aratha said, I'm going to find him. I want to know what he's discovered. As he walked away, he said, Jimmy, why don't you explain to my brother why I should elevate you to the second most important dukedom in the kingdom? Aratha walked off in search of the head archivist. Martin turned to look at Jimmy, who grinned back at him. Aratha entered the vast chamber, musty with age and the faint odour of preservatives. By flickering lantern light, Brother Anthony was reading an old volume. Without turning to see who entered, he said, Just as I thought, I knew it would be here. He sat up. That creature was similar to one reported killed when the temple of Tith Ananka in Ilariel was invaded three hundred years ago. It was certain, according to these sources, that the Pantathian serpent priests were behind the deed. Aratha said, What are these Pantathians, brother? I've only heard the stories told to frighten children. The old monk shrugged. We know little, in truth. Most of the intelligent races on Midkemia we can, in some way, understand. Even the Morodel, the Brotherhood of the Dark Path, have some traits in common with humanity. You know, they have a rather rigid code of honour, though it is an odd sort by our standards. But these creatures... He closed the book. Where Pantathia lies, no one knows. The copies of the maps left by Macross that Colgan of Stardock sent us show no sign of it. These priests have magics unlike any other. They are the avowed enemies of humanity, though they have dealt with some humans in the past. One thing else is clear. They are beings of undiluted evil. For them to serve this Mamandamus would mark him a foe of all that is good, if nothing else did. And that they serve him also marks him a power to fear. Aratha said, Then we know little more than what we knew by Laughing Jack's report. True, said the monk. But never discount the worth of knowing he spoke the truth. Knowing what things are not is often as important as knowing what they are. Aratha said, In all the confusion, have you discovered anything about Silverthorn? As a matter of fact, I have. I was going to send word as soon as I finished reading this passage. I have little help to offer, I am afraid. Upon hearing this, Aratha's heart sank in his chest, but he indicated the old monk should continue. The reason I could not quickly bring to mind this Silverthorn is that the name given is a translation of the name with which I am more familiar. He opened another book lying close by. This is the journal of Geoffrey, son of Caradoc, a monk at the Abbey of Silban, west of Yarbon, the same one your brother Martin was reared at, though this was several hundred years ago. Geoffrey was a botanist of sorts, and spent his idle hours in cataloguing what he could of the local flora. Here I've found a clue. I'll read it. The plant, which is called Elberry by the elves, is also known to the people of the hills as Sparklethorn. It is supposed to have magic properties when utilised correctly, though the proper means of distillation of the essences of the plant is not commonly known, being required of arcane ritual beyond the abilities of common folk. It is rare in the extreme, having been seen by few living today. I have never beheld the plant, but those with whom I have spoken are most reliable in their knowledge and certain of the plant's existence. He closed the book. Is that all? asked Aratha. I had hoped for a cure, or at least some clue as to how one might be discovered. But there is a clue, said the old monk with a wink. 
Geoffrey, who was more of a gossip than a botanist, attributed the name Elberry to the plant as an elven name. This is obviously a corruption of Alebera, an elven word that translates to Silverthorn, which means that should any know its magic properties and how to overcome them, it is the spell weavers of Elvendar. Arthur was silent for a while, then said, Thank you, Brother Antony. I had prayed to end my search here, but at least you have not dashed all hope. The old monk said, There is always hope, Aratha Condwan. I suspect that in all the confusion, the abbot never got around to telling you the main reason for our gathering all this. His hand waved about him, indicating the masses of books everywhere. The reason we gather all these works in this mount is hope. Of prophecy and portents there are many. But one speaks of the end of all we know. It states that when all else has succumbed to the forces of darkness, all that will be left will be that which was Saf. Should that prophecy come true, we hope to save the seeds of knowledge that can again serve man. We work against that day and pray it will never come. Aratha said, you have been kind, Brother Antony. A man helps when he may. Thank you. Aratha left the chamber and climbed the stairs, his mind playing over what he knew. He considered his options until he reached the courtyard. Laurie had joined Jimmy and Martin, as had Dominic, who seemed to have recovered from his ordeal, though he was still pale. Laurie greeted the prince and said, Gardan should be well enough tomorrow. Good, for we leave Sarth at first light. What do you propose? said Martin. I'm going to put Gardan on the first ship bound from Sarth for Crondor, and we'll continue on. Continue on where? asked Lorry. Elvendar. Martin smiled. It will be good to visit there again. Jimmy sighed. Aratha said, What is it? I was just thinking of your palace cooks and bony all specks. Aratha said, Well, don't think on them too long. You're returning to Crondor with Gardan. A miss all the fun? Laurie said to Martin, This lad has a definitely warped sense of fun. Jimmy started to speak, but Dominic said, Highness, if I may travel with your captain, I wish to journey to Crondor. Of course, but what of your duties? Another will take my office. I will not be fit for that sort of duty for some time, and we cannot wait. There is no shame or dishonour. It is simply necessary. Well, then I am sure Jimmy and Gardan will welcome your company. Wait, began Jimmy. Ignoring the boy, Aretha asked the monk, What sends you to Crondor? Simply that it lies on my route to Stardock. Father John thinks it vital we should inform Pug and the other magicians of what we know to be occurring. They practice mighty arts unavailable to us. Well, that is well taken. We have need of all the allies we can muster. I should have considered that myself. I will give you some additional intelligence to take to them, if you don't mind, and I'll have Gardan escort you down to Stardock. That would be kind. Jimmy had been trying to be heard as he protested being sent back to Crondor. Ignoring his protests, Aratha said to Laurie, Take our aspiring young duke here and go down to the town and find a ship. We'll follow tomorrow. Also, see about some fresher mounts and don't get into any trouble. Aratha walked away towards the barracks with Dominic and Martin, leaving Laurie and Jimmy in the courtyard. Jimmy was trying still to make himself heard and was saying, But! Laurie clapped Jimmy on the shoulder and said, Come along, your grace. Let's get down the road. If we can finish our business early, we'll see if we can find a game at the inn. 
An evil light seemed to come into Jimmy's eyes at that. Game, he said. You know, something like Pashawa or over under man in between, knuckle bones or stones, gambling. Oh, said the boy, you'll have to show me how. As he turned for the stable, Laurie fetched him a kick in the rump, propelling him along. Show you how, indeed. I'm not some rube in from the farmlands here. I heard that the first time I lost my poke. Running forward, Jimmy laughed. It was worth a try. Arthur entered the darkened room. Looking down at the figure on the bed, he said, You sent for me. Micah raised himself up and leant back against the wall. Yes, I hear you're leaving this hour. Thank you for coming. He indicated Aretha should sit upon the bed. I need a little sleep, but I'll be fit enough in a week or so. Aretha, your father and I were friends as youngsters. Caldrick was just establishing the practice of bringing squires to court that's now taken for granted. We were quite a bunch. Brukel of Yarbon was our senior squire, and he ran us ragged. In those days, we were a fiery crew, your father, myself, and Guy de Bastira. At mention of Guy's name, Aretha stiffened but said nothing. I like to think we were the backbone of the kingdom in our day. Now you are. Boric did well with you and Liam, and Martin brings no shame. I am now serving Isha, but I still love this kingdom, son. I just wanted you to know my prayers are with you. Aretha said, Thank you, my lord Jelanik. He eased himself on his pillows. No longer. I am just a simple monk now. By the way, who rules in your place? Liam is in Crondor and will remain until I return. Volney acts as Chancellor. At this, Micah laughed, which brought a wince of pain. Volney! <laughs> Ishap's teeth! He must hate it! He does, said Aretha with a smile. You going to have Liam name him Duke? I don't know. As much as he protests, he's the most able administrator available. We lost some good young men during the Rift War. Aretha smiled his crooked smile. <laughs> Jimmy suggests I name him Duke of Crondor. Don't sell that one short, Aretha. Train him while you have him. Pile the responsibility on him until he yells and give him more. Educate him well. Then take stock. He's a rare one. Aretha said, Why is this, Micah? Why this concern for matters you've put behind? Because I'm a vain old man and a sinner, despite my repentance. I still admit to pride in how my city fares. And because you're your father's son. Aretha was silent for a long time. Then he said, You and father were close, weren't you? Very. Only Guy was closer to Boric. Guy? Aretha couldn't believe his father's most hated enemy could have ever once been his friend. How is that possible? Micah studied Aretha. I thought your father would have told you before he died. He was silent for a long moment. And then again, Boric wouldn't. He sighed. We who were friends to both your father and Guy, we all took a vow. We vowed never to speak of the shame which caused them to end the closest of friendships and which caused Guy to wear black every day for the rest of his life, earning him the name Black Guy. Aretha said, Father once mentioned that strange act of personal courage, though he had no other good to speak of Guy. He wouldn't, and I will not either, 
for Guy would have to release me from the vow or be proved dead before I would speak. But I can say that before that schism, they were as brothers. Whether wenching, brawling, or in war, neither was more than a voice's call from the other's aid. But look, you, Aretha, you have to rise early, and you must get rested. You have no more time to idle away over matters long buried. You must be off to find a cure for Anita. The old man's eyes misted over and Aretha realised that in his own dark concern for her, he had ignored the fact that Micah had always been a member of Erlen's household. He had known her since birth. She would be like a granddaughter to him. Micah swallowed hard. Oh, these damn ribs! Breathe deeply and your eyes water like you're eating raw onion. He let out a long sigh. I held her in my arms... When the priests of Sung the White blessed her, less than an hour after her birth. His eyes took on a far off look. He turned his face away and said, Save her, Aretha. I will find a cure. Whispering to control his emotions, Micah said, Then go, Aretha. Ishap. Protect you. Aretha squeezed the old monk's hand for a moment, rose and left his quarters. Walking across the main hall of the abbey building, he was intercepted by a silent monk who indicated he should follow. He was led to the abbot's quarters and found the abbot and brother Antony waiting for him. It is good you took time to visit with Micah, Highness, said the abbot. Suddenly Aretha became alarmed. Micah will recover, won't he? If Ishap wills it. He is an old man to be withstanding such an ordeal. Brother Antony seemed incensed by the notion and almost snorted. The abbot ignored the sound and said, We have given some thought to a problem that needs to be dealt with. He pushed a small case towards Aretha, who reached over and lifted it from the table. The case was clearly ancient, of delicately carved wood, and time had worn it almost smooth. When it was opened, it revealed a velvet cushion upon which rested a small talisman. It was a bronze hammer, a miniature of that which Micah had carried, a thong passing through a tiny hole in the haft. What is it? Antony said, you must have considered how your foe was able to locate you seemingly at will. It is likely that some agency, perhaps the serpent priest, had located you with a scrying spell of one sort or another. That talisman is a legacy from our ancient past. It was fashioned at the oldest known enclave of our faith, the Ishapian Abbey at Leng. It is the most powerful artefact we possess. It will mask your movements from all scrying magic. To any who have been following you by arcane means, you will simply vanish from sight. We have no protection from mundane eyes, but if you are cautious and mask your identity, you should be able to reach Elvendar without being intercepted. But never remove it, or you will again be subject to location by sorcery. It will also render you impervious to the sort of attack we endured last night. Such a creature would be unable to harm you, though your enemy may still strike through those about you, for they will not be so protected. Aretha placed the talisman around his neck and said, Thank you. The abbot rose. Ishap protect you, Highness, and know you may always find haven here at Sarth. Aretha said thank you again and left the abbot. As he returned to his quarters and finished rolling his travel bundle, he considered what he had learned. Pushing doubt aside, he determined once again to save Anita. Book 3 
Aretha and Jimmy. Their rising all at once was as the sound of thunder heard remote. Milton, Paradise Lost, Book Two, One, Four Hundred and Seventy Six. Prologue. Twilight. The sun dropped behind the peaks. The last rays of warmth touched the earth, and only the rosy afterglow of the day remained. From the east, indigo darkness approached rapidly. The wind cut through the hills like a sharp-edged blade, as if spring were only a faintly remembered dream. Winter's ice still clung to shadow-protected pockets, ice that cracked loudly under the heels of heavy boots. Out of the evening's darkness, three figures entered the firelight. The old witch looked up, her dark eyes widening slightly at the sight of the three. She knew the figure on the left, the broad, mute warrior with the shaved head and single long scalp lock. He had come once before, seeking magic signs for strange rites. Though he was a powerful chieftain, she had sent him away, for his nature was evil. And while issues of good and evil seldom held any significance for the witch, there were limits even for her. Besides, she had little love for any Mordel, especially one who had cut out his own tongue as a sign of devotion to dark powers. The mute warrior regarded her with blue eyes, unusual for one of his race. He was broader of shoulder than most, even for one of the mountain clans who tended to be more powerful of arm and shoulder than their forest-dwelling cousins. The mute wore golden circle rings in his large, unswept ears, painful to affix, as the Mordel had no lobes. Upon each cheek were three scars. Mystic symbols whose meaning was not lost upon the witch. The mute made a sign to his companions, and the one to the far right seemed to nod. It was difficult to judge, for he was clothed in an all-concealing robe with a deep hood revealing no features. Both hands were hidden in voluminous sleeves that were kept together, as if speaking from a great distance. The cloaked figure said, "We seek a reading of signs." His voice was sibilant, almost a hiss, and there was a note of something alien in it. One hand appeared, and the witch pulled away, for it was misshapen and scaled, as if the owner possessed talons covered with snakeskin. She then knew the creature for what it was—a priest of the Pantathian Serpent People. Compared to the Serpent People, the Mordel were held in high regard by the witch. She turned her attention from the end figures and studied the one in the center. He stood a full head taller than the mute and was even more impressive in bulk. He slowly removed a bearskin robe. The bear's skull, providing a helm for his own head, and cast it aside. The old witch gasped, for he was the most striking Mordel she had seen in her long life. He wore the heavy trousers, jerkin, and knee-high boots of the hill clans, and his chest was bare. His powerfully muscled body gleamed in the firelight, and he leaned forward to study the witch. His face was almost frightening in its near perfect beauty. But what had caused her to gasp more than his awesome appearance was the sign upon his chest. Do you know me? He asked the witch. She nodded. I know who you appear to be. He leaned even farther forward until his face was lit from below by the fire, revealing something in his nature. I am who I appear to be. He whispered with a smile. She felt fear, 
for behind his handsome features, behind the benign smile, she saw the visage of evil, evil so pure it defied endurance. We seek a reading of signs, he repeated, his voice the sound of ice-clear madness. She chuckled. Even one so mighty has limits. The handsome Mordel's smile slowly vanished. One may not foretell one's own future. Resigned to her own likely lot, she said, I require silver. The Mordel nodded. The mute dug a coin from out of his belt pouch and tossed it upon the floor before the witch. Without touching it, she prepared some ingredients in a stone cup. When the concoction was ready, she poured it upon the silver. A hissing came, both from the coin and from the serpent man. A green-scaled claw began to make signs, and the witch snapped, None of that nonsense, snake! Your hotland magic will only cant my reading. The serpent man was restrained by a gentle touch and smile from the centre figure, who nodded at the witch. In croaking tones, her throat dry with fear, the witch said, Say you then truly, what would you know? She studied the hissing silver coin, covered now in bubbling green slime. Is it time? Shall I do now that which was ordained? A bright green flame sprang from the coin and danced. The witch followed its movement closely, her eyes seeing something within the flame none but she could divine. After a while she said, The bloodstones form the cross of fire. That which you are, you are. That which you are born to do, do, do. The last word was a half gasp. Something in the witch's expression was unexpected, for the Mordel said, What else, crone? You stand not unopposed, for there is one who is your bane. You stand not alone, for behind you I do not understand. Her voice was faint, weak. What? The Mordel showed no smile this time. Something, something vast, something distant, something evil. The Mordel paused to consider, turning to the Serpent Man. He spoke softly yet commandingly. Go then, Kathos. Employ your arcane skills, and discover where this seat of weakness lies. Give a name to our enemy. Find him. The Serpent Man bowed awkwardly and shambled out of the cave. The Mordel turned to his mute companion and said, Raise the standards, my general, and gather the loyal clans upon the plains of Isbandia, beneath the towers of Sarsagoth. Raise highest that standard I have chosen for my own, and let all know we begin that which was ordained. You shall be my battle-master, Murad, and all shall know you stand highest among my servants. Glory and greatness now await. Then, when the mad snake has identified our quarry, lead forth the black slayers. Let those whose souls are mine serve us by seeking out our enemy. Find him! Destroy him! Go! The mute nodded once and left the cave. 
The Mordel, with the sign on his chest, faced the witch. Then, human refuse, do you know what dark powers move? I, messenger of destruction, I know. By the dark lady, I know. He laughed, a cold, humorless sound. I wear the sign, he said, pointing to the purple birthmark upon his chest, which seemed to glow angrily in the firelight. It was clear that this was no simple disfigurement, but some sort of magic talisman, for it formed a perfect silhouette of a dragon in flight. He raised his finger, pointing upwards. I have the power. He made a circular motion with his upraised finger. I am the foreordained. I am destiny. The witch nodded, knowing death raced to embrace her. She suddenly mouthed a complex incantation, her hands moving furiously through the air. A gathering of power manifested itself in the cave, and a strange keening filled the night. The warrior before her simply shook his head. She cast a spell at him, one that should have withered him where he stood. He remained, grinning at her evilly. You seek to test me with your puny art, seer. Seeing no effect, she slowly closed her eyes and sat erect, awaiting her fate. The Moradel pointed his finger at her, and a silver shaft of light came forth, striking the witch. She shrieked in agony, then exploded into white-hot fire. For an instant her dark form writhed within the inferno, then the flames vanished. The Moradel cast a quick glance at the ashes upon the floor, forming the outline of a body. With a deep laugh, he gathered up his robe and left the cave. Outside, his companions waited, holding his horse. Far below, he could see the camp of his band, still small, but destined to grow. He mounted and said, To Sar Sargoth. With a jerk on the reins, he spun his horse and led the mute and the serpent priest down the hillside. Chapter 12 Northward A lone rider raced up the road. Aretha looked back as Martin warned of the approaching horseman. Lorry turned his horse, drawing his sword, as Martin began to laugh. Aretha said, If that's who I think, I'll have his ears. Martin said, Then sharpen your knife, brother, for a look at the way those elbows flap as he rides. Within moments, Martin's prediction proved correct, for a grinning Jimmy reined in. Aretha took no pains to hide his displeasure. He said to Lorry, I thought you told me he was safely upon the ship for Crondor with Gardan and Dominic. Lorry looked on with an expression of helplessness. He was, I swear. Jimmy looked at the three. Ain't anyone going to say hello? Martin tried to look serious, but even his elven-learned composure was being tested. Jimmy had all the ingenuousness of an eager puppy, as false a pose as most others, he assumed, and Aretha was trying hard to keep a stern demeanour. Lorry hid his laughter behind a quickly raised hand and a cough. Aretha shook his head, looking down at the ground. Finally, he said, All right, what is the tale? Jimmy said, First of all, I swore an oath, and it might not mean much to you, but it's still an oath, and it binds us until the cat is skinned. And there was one other little thing. Aretha said, What was it? You were being watched while you left south. Aretha sat back in the saddle, as startled by the boy's offhand tone as much as by the revelation. How can you be certain? In the first, the man was known to me. He's a certain merchant from Quester's View by name Avram, who is in fact a smuggler employed by the Mockers. 
He's been absent since the Night Hawks infiltration was made known to the upright man, and he was in the inn where Gardan, Dominic and I waited for the ship. I went aboard ship with the good captain and the monk and slipped over the side just before they weighed anchor. Then, in the second, the man was without the normal retinue he employed when working his normal trade. He's usually a vocal, affable man, given to public display when acting the merchant. But in Saf, he lurked under a heavy cowl and hugged dark corners. He would not be in such a place, ignoring his usual role, unless forced to by unusual circumstances. And he followed you from the inn until he was clear as to which way you'd ridden. But, most important of all... He was an off-time companion of both Laughing Jack and Golden Dace. Martin said, Havram? That was the man Laughing Jack said recruited Golden and him to the Nighthawks. They'll be relying on spies and agents now that they can't use magic to find you, added Laurie. It makes sense they had someone in South waiting for you to come down from the Abbey. Did he see you leave? asked the Prince. Jimmy laughed. No, but I saw him leave. They all looked at him with questions on their faces, and the boy said, I took care of him. You did what? Jimmy looked pleased with himself. Even a town as small as Saf has its underside, if you know where to look. Using my reputation as a mocker of Crondor, I made myself known and established my bona fides. Certain people who wished to remain anonymous were made to understand I knew who they were and would be willing to neglect mentioning it to the local garrison in exchange for a service. As they thought I still enjoyed a favoured position in the mockers, they chose not to deposit me in the bay, especially when I sweetened the deal with a small patch of gold I carried. I then mentioned there was not a single person in the Western realm who would miss a certain merchant taking his ease at the inn. They took my meaning. The false merchant is most likely on his way to Kesh via the Durbin slave route even as we speak, learning the finer points of menial labour. Laurie slowly shook his head. The boy has a definite hard edge to him. Aretha heaved a resigned sigh. It seems I am again in your debt, Jimmy. Jimmy said... There's a small caravan coming up the coast about an hour behind. If we ride slowly, they may overtake us by nightfall. We could most likely hire on as additional guards and ride in with wagons and a few other mercenaries when Mamandamus is out looking for the free riders who left Saf. Aretha laughed. What am I to do with you? Before Jimmy could answer, he said, and don't say anything about being Duke of Crondor. As he turned his mount, he said, And don't tell me where you got that horse. Fate, or the efficacy of the Ashapian talisman, served Aretha and his three companions, for they encountered no trouble along the road to Illith. Jimmy's prediction of a caravan's overtaking them proved accurate. It was a poor thing, consisting of five wagons, served by only two bravos hired as guards. Once the merchant in charge was satisfied they were not brigands, he welcomed them as travelling companions, for he gained four additional bodyguards for the price of a few meals. For two weeks they travelled with little to disrupt the monotony of the journey. Peddlers, traders and caravans of all sizes, with up to a score of mercenary guards, passed both ways along the coast between Questa's View and Sarth. Aretha was satisfied that should some spy or agent discover him among the throng of bravos riding along the road, it would be by pure chance. Finally, near sundown, they could see the lights of Illith in the distance. Aretha rode point with Yanov the merchant's two guards. He held back until the lead wagon was even with him and said, Illith ahead, Yanov. The lead wagon passed, and the stout merchant, a silk and fine cloth peddler from Crondor, waved happily. Aretha had been relieved to discover Yanov an ebullient man, for he had paid little attention to what others had to say, and Aretha's quickly contrived history had stood up to scrutiny. As far as the prince could tell, Yanov had never seen him before. Martin was the first to overtake Aretha as the last wagon in the train moved past him. Illith, said Aretha, 
kicking his mount into motion. Jimmy and Laurie crossed the road from where they had ridden flank as Martin said, Soon we'll be rid of this train and can see to new mounts. These need a rest. Laurie said, I'll be pleased to be rid of Yanov. He cackles like a fishwife without a halt. Jimmy shook his head in mock sympathy, and he hardly ever lets anyone else tell a story around the campfire. Laurie glared. Aretha said, Enough. We'll be another band of travellers. If Baron Talank discovers I'm here, it's a state affair. We'll have feastings, tourneys, hunting, receptions, and everyone between the great northern mountains and Kesh will know I'm in Illith. Talank's a fine fellow, but he does enjoy his revels. Jimmy laughed. He's not the only one. With a whoop and a shout, he spurred his horse forward. Aretha, Laurie and Martin sat amazed for a moment. Then the relief of reaching Illith struck, and they were off after the boy. As Aretha raced past the lead wagon, he shouted, Good trading, Master Yanov! The merchant looked after them, as if they had become bereft of reason. Etiquette required he pay them a token for their stint at guard. Reaching the gates of the city, they slowed, as a caravan of some size had just finished passing into Illith, and several other travellers were waiting for it to clear the portals before they could enter. Jimmy reined in behind a farmer's haycart and spun his horse to face his companions as they rode up, laughing at the momentary frolic. Without words, they fell into line, watching as soldiers passed the cart through. In these peaceful days, the soldiers seemed to be giving only the most cursory inspection to those passing into the city. Jimmy looked about, for Illith was the first large city encountered since they had left Crondor, and the busy metropolitan rhythm was already making him feel at home. Then, near the gates, he noticed a lone figure hunkered down, watching those who passed through. From his tartan plaid and leather breeches, it was clear he was a Hadati hillman. His hair fell past his shoulders, but a warrior's topknot was bound high, and he wore a rolled scarf tied above his eyes. Across his knees rested a pair of wooden sheaths, protecting the sharp edges of the long, slender sword and a shorter half-sword common to his people. Most striking about the man was his face, for around the eyes, from forehead down to cheekbones, his face was painted bone white, as was his chin directly below his mouth. He clearly studied the prince as he passed, then slowly rose as Jimmy and Martin followed Aretha and Laurie into the city. Jimmy suddenly laughed aloud, as if Martin had joked, and stretched, affording himself a quick glance behind. The hillman was slowly walking through the gates behind them, putting his sword and half-sword in his belt-sash. Martin said, The Hadati. When Jimmy nodded, the Duke said, You've a quick eye. Is he following? He is. Shall we lose him? Martin shook his head. We'll deal with him once we settle somewhere, if we need to. As they rode up the narrow streets of the city, they were greeted by signs of prosperity on all sides, for shops burned brightly with lantern light as merchants showed their wares to those out shopping in the cool of the evening. Even at this early hour of the evening, revellers were about in numbers, as guards from caravans and sailors in from months at sea were out in force, seeking whatever pleasures gold could buy. A band of rowdy fighting men, mercenaries by their look, pushed across the street, obviously working on a heroic drunk, yelling and laughing. One bumped against Laurie's horse, and, in a display of mock anger, shouted, Here now, what's where you're pointing that beastie? Shall I teach you manners? He feigned pulling his sword, to the delight of those with him. Laurie laughed aloud with the man, as Martin, Aretha and Jimmy kept an eye on potential trouble. Sorry, friend, said the singer. The man made a half-grimace, half-laugh, as he again motioned as if to draw his sword. Another from the mercenary band pushed him roughly aside and said, Go have a drink, to his companion. Smiling up at Laurie, he said, Still can't ride any better than you can sing, Laurie. 
Lorry was off his mount instantly and embraced the man in a bear hug. Rolled, you son of a whoremonger! They exchanged back slaps and hugs. Then Lorry presented the man to the others. This black heart is rolled, a friend since boyhood and more than once a companion on the road. His father owned the farm next to my father's. The man laughed. And our fathers threw the both of us out of home on almost the same day. Lorry introduced Martin and Jimmy, but when he reached Arthur, used the agreed-upon name of Arthur. Pleased to know your friends, Lorry," said the mercenary. Arthur cast a quick glance about. We're blocking the thoroughfare. Let's find lodgings. Rold waved a hand for them to follow. I'm staying at a place the next street over. It's almost civilized. Jimmy spurred his horse forward and kept an eye on this boyhood friend of the singer, studying the man with a practiced eye. He had all the earmarks of a seasoned mercenary, one who had been earning a living with his sword long enough to be considered an expert by dint of his still being alive. Jimmy glimpsed Martin looking rearward and wondered if the Hadati still stalked them. The inn was called the Northerner, respectable enough for a place so near the docks. A stable boy roused himself from a sorry-looking meal to take their horses. Rold said, "Keep them well, lad." The boy obviously knew him. Martin tossed the boy a silver coin. Jimmy watched the boy catch the coin in midair, and as he gave over his horse's reins, he placed the thumb of his right hand between fore and middle fingers so the boy could see. A flash of recognition passed between them, and the boy gave Jimmy a curt nod. When they were inside, Rold signalled for the serving girl to bring ale, as he pointed to a table in the corner, near the door to the stable yard, and away from the normal flow of customers. Pulling out a chair for himself, Rold discarded his heavy leather gauntlets as he sat. He spoke just loud enough for those at the table to hear. Laurie. Last time I saw you was what six years ago. You went riding off with a Lamutian patrol to look for Surani to write songs about. Now here you are with. He indicated Jimmy. This short thief here. Jimmy grimaced. High sign. High sign. Agreed, Rold. When the others looked confused, Rold said. This lad Jimmy gave the stable boy a sign, so the local thieves will keep their hands off his kick. Tells them a thief from another city is in town and respecting the conventions and should have the courtesy returned, right? Jimmy nodded appreciatively. Right. It tells them I won't work without their leave. Keeps things civilized. The boy will pass the word. Quietly, Arthur said, "How did you know?" I'm no outlaw, but I'm no saint either. <laughs> Over the years, I've kept all manner of company. Mostly, I'm a simple fighting man. Up to a year ago, I was a mercenary in the Yabonese Free Levies, fought for king and country for a silver piece a day, and all found. His eyes got a distant look. We'd been on and off the line for seven years. Of the lads who signed aboard with our captain that first year, one in five was left. Each winter we'd stay in Lamut, and our captain would go out recruiting. Each spring we'd return to the front with fewer men. His eyes lowered to the ale before him. I've fought against bandits and outlaws, renegades of all stripe. I served marine duty on a warship hunting pirates. I stood at Cutter's Gap when fewer than thirty of us held back two hundred goblins for three days until Brian Lord Highcastle could come and fetch us out. But I never thought I'd live to see the day the bloody Surani would quit. No, he said, it's glad I am to be standing guard on piddly little caravans the hungriest outlaw in the land wouldn't bother with. My biggest problem these days is keeping awake. The mercenary smiled.
Of all my old friends, you were the best, Lori. I trust you with my life, <laughs> if not my women and money. Let's hoist around for old time's sake. Then we can start telling lies. Aretha liked the openness of the fighter. The serving woman brought another round, and Roald paid over Lorry's protest. I'm in this very day with a great creaking caravan from the free cities. My mouth is caked with a month's worth of road dust, and I'll only waste my gold sooner or later. It might as well be now. Martin laughed and said, Only the first, friend Roald. The rest are our pleasure. Jimmy said, Have you seen a Hadati hillman around? Roald waved his hand. They're around. Anyone in particular? Martin said, Green and black tartan on his plaid, white paint on his face. Roald said, Green and black say far northwest clan, couldn't say which, but the white paint. He and Lorry exchanged glances. Martin said, What? Lorry said, He's on a blood quest. Roald said, A personal mission. Some matter of clan honour or another. And let me tell you, honour's no joke to a Hadati. They're as intractable about it as those damned Surani up in Lamut. Maybe he has to avenge a wrongdoing or pay back a debt for his tribe. But whatever it is, only a fool would get in the way of a Hadati on blood quest. They tend to be a forward lot with a sword. Roald finished his drink, and Aretha said, If you will join us, let's share a meal. The fighter smiled at that. In truth, I am hungry. The call was given, and soon the food was served, and conversation turned to an exchange of histories between Lorry and Roald. Roald had listened raptly while Lorry recounted his adventures during the Rift War, though he left out his involvement with the royal family and the news he was to wed the king's sister. The mercenary's mouth hung open. I've never known a singer not given to overboasting, and you're the worst I've known, Lorry. But that tale is so outlandish, I believe what you've said. It's incredible. Lorry looked stung. Overboast? Me? While they ate, the innkeeper came over and said to Lorry, I see you to be a singer. Lorry had brought along his lute, a nearly instinctive habit. Will you honour this house with your songs? Aretha looked ready to object, but Lorry said, Of course. To Aretha he said, We can leave later, Aretha. In Yarban, even when a singer pays for his meals, it is expected he will sing when asked. I build accounts. If I pass this way, I can sing and eat even if I have no money. He crossed to a dais in the corner near the front door to the inn and sat upon a stool. He tuned his lute until the pitch of each string was correct, then began his song. It was a common tune, sung in all parts of the kingdom and known by all who sang in alehouses and inns. It was a favourite of those who listened. The melody was pleasant, but the words were mawkish. Aretha shook his head. That's awful. The others laughed. <laughs> True, said Roald. But they like it, indicating the crowd. Jimmy said, Lorry Place was popular, not always was good. That way he eats. Lorry finished to a loud round of applause and began another song. It was a bright, ribald shanty sung by sailors throughout the bitter sea, telling of a drunken seaman's encounter with a mermaid. A group of sailors fresh off a ship set up a clapping accompaniment to the song, and one took out a simple wooden pipe and played a clever counter-melody. As the rowdy mood of the room increased, Laurie slipped into another bawdy shanty regarding what occupies the captain's wife while her husband is out to sea. The sailors cheered at this, and the one with the pipe danced before the bar while he played. As the festive feeling in the room increased, the front door opened and three men entered. 
Jimmy watched them as they slowly made their way through the room and said, Uh-oh, trouble. Martin looked to where Jimmy was watching. You know them? Nah, but I recognise the type. It's the big one in front will start it. The man in question was the obvious leader of the three. He was a tall, red-bearded fighter, a barrel-chested mercenary who had let most of his powerful frame run to fat. He wore two dirks but was otherwise unarmed. His leather jerkin barely closed over his gut. The two behind him looked like fighting men. One was armed with a variety of knives varying from a tiny stiletto to a long dagger. The other wore a long hunting knife at his belt. The red-bearded man led his companions towards Aratha's table, speaking rudely as he pushed aside all who blocked his way. His manner wasn't entirely unfriendly, for he exchanged loud, coarse jokes with several men in the inn who obviously knew him. Soon, all three stood before Aratha's table. Looking at the four seated there, the red-bearded man let a grin spread slowly across his face. You... Sit at my table. His accent betrayed him as being from one of the southern free cities. He leant forward, fists on the table between the plates of food, and said, You are strangers. I forgive you. Jimmy's mouth dropped open, and he instinctively pulled away, for the man's breath betrayed a day already spent drinking and teeth long gone to rot. If you were Elith men, you'd know when Longley is in town, every night he sits at this table in the Northerner. Leave now, and I won't kill you dead. With that, he threw back his head and laughed. Jimmy was the first on his feet, saying, We didn't know, sir. He smiled weakly as the others exchanged glances. Aratha indicated he wished to quit the table and avoid trouble. Jimmy made a show of being scared to death of the fat fighter. We'll find another table. The man called Longley grabbed Jimmy's left arm above the elbow. This is pretty boy, no? He laughed and looked at his companions. Or maybe it's girl, dressed like boy. He's so pretty. He laughed again then looked at Rold. This boy your friend? Or is he pet? Jimmy's eyes rolled heavenwards as he said, I wish you hadn't said that. Aratha reached across the table and put his hand upon the man's arm. Let the boy go. Longley swung a backhanded blow at Aratha with his free hand, knocking the prince backwards. Rold and Martin exchanged resigned looks as Jimmy quickly raised his right leg so he could reach the dirk in his right boot top. Before anyone could move, Jimmy had the point of the dirk placed firmly in Longley's ribs. I think you'd better find another table, friend. The huge man looked down at the thief who barely reached his chin, then at the dagger. With a roaring laugh, he said, Little fellow, you are very funny. His free hand shot out and gripped Jimmy's wrist with unexpected speed. With slight effort, he forced the dirk away. Jimmy's face became beaded with sweat as he struggled to escape the vice-like grip of the bearded man. In the corner, Laurie sang on, ignorant of what was occurring at his friend's table. Others nearby, used to the activities of a seaport inn, were making room for impending trouble. Aratha sat on the floor, still groggy from the blow, then reached down and loosened his rapier in his scabbard. Rold nodded to Martin, and both slowly stood, making a show of not pulling weapons. Rold said, Look, friend, we mean no harm. Had we known this to be your usual table, we'd have stayed clear. We'll find another. Let the boy go. The man threw back his head and laughed. Ha! I think I keep him. I know fat quag and trader will give me a hundred gold for a boy so pretty. With a sudden scowl, he looked about the table. Then his gaze locked on Rold. You go. 
The boy will say he's sorry for poking Longley in ribs. Then maybe I let him go. Or maybe to Fat Quegan he goes. Aratha slowly rose. It was difficult to know if Longley was seriously intending trouble. But after being struck, Aratha was not about to give the man the benefit of the doubt. The locals obviously knew Longley, and if he was only intending some simple brawling and Aratha was first to pull steel, he could bring down their wrath. The fat man's two companions looked on cautiously. Roald exchanged another glance with Martin and raised his flagon as if to finish his ale. With a sudden jerk, he tossed the contents of the mug into Longley's face, then backhanded the knife-bearer in the side of the head with the pewter ale-jack. The slender man's eyes rolled upwards as he slumped to the floor. The third man was distracted by Roald's sudden move and didn't see Martin's fist as the Duke unloaded a thundering blow, knocking Longley's companions backwards over another table. With the sudden action, more prudent customers began a quick exit from the inn. Laurie stopped playing and stood up on the dais to see what the problem was. One of the barmen, not interested in who was responsible for trouble, sprang over the bar and landed atop the nearest combatant, who happened to be Martin. Longley held fast to Jimmy's wrist, wiping ale from his own face. Laurie carefully put down his loot and, with a running jump, leapt from the dais to a tabletop and vaulted onto Longley's back. Wrapping his arms around the large man's throat, he began choking him. Longley rocked forward under the impact, then regained his balance while Laurie clung to him. Ignoring the singer, he looked at Roald, who was ready to fight. You should not have thrown ale on Longley. Now I'm mad! Jimmy's face was turning white from the pain of the large man's grip. Laurie said, Somebody help me! This giant's got a tree trunk for a neck! Aratha sprang to his right just as Roald struck Longley in the face. The large man blinked, then, with an insolent toss, threw Jimmy into Roald, knocking the mercenary into Aratha. All three went down in a heap. With his other hand, he reached back over his shoulder and grabbed Laurie by the tunic. He flipped the singer overhead, tumbling him over the table. The table leg nearest Jimmy collapsed, and Laurie rolled off into Roald and Aratha as they struggled to rise. Martin had been grappling with the barman and finished off the encounter by tossing him back over the bar. He then reached out and seized Longley by the shoulder, turning him. The red-bearded man's eyes seemed to light at finding an opponent worthy of his metal. At four inches over six feet, Martin was taller, though giving up pounds to Longley in bulk. Longley's voice sounded in a gleeful shout as he reached out and grabbed at Martin. Instantly, they were in a restless hold, each with his hand around the back of the other's neck, opposite hand holding the other's wrist. For a long moment they swayed, then moved slightly as each sought a better advantage for a throw. Laurie sat up, shaking his head. It's not human! Suddenly, he realised he was sitting on Roald and Aratha and began disentangling himself. Jimmy got to his feet, wobbling as he stood. Laurie looked up at the boy as Aratha stood up. What were you trying to accomplish by pulling that dirk? Laurie asked the thief. Get us killed? Jimmy looked angrily to where the two big men struggled for advantage. Nobody talks about me that way. I'm no fop's delight. Laurie said, Don't take things so personally. He started to rise. He just wants to play. Laurie's knees buckled and he had to grab Jimmy to keep his feet. I think... Longley was giving out a strange assortment of grunts as he strove against Martin, while the Duke remained silent. Martin leaned forward, countering Longley's larger bulk with greater height. What had started as a possible bloodletting had settled into a passably friendly wrestling contest, albeit a rough one. Longley suddenly pulled back, but Martin simply followed the move, releasing his hold on Longley's neck but holding on to his wrist. In a single move, he was behind the heavy man, holding Longley's arm in a painful position behind his head. 
The fat man grimaced as Martin put pressure on the hold, slowly forcing him to his knees. Lorry helped Roald to his feet as the mercenary shook his head, trying to gather his wits. When his vision had cleared, he studied the contest. He said to Lorry, That can't be very comfortable. Jimmy said, I expect that's why his face is turning purple. Roald started to speak to Jimmy, but something caused his head to turn suddenly towards Aretha. Jimmy and Laurie followed his gaze and their eyes widened. Aretha, seeing all three staring at him, spun. A black cloaked figure had managed to approach the table silently while the brawl was in progress. He stood stiffly behind Aretha, a dagger in his right hand poised to strike. The man's eyes stared forwards and his mouth moved silently. Aretha's hand shot out, knocking aside the dagger, but his eyes studied the figure behind the black-clad man. The Hadati warrior Jimmy and Martin had seen at the gate was poised, sword ready for another blow. He had struck silently at the assassin from behind, preventing a successful attack on the prince. As the dying man collapsed, the Hadati quickly put up his slender sword and said, Come, there are others. Jimmy quickly examined the dead man and held up an ebony hawk on a chain. Aretha turned to Martin and said, Martin, night hawks, finish it! Martin nodded to his brother, then, with a wrenching movement that almost dislocated Longley's shoulder, drove him to his knees. Longley looked upwards at Martin, then closed his eyes in resignation as the Duke raised his right hand. Halting his strike, Martin said, What use? and shoved Longley forward. The large man fell face downwards on the floor and then sat up, rubbing at his painful shoulder. Ha! he laughed loudly. You come back sometime, big hunter. You give Longley good thrashing by gods. They raced out of the inn to the stables. The stable boy nearly fainted at the sight of all these armed men running towards him. Aretha said, Where are our horses? The boy pointed towards the rear of the stable. Martin said, They'll not stand up to a long run tonight. Seeing other mounts fresh and fed, Aretha said, Who owns these? The boy said, My master, sir, but they're to be sold at auction next week. Aretha signalled for the others to saddle the fresh mounts. The boy's eyes teared as he said, Please, sir, don't kill me. Aretha said, We'll not kill you, boy. The boy cowered away while the animals were saddled. The Hadati took a saddle from what was obviously the inn supply of tack and made a sixth horse ready. Aretha mounted and tossed a pouch at the boy. Here, tell your master to sell our mounts and make up the difference from what's in the bag. Keep something for yourself. When all were ready, they rode from the stable through the gates of the inn courtyard and down a narrow street. If an alarm was going out, the city gates would soon be closed. A death in a bar brawl was a chancy thing. They could be pursued or not, depending upon which officer of the city watch was on duty that night, as much as for any other cause. Aretha decided to take no chances, and they raced for the city's western gate. The city guards barely took notice when the six horsemen galloped past and disappeared down the highway towards the free cities. No alarm had been sounded. Down the road they flew until the lights of Illith were a distant glow in the night behind them. Then Aretha gave the signal to rein in. He turned to the Hadati. We must speak. They dismounted and Martin led them to a small glade some distance from the road. As Jimmy tethered the horses, Aretha said, Who are you? I am Baru, called the Serpent Slayer, answered the Hadati. Lori said, That is a name of power. He explained to Aretha, To earn his name, Baru killed a wyvern. Aretha looked at Martin, who inclined his head in respect. To hunt dragonkind takes courage, strength of arm, and luck. Wyverns were first cousins to dragons, 
The difference was mainly of size. To face one was to face rage and talons, speed and fangs, twelve feet high at the shoulder. The Hadati smiled for the first time. You are a hunter. As your bow proclaims, Duke Martin. At this, Roald's eyes widened. Mostly, it takes luck. Roald stared at Martin. Duke Martin. He then looked at Aretha. Then, you'd be... The Hadati said, He is Prince Arotha, son of Lord Boric and brother to our king. Did you not know? Roald sat back silently, shaking his head in an emphatic no. He looked at Lorry. This is the first time you've ever told only part of a story. Lorry said, It's a long one and even stranger than the other. He said to Baru, I see you're a northerner, but I do not know your clan. The Hadati fingered his plaid. This signifies I am of Ordwinson's family of the Iron Hills clan. My people live near the place you city men call Lake of the Sky. You blood quest? He indicated the rolled scarf about his forehead. I quest. I am Wayfinder. Rold said, He's a sort of holy man. Ah, uh, Highness. Laurie said, A consecrated warrior. The scarf contains the names of all his ancestors. They can have no rest until he finishes his mission. He's taken a vow to complete the blood quest or die. How do you know me? asked Aretha. I saw you on your way to the peace conference with the Surani at the end of the war. There is little about those days any of my clan will forget. He looked into the fire. When our king called to us, we came to fight the Surani, and for nine years and more we did so. They were strong foemen, willing to die for honour, men who understood their place on the wheel. It was a worthy struggle. Then, in the spring of the last year of the war, the Surani came in great number. For three days and nights we fought, surrendering ground at great cost to the Surani. On the third day, we who came from the Iron Hills were surrounded. Every fighting man of the Iron Hills clan was numbered among those who stood at bay. To a man we should have died, save that Lord Boric saw us imperiled. Had not your father sorted to save us, our names would be but whispers upon yesterday's wind. Aretha recalled that Liam's letter about his father's death had mentioned Hadati. What has my father's death to do with me? Baru shrugged. I... Don't know. I was seeking knowledge at the gate. Many passed there, and I was asking questions to aid my quest. Then I saw you pass. I thought it would be interesting to discover why the Prince of Crondor would enter one of his own cities as a common fighter. It would help pass the time while I sought information. Then the assassin came, and I couldn't stand idly by and watch him slaughter you. Your father saved the manhood of my people. I saved your life. Perhaps that pays a debt in part. Who can know how the wheel turns? Aretha said, At the inn, you said there were others. The man who tried to kill you followed you into the inn, watched you for a moment, then returned outside. There he spoke to a street boy, giving him money and the boy ran off. 
He saw the three who fought with you and stopped them before they could pass. I heard nothing that was said, but he pointed to the inn, and the three entered. Aratha said, Then the fight was staged. Jimmy, who had finished with the horses, said, More likely he knew Longley's temper and made sure he knew some strangers were at his usual table in case they were heading somewhere else and might miss us. Laurie said, He might have wanted to keep us busy until others arrived, then saw what he thought was too good a chance to miss. Aratha said, Had you not been there, Baru, it would have been too good a chance to miss. The Hadati took this as thanks and said, There is no debt. As I said, it may be I who am paying off a debt. Rold said, Well then, I guess you've sorted everything out. I'll be off for Illith. Aratha exchanged glances with Lorry. The minstrel said, Rold, old friend, I think you should change your plans. What? Well, should you have been noticed with the prince, which seems likely as there were thirty or forty people in the inn when the brawl broke out, those who are looking for him may decide to ask you where we're bound. With false bravado, Rold said, <laughs> Just let them try. Martin said, We'd rather not. They can be determined. I've had dealings with Mordel before, and they lack tenderness. Rold's eyes widened. The Brotherhood of the Dark Path. Martin nodded, and Laurie said, Besides, you're presently at liberty. Which is how I plan to stay. Aratha tried a sterner stand. You'd say no to your prince? No disrespect intended, Highness, but I'm a free man, not in your service, and I've broken no laws. You have no authority over me. Look, said Lorry, there's a likelihood these assassins are going to look hard for anyone seen with us, and even though you're as tough a boot as I've known, I've seen what they can do, and I'd not risk being taken alone by them. Rold's resolve seemed unshaken. Martin said, We could certainly find some reward for service. Rold, visibly brightening, said, How much? Aratha replied, Stay until we complete our quest, and I'll pay you a hundred golden sovereigns. Without hesitation, Rold said, Done. It was easily four months' wages for even a seasoned caravan guard. Aratha then looked at Baru. You spoke of needing information. Can we aid your blood quest? Perhaps. I seek to find one of those you know as the Brotherhood of the Dark Path. Martin raised an eyebrow at Aratha. What have you to do with the Mordel? I seek a large Mordel of the Yabon Hills who wears a top knot so. He pantomimed a horse tail of hair. And three scars upon each cheek. I have been told he has come to the south on some black mission. I had hoped to hear of him from travellers, for one like that will stand out among the Mordel of the south. Aratha said, if he has no tongue, then he attacked us on our way to Sarth. That is him, said Baru. The tongueless one is called Murad. He is a chieftain of the clan Raven Mordel, blood enemies of my people since the dawn of time. Even his own people fear him. The scars upon his face speak of pacts with dark powers, though little beyond that is known. He has not been seen in years since before the Rift War when Mordel Moss troopers raided across the hill borders of Yabon. He is the cause of the blood quest. He was seen again two months ago when he led a band of black armored warriors past one of our villages. For no good reason 
He paused long enough to destroy the village, burning every building and killing everyone there except the herds boy who described him to me. It was my village. With an almost resigned sigh, he said, If he was near south, then there I must go next. This Moradel has lived too long. Aratha nodded to Lorry, who said, Actually, Baru, if you stay with us, he'll most likely come looking for you. Baru looked quizzically at the prince, and Aratha told him of Mamandamus and his servants and the quest for Anita's cure. When he had finished, the Hadati grinned, and there was no humour in it. Then I shall take service with you, Highness, if you will accept me. For fate has thrown us together. You are hunted by my enemy, and I will have his head before he can have yours. Good, said Aratha. You will be welcome, for we follow a dangerous road. Martin stiffened, and in almost the same instant Baru was coming to his feet, moving towards the trees behind the duke. Martin signalled for silence, and before the others could move, he vanished into the trees a step behind the hillman. The others began to move until Aratha motioned for them to hold. As they stood motionless in the dark, they heard what had alerted Martin and the Hadati. Echoing through the night was the sound of riders coming down the road from Illith. Long minutes passed, then the sound of hoofbeats passed, heading southwest. A few more minutes after, Martin and Baru reappeared. Martin whispered, Riders, a dozen or more, moving down the road as if there were demons coming behind. Black armour, asked Aratha. Martin said, No, these were human, and hard to see in the dark, but I judged them a rough crew. The Nighthawks could have hired extra bashers if they needed, Illith's that sort of town, Laurie said. Jimmy agreed. Maybe only one or two were night orcs, but I had knives kill as quickly as any others. Baru said, They head towards the free cities. They'll be back, said Rold. Aratha turned to look at the mercenary in the gloom, barely seeing his face in the faint moonlight. Your Baron Talank has a new custom shed five miles down the road. My caravan passed it this afternoon. Seems there's been some new smuggling from Natal of late. They'll find out from the guards no one passed this night, and they'll be back. Then, said Aratha, we must be away. The question is how we reach Elvendar. I planned on travelling the road north to Yarbon, then going west. Rold said, From Illith north, you'll meet someone who know you from the war, Highness, especially around Lamut. Had I any wits about me, I'd have figured it out after a while. Then which way? asked the prince. Martin said, We could head straight west from here, take the south pass and run the grey towers along the western face through the green heart. It's Dangerous, but... Aratha said, But goblins and trolls are known enemies. That is how we shall travel. Now let's be off. They mounted and moved out, Martin in the lead. Slowly, they wended their way through the dark and silent forests heading west. Aratha hid his anger, forcing it down within. The uneventful trip from Sarth to Illith had lulled him, making him forget for a while what dangers existed. But the ambush at the inn and the pursuing riders had turned his awareness back to the dangers. Mamandamus and his agents might have been denied their magic means of finding him, but they still had a net out, one that had nearly caught him. Jimmy rode last in line, and he watched behind for a while, hoping not to see signs of followers. Soon, sight of the road was lost in the darkness, and the boy returned his attention to Rolds and Lorry's backs, the only things he could see before him. 
Chapter Thirteen, Star Dock. The wind whipped the water to white foam. Gardan looked at the distant shore of Star Dock, wishing he could ride to the academy instead of trusting fate to keep a barge right side up. Still, it was on an island. He had endured sea voyages before, but despite a lifetime living in a seaport, he hated travelling over water. Though he would never openly admit as much. They had left Crondor by ship, travelling down the coast until they entered the narrows between the bitter sea and the Sea of Dreams, which was more of a giant saltwater lake than a true sea. At Shamata, they had commandeered horses and followed the river Dawl into its source, the Great Star Lake. Now they stood waiting for the barge to put in. It was poled by two men in simple tunics and trousers, local peasants by the look of them. In a moment, Gardan, Brother Dominic, Kasumi, and six Sirani guards would step aboard and be poled to Stardock Island, almost a mile away. Gardan shivered in the unseasonably cool air. It was spring, but the late afternoon air had none of the warmth expected at this time of year. I'm the fugitive from a hot land, Captain," said Kasumi with a chuckle. Gardan's voice had little humour in it as he replied, "No, it is cold here, but there's something else. I've felt nothing but dark foreboding since leaving the prince." Brother Dominic said nothing, but his expression showed he shared the feeling. Kasumi nodded. He had stayed in Crondor to guard the king, and when Arthur's messages arrived, he had accepted Liam's charge to accompany Gardan and the Ishapian monk to Stardock. Besides his desire to visit Pug again, there had been something in Liam's orders that made him believe the king counted the monk's safe arrival at Stardock vital. The barge put into shore, and one of the two bargemen stepped ashore. "We have to make two trips to carry the horses, sir," he said. Kasumi, who was senior, said, "That will be fine." He indicated five of his men and said, "These will go first. We will follow." Gardan said nothing about going second. He had no desire to rush the coming ordeal. The five Sirani led their animals aboard and took up position silently. Whatever they might think about journeying on the wallowing barge, they maintained their stoic demeanor. The barge put out, and Gardan watched quietly. Save for faint signs of activity on the far island, the southern shore of the Great Star Lake was deserted. Why, wondered Gardan, would anyone choose to live in such isolation? Legend had it a star fell from the sky, creating the lake. But whatever the lake's origins, no community had ever arisen upon its shores. The lone remaining Sirani guard said something in his own language to Kasumi, pointing to the northeast. Kasumi looked where the man pointed. Gardan and Dominic looked as well. In the distance, close to the horizon and coming before the approaching night, several winged figures could be seen gliding swiftly towards them. What are they? asked Kasumi. Those are the biggest birds I've seen on your world so far. They appear to be nearly man-sized. Gardan squinted. Suddenly, Dominic shouted, "Ishap's grace, everyone back to shore!" The bargemen looked back from where they were making slow, steady progress. Seeing Gardan and the others draw weapons, they quickly pushed back for land. The approaching figures could now be seen as they raced towards the party on shore. One of the boatmen cried out in fear and prayed to Dala for protection. The nude creatures were grotesquely human-shaped, male with blue skins and powerfully muscled torsos. Shoulders and chest muscles flexed as giant bat-like wings beat the air. Their heads resembled those of hairless monkeys, and each waved a long prehensile tail. Gardan counted; there were an even dozen of them. With impossibly high shrieks, they dived straight at the party on shore. As his horse bolted, Gardan lunged to one side, barely avoiding the outstretched claws of one of the creatures. 
A scream sounded behind, and Gardan glimpsed one of the bargemen being carried aloft by a creature. It hovered for an instant with a powerful beat of its wings, holding the man by the neck. With a contemptuous cry, it ripped out the bargeman's throat and dropped him. In a spray of blood, the man fell to the water. Gardan struck out at one of the creatures, which sought to grab him in the same manner. The blade struck it squarely in the face, but the creature only withdrew with a backbeat of its wings. There was no apparent mark upon it where the sword had struck. It grimaced, shook its head, then launched another attack. Gardan fell back, focusing his entire concentration on the creature's outstretched hands. Very human-like fingers ending in long talons raked across the steel of his blade as he parried. The captain wished his horse had stood long enough for him to retrieve his shield. "'What manner of beings are these?' Kasumi shouted as the barge got close enough for the five Tsurani to leap for the shore. Dominic's voice could be heard somewhere behind. "'They are elemental creatures fashioned by black arts. Our weapons have no effect.' The Surani seemed unperturbed, despite that fact, attacking the creatures as they would any enemy with no hesitation. While the blows received did no damage to the creatures, they obviously inflicted pain, for the Surani's onslaught caused the creatures to withdraw and hover for a moment. Gardan looked and found Kasumi and Dominic close by. They both had shields and stood at the ready. Then the creatures were on them again. A soldier screamed, and Gardan caught a glimpse of a Tsurani falling nearby. Gardan saw Kasumi avoid the rush of two of the creatures, using sword, shield, and agility to good advantage. But the captain knew there was no hope of survival, for it would be only a matter of time before they tired and slowed. The creatures showed no sign of fatigue, and were attacking with as much fury as when they arrived. Dominic lashed out with his mace, and a creature warbled a high-pitched note of pain. If weapons could not cut the magically constructed hide, then at least they could break bones. The creature fluttered in a circle, trying desperately to stay aloft, but slowly it approached the ground. From the way one wing lamely flapped, it was obvious Dominic had broken its shoulder. Gardan dodged another attack and danced to one side. Behind the two creatures attacking him, he saw the wounded one touch the ground. As soon as its feet made contact with the earth, the creature emitted an ear-splitting howl of pain and burst into a shower of sparkling energies. With a flash, near blinding in the evening gloom, it vanished, leaving only a smoking patch on the ground. Dominic shouted, "'They are elementals of the air! They cannot abide the touch of earth!' Gardan swung a mighty overhand blow at the creature on his right. The force of the blow drove the creature downwards. It made the briefest contact with the earth, but that was enough. Like the other, it exploded into sparks. In panic, it reached out a hand and gripped the trailing tail of the creature beside it, as if trying to pull itself away from the destruction below. The sparking energy travelled up the tail of the second creature, and it too was consumed. Kasumi whirled about and saw that three of his six men lay dead. The creatures now numbered nine, and they swarmed the remaining fighters, though there was now an element of caution in their approach. One swooped down towards Dominic, who braced for the attack. Instead of reaching out for the monk, the elemental beat backwards against the air, buffeting the cleric, seeking to knock him down. Gardan raced up behind the creature, ducking to avoid claws reaching for him. He lunged forwards, barely keeping sword in hand, and threw his arms about the dangling legs of the creature facing Dominic. He hugged them close, his face buried against the naked thigh of the thing. His stomach churned at the stench from the elemental's body, the odour of things long dead and best buried. His unexpected weight pulled the thing downwards. It shrieked and beat its wings furiously, but it was off balance, and Gardan pulled it to the ground. Like the others, it burst into sparks. 
Dardan rolled away, feeling pain erupt along his arms and chest where he had gripped the creature when it exploded. He had been burned in the process of destroying it. He ignored the pain and felt a growing hope. Those on the shore numbered seven. Gardan, Kasumi, Dominic, three soldiers and a boatman wielding a pole. And the creatures were now only eight. For a moment, the attacking elementals chose to circle overhead, out of reach of the surviving soldiers' weapons. As they began to peel off for a swooping attack, a shimmering began a short distance down the beach from the defenders. Dardan prayed to Tith, god of soldiers, that it wasn't the arrival of another attacker. One more foe would surely tip the balance and overwhelm them. With a flickering of light, a man appeared upon the beach, dressed in simple black tunic and trousers. Gardan and Kasumi at once recognised Pug and shouted a warning to him. The magician calmly surveyed the situation. One creature, seeing an unarmed opponent, howled with maniacal glee and dived for him. Pug stood his ground, showing no defence. The diving creature reached a point less than ten feet from him, then crashed into an invisible barrier. As if it had struck a stone wall, the creature crumpled to the ground. It vanished in another blinding flash. Shrieks of panic sounded overhead as the remaining creatures now understood that here was a foe beyond their powers to harm. As one, the seven remaining creatures turned and began a headlong flight northwards. Pug waved his hands, and suddenly a blue fire danced upon his upraised palms. He cast it after the fleeing creatures. The sphere of blue fire sped after the elementals and caught up with them as they winged furiously over the water. Like a cloud of pulsating light, it enveloped them. Strangled cries of pain could be heard as the elementals contorted in midair and fell twitching into the lake. As each touched the surface of the water, it erupted into green flame, consumed as it vanished under the rippling surface of the lake. Gardan watched Pug as he approached the nearly exhausted soldiers. There was something unusually sombre in Pug's expression, and his gaze held a hint of power Gardan had never seen before. Abruptly, Pug's expression changed as he relaxed. His face now looked young, boyish, in spite of his nearly twenty-six years of age. With a sudden smile, he said, Welcome to Stardock, gentlemen. A warm fire filled the room with a cosy glow. Gardan and Dominic rested in large chairs set before the fireplace, while Kasumi sat on cushions, Tsurani fashion. Kalgan dressed the captain's burns, fussing like a mother over her idiot child. The two had known each other for years at Criddy, well enough for Kalgan to take a rough tone with the captain. How you could be foolish enough to grab on to one of those things? Anyone knows that contact with an elementally dependent creature when it returns to a primal state involves the release of energies, mostly heat and light. Gardan tired of being scolded, said, Well, I didn't know. Kasumi, did you know? Dominic? Kasumi sat laughing as Dominic said, As a matter of fact, I did know. You are no help at all, priest, muttered the captain. Kalgan, if you are done, can we eat? I've been smelling that hot food for nearly an hour, and it's close to making me go mad. Pug laughed, leaning against the wall next to the hearth. Captain, is more like ten minutes. They were sitting in a room in the first floor of a large building under construction. Kasumi said, I am glad the king permitted me to visit your academy, Pug. And I as well, said Brother Dominic. While we at Sarth appreciate those copies of works you have forwarded to us so far... We are still vague about what your plans are. We seek to know more. Pug said, I am pleased to host any who come with the love of learning, Brother Dominic. Perhaps some day we may claim repayment of our slight hospitality and visit your fabled library. 
Colgan's head came around at that. I would be pleased to claim that right, friend Dominic. Any time you call, you'll be welcomed, answered the monk. Watch this one, said Gardan with a tilt of his head towards Colgan. Lose him in those underground vaults and you'll never find him. He's as passionate for books as a bear for honey. A striking woman with dark hair and large dark eyes entered the room, followed by two servants. All carried platters with food, and as she placed hers upon the long table at the other end of the room, from where the men were gathered, she said, Please, it is time for supper. Pug said, Brother Dominic, this is my wife, Katala. The monk nodded deferentially and said, My lady. She smiled at him. Please, Katala, we tend to the informal here. The monk again inclined his head as he came to the indicated chair. He turned at the sound of a door opening, and for the first time since the captain had met him, the monk's composure cracked. William came hurrying into the room, the green-scaled form of Phantas behind. Ishap's mercy! Is that a fire drink? William ran to where his father stood and hugged him, eyeing the newcomers cautiously. Calgan said... This is Phantas, lord of this estate. The rest of us live here by his sufferance, though he suffers William's company best. The drake's gaze shifted to Colgan for a moment, as if he agreed totally. Then his large red eyes returned to contemplating the table and what lay upon it. Pug said, William, say hello to Kasumi. William bowed his head slightly, smiling. He spoke in the Surani tongue, and Kasumi answered, laughing. Dominic looked interested. Pug said, My son is fluent in both the king's tongue and the Surani language. My wife and I keep him practising both, for many of my works are in the Surani language. That's one of the problems I have in bringing the art of the greater path to Midkemia. Much of what I do is the result of how I think— and I think magic in the Surani language. William's going to be a great help someday, aiding me in discovering ways to do magic in the king's tongue so I can teach those who live here. Katala said, Gentlemen, the food grows cold. And my wife does not permit talking of magic at this table, said Pug. Kulgan snorted at this, and Katala said, If I did... These two would hardly get a mouthful. Gardan moved with alacrity despite his discomfort, saying, I don't have to be warned more than once. He sat down, and immediately one of the servants began filling his platter. Dinner proceeded pleasantly, with talk of small things, as if the terrors of the day had vanished with the night, all mention of the grim events that had brought Gardan, Dominic and Kasumi to Stardock were ignored. Nothing about Aratha's quest, the threat of Mamandamus, or the portent of the abbey was said. For a short time, no discord existed. For a brief hour, the world was a pleasant place, with old friends and new guests enjoying one another's company. Then William was making his good nights. Dominic was struck by the resemblance between boy and mother, though his manner of moving and speaking was in open imitation of his father. Phantas had been fed from William's plate and padded out of the room behind him. I still can hardly credit my senses where that drake is concerned, said Dominic after they had left. He's been Kulgan's pet as long as I can remember, said Gardan. Kulgan, who was lighting a pipe, said, Ha! No longer. That boy and Phantas have been inseparable since the day they met. Katala said, There is something beyond the ordinary with those two. At times, I think they understand each other. Dominic said, Lady Katala, there is little about this place which is not beyond the ordinary. This gathering together of magicians, this construction, that is all extraordinary. 
Pug rose and led the others to the chairs near the fire. But understand that upon Kelawan, when I studied at the assembly, what you see a borning here was ancient and established. The brotherhood of magicians was an accepted fact, as was the common sharing of knowledge. Kalgan puffed contentedly upon his pipe, which is as it should be. Pug said, "We can discuss the rise of the academy at Stardock tomorrow, when I can show you our community. I'll read the messages from Aratha and the Abbot tonight. I know all that led up to Aratha's leaving Crondor, Gardan. What occurred between there and Sarth?" The captain, who had been feeling drowsy, forced himself alert and quickly told of the events from Crondor to Sarth. Brother Dominic remained silent, since the captain forgot nothing of significance. Then it was the monk's turn, as he explained what he knew of the attack upon the abbey. When he had finished, Pug and Kulgan asked several questions, but withheld comment. Pug said, "The news you carry is cause for the deepest concern. Still, the hour is late, and I think there are others upon this island who should be consulted." I suggest we show these tired and sore gentlemen to their rooms and begin discussions in earnest tomorrow. Gardan, who could feel a yawn beginning, stifled it and nodded. Kasumi, Brother Dominic, and the captain were escorted from the room by Kalgan, who bade the others good night. Pug left the fireside and crossed to a window where he stood, watching the little moon's light reflecting off the water as it peeked through the cloud cover. Katala came up behind her husband, and her arms went around his waist. You are troubled by this news, husband. It was a statement, not a question. As always, you know my mind. He turned within the circle of her arms and drew her closer, smelling the sweetness of her hair as he kissed her cheek. I had hoped we would live out our lives with the building of this academy and the raising of children our only concerns. She smiled up at him, dark eyes mirroring the unending love she felt for her man. Among the Thuril, we have a saying: "Life is problems, living is solving problems." He smiled at this. She said, "Still, it is true." What do you think of the news Kasumi and the others brought? I do not know. He stroked her brown hair. Lately, I've felt a growing gnawing feeling inside. I've thought it simply worry over the progress we make here in building the academy, but it's more than that. My nights have been filled with dreams. I know, Pug. I've seen you struggle in your sleep. You have yet to speak to me of them. He looked at her. I had no wish to trouble you, love. I thought them mere ghosts of memories from the times of trouble, but now I—I'm not sure. One returns with frequency, coming more often lately. A voice in a dark place cries out to me. It seeks my aid, begs for help. She said nothing. For she knew her husband and would wait until he was ready to share his feelings. Finally, he said, "I know the voice, Katala. I have heard it before when the times of troubles was full upon us, at its most dreadful moment, when the outcome of the rift war hung in the balance, when the fate of two worlds rested upon my shoulders. It's Macross. It's his voice I hear." Katala shivered and hugged her husband close. The name of Macross the Black, whose library served as the seed for this growing academy of magic, was one she knew well. Macross was the mysterious sorcerer, neither of the greater path like Pug nor of the lesser path like Kulgan, but something else. He had lived long enough to seem eternal, and he could read the future. He had always had a hand in the conduct of the Rift War, playing some cosmic game with human lives for stakes only he understood. He had rid Midkemia of the Rift, the magic bridge between her own homeworld and her new one. 
she nestled closer to Pug, her head on his chest. Most of all, she knew why Pug was troubled. Macross was dead. Gardan, Kasumi and Dominic stood at ground level admiring the work proceeding above. Workers contracted in Shimata were laying course after course of stone, building up the high walls of the academy. Pug and Kalgan stood nearby, inspecting the newest plan submitted by the master builder in charge of construction. Kalgan motioned for the newcomers to join them. This is all vital to us, so you will please indulge us a bit, I trust, said the stout mage. We have been at work for only a few months, and we are anxious to see the work uninterrupted. Gardan said, This building will be immense. Twenty-five stories tall, with several higher towers for observing the heavens. Dominic said, That is incredible. Such a building could house thousands. Kalgan's blue eyes sparkled merrily. From what Pug has told me, it is but a part of what he knew in the City of Magicians on the Other World. There, an entire city has grown together into a single gigantic edifice. When we have completed our work years from now, we shall have only one twentieth part of that or less. Still, there is room to grow if needs be. Some day, perhaps, the Academy may cover this entire island of Stardock. The Master Builder left, and Pug said, I'm sorry for the interruption, but some decisions needed to be made. Come, let's continue the inspection. Following the wall, they rounded a corner to come upon a group of buildings looking like nothing so much as a small village. Here, they could see men and women in various manner of dress, Kingdom and Keshian, moving among the buildings. Several children played in a square at the centre of the village. One of them was William. Dominic looked about and saw Fantas lying near a doorway in the sunlight a short distance away. The children were frantically trying to kick a ball fashioned of rags bound in leather into a barrel. The game seemed devoid of rules of conduct or play. Dominic laughed at the sight. I used to play the same game on sixth days when I was a boy. Pug smiled, as did I. Much of what we plan has yet to be implemented, so for the present the children's duties are occasional things. <laughs> they don't seem to mind. What is this place? asked Dominic. For the time being, it is the home of our young community. The wing where Colgan and my family have our rooms, as well as some instruction rooms, is the only part of the academy ready for use. It was the first section completed, though construction still continues above on the upper floors. Those who travel to Stardock to learn and serve at the Academy live there until more quarters can be made ready in the main building. He motioned for them to follow him into a large building that dominated the village. William left the game and tagged along beside his father. Pug placed his hand upon the boy's shoulder. How are your studies today? The boy made a face. Not so good. I gave up today. Nothing works as it should. Pug's expression turned serious, but Colgan gave William a playful push back towards the game. Run along, boy. Worry not. Your father was equally hard-headed when he was my student. It will come in time. Pug half smiled. Hard-headed? Colgan said, Perhaps slow-witted would be a better way to put it. Entering the door, Pug said, until the day I die, Colgan will make sport of me. The building turned out to be a hollow shell. Its only purpose seemed to be to house a large table running the length of it. The only other feature of the room was a hearth. The high ceiling was supported by rafter beams, from which hung lanterns that gave off a cheery light. Pug pulled out a chair at the end of the table, signalling for the others to sit as well. Dominic was pleased with the fire. Even if it was late spring, this day was chilly. He said, What of the women and children about? 
Colgan withdrew his pipe from his belt and began to stuff the bowl with tobacco. The children are the sons and daughters of those who have come here. We have plans to organise a school for them. Pug has some strange notions about educating everyone in the kingdom some day, though I don't see universal education becoming the vogue. The women are either the wives of magicians or magicians themselves, women commonly regarded as witches. Dominic appeared troubled. Witches? Colgan lit his pipe with a flame on the end of his finger and exhaled a cloud of smoke. What is in a name? They practice magic. For reasons I do not understand, men have at least been somewhat tolerated for practicing magic in many places, while women have been driven from nearly every community where they are discovered to have power. Dominic said, But it is held that witches gain their powers by serving dark forces. Calgan waved the notion aside. Nonsense. That is superstition, if you'll forgive my being blunt. The source of their power is no more dark than your own, and their behaviour is usually a great deal kinder than that of some of the more enthusiastic, if misguided, servants of some temples. Dominic said, True, but you are speaking of a recognised member of a legitimate temple. Colgan looked directly at Dominic. Forgive the observation, but in spite of the Ashapian reputation for a more worldly view than that of other orders, your remarks are profoundly provincial. So what if these poor wretches do not toil within a temple? If a woman serves in a temple, she is holy, and if she comes to her power in a hut in the woods, she is a witch. Even my old friend Father Tully wouldn't swallow that piece of dogmatic tripe. You are not speaking of any inherent question of good or evil— you're talking about who's got a better guild. Dominic smiled. You, then, seek to build a better guild. Colgan blew out a cloud of smoke. In a sense, yes, though that is less the reason for what we do than is trying to codify as much magic law as possible. Dominic said, Forgive my harsh questions, but one of my charges was to determine the source of your motivation. The king is your powerful ally, and our temple was concerned that there might be some hidden purpose behind your activities. It was thought, as long as I was coming here... Pug finished. You might as well challenge what we do and see what we say. Kasumi said... As long as I have known Pug, he has acted with honour. Dominic went on. Had I a single doubt, I would have said nothing now. That your purposes are only the highest is not in doubt. Just... Pug and Kulgan both said, What? It is clear you... Seek to establish a community of scholars more than anything else. That in and of itself is laudable. But you will not always be here. Some day, this academy could be a powerful tool in the wrong hands. Pug said, We are taking every precaution to avoid that pitfall, believe me. Dominic said, I do. Pug's expression changed as if he had heard something. They are coming, he said. Colgan watched with rapt attention. Gamina, he asked in a whisper. Pug nodded, and Colgan made a satisfied ah sound. The contact was better than ever. She grows in power each week. Pug explained to the others... I read the reports you brought last night and have summoned here one who I think may help. With him comes another. 
Colgan said, The other is... one able to send thoughts and receive them with remarkable clarity. At present, she is the only one we have found able to do so. Pug has told of a similar ability on Kalawan, used during his training, but it required preparation of the subject. Pug said, It is like the mind touch used by some priests, but there is no need for physical contact or even proximity, it seems. Nor is there the attendant danger of being caught up in the mind of the one touched. Gamina is a rare talent. Dominic was impressed. Pug continued, She touches the mind, and it is as if she speaks. We have hopes of some day understanding this wild talent and learning a way to train others to it. Colgan said, I hear them approaching. He rose. Please, gentlemen, Gamina is something of a timid soul, one who has undergone difficult times. Remember that, and... Be gentle with her. Kalgan opened the door and two people entered. The man was ancient, with a few stray wisps of hair like white smoke falling to his shoulders. His hand was on the other's shoulder and he walked stooped over, showing some slight deformity under his red robe. From the milky orbs that stared blankly ahead, it was obvious the old man was blind but it was the girl who commanded their attention. She wore homespun and appeared about seven years old, a tiny thing who clutched at the hand upon her shoulder. Her blue eyes were enormous, illuminating a pale face of delicate features. Her hair was almost as white as the old man's, holding only a hint of gold. What struck Dominic, Gardan, and Kasumi was an overwhelming feeling that this child was perhaps the most beautiful they had ever seen. Already they could see in those childish features the promise of a woman of unsurpassed beauty. Kalgan guided the old man to a chair next to his own. The girl did not sit, but chose to stand beside the man, both hands on his shoulder, fingers flexing nervously, as if she feared to lose contact with him. She looked at the three strangers with the expression of a cornered wild thing. She took no pains to disguise her distrust. Pug said, This is Rogan. The blind man leant forward. Home do I mate? His face despite the age it showed, was alive and smiling, up-tilted as if to hear better. It was evident that he, unlike the girl, enjoyed the prospect of meeting newcomers. Pug introduced the three men who sat opposite Kalgan and Rogan. The blind man's smile broadened. I am pleased to meet you, worthy gentlemen. Then Pug said, This is Gamina. Dominic and the others were startled when the girl's voice sounded in their heads. Hello. The girl's mouth had not moved. She was motionless, her enormous blue eyes fixed upon them. Gardan said, Did she speak? Kalgan answered, With her mind. She has no other power of speech. Rogan reached up to pat the girl's hands. Gamina was born with this gift, though she nearly drove her mother crazy with her silent crying. The old man's face became solemn. Gamina's mother and father were stoned to death by the people of her village for having birthed a demon. Poor, superstitious people they were. They feared to kill the baby, thinking she would revert to her natural form and slay them all. So they left her in the forest to die of exposure. She was not yet three years old. Gamina looked at the old man with penetrating eyes. He turned to face her, as if he could see her, and said, Yes, that is when I found you. To the others he said, I was living in the forest, 
in an abandoned hunter's lodge I'd discovered. I also was driven from my home village, but that was years earlier. I foretold the death of the town miller and was blamed for it. I was branded a warlock. Pug said, Rogan has the power of second sight, perhaps to compensate for his blindness. He has been without sight since birth. Rogan smiled broadly and patted the girl's hands. We are alike, we two, in many ways. I had grown to fear what would become of the girl when I die. He interrupted himself to speak to the girl, who had become agitated at his words. She stood shaking, her eyes welling up with tears. Hush, he scolded gently. I will, too. <laughs> Everyone does. I hope not too soon, though, he added with a chuckle. He returned to his narrative. We came from a village near Salador. When word reached us of this wondrous place... We started our journey. It took six months to walk here, mostly because I am so old. Now we have found people like ourselves, who view us as a source of knowledge, not a source of fear. We are home. Dominic shook his head, amazed that a man his age and a child had walked hundreds of miles. He was obviously moved. I am beginning to understand another part of what it is you do here. Are there many more like these two? Pug said, Not as many as I would like. Some of the more established magicians refuse to join us. Others fear us. They will not reveal their abilities. Others simply do not yet know we exist. But some, like Rogan, seek us out. We have nearly fifty practitioners of magic here. That is a great many, said Gardan. Kasumi said, In the assembly there were two thousand great ones. Pug nodded. We also had nearly that number who followed the lesser path, and of those who rose to the black robe, the sign of the greater magician, each was but one in five who began training under conditions more rigorous than we are capable of here or would desire. Dominic looked at Pug. What of the others? Those who failed their training? They were killed, Pug answered flatly. Dominic judged it a topic Pug did not want to pursue. A flicker of fear crossed the girl's face, and Rogan said, Hush, hush. No one will hurt your hair. He was speaking of a far away place. Some day you will be a great teacher. The girl relaxed, and a faint flicker of pride in her expression could be seen. It was obvious she doted upon the old man. Pug said, Rogan, there is something taking place that your powers may aid us in understanding. Will you help? Is it that important? I would not ask if it were not vital. Princess Anita lies in peril, and Prince Aratha is at constant risk from some unknown enemy. The girl became worried, or at least that was how Gardan and Dominic read her expression. Rogan cocked his head as if listening, then said, I know it is dangerous, but we owe Pug a great deal. He and Kul Gan are the only hope for people like ourselves. Both men appeared embarrassed by this, but said nothing. Besides, Aretha is the king's brother, and it was their father who gave us all this wonderful island to live on. How would people feel if they knew we could have helped but didn't? Pug spoke softly to Dominic. Rogan's second sight is different from any I've heard of. Your order is reputed to have some knowledge of prophecy. Dominic nodded. He sees... Probabilities is the best way I can describe it. What may happen. It seems to require a great deal of his energies, and, though he is tougher than he looks, he is still quite old. 
It's easier if only one person speaks to him, and, as you have the best understanding of the nature of the magic that has occurred, I think it would be better for you to tell him all you know. Dominic agreed. Pug said, If everyone else will please remain silent. Rogan reached across the table and took the cleric's hands. Dominic was surprised at the strength remaining in those withered old fingers. While not able to foretell himself, Dominic was familiar with the process as performed by those of his order. He cleared his mind, then began to tell his story from when Jimmy first ran foul of the Nighthawk upon the rooftop to when Aretha left Sarth. Rogan remained silent. Gamina did not move. When Dominic spoke of the prophecy naming Aretha Bane of Darkness, the old man shuddered and his lips moved silently. The mood in the room became ominous as the monk spoke. Even the fire seemed to dim. Gardan found he was hugging himself as he sat. When the monk halted, Rogan continued to clutch his hand, not allowing the other to pull away. His head was raised, neck arched slightly backwards, as if he were listening to something distant. His lips worked without sound for a while, then slowly words were forming, though so quietly they were not distinguishable. All at once he spoke clearly, his voice firm. There is a presence, a being. I see a city, a mighty bastion of towers and walls. Upon its walls stand proud men willing to defend it to the end. Now, it's a city under siege. I see it overwhelmed with its towers ablaze. It's a city being murdered. A great, savage host runs in its streets as it falls. Those who fight are sorely pressed and withdraw to a keep. Those who rape and loot, all are not human. I see those of the Dark Path and their goblin servants. They roam the streets, their weapons drip in blood. I see strange ladders being raised to storm the keep, and strange bridges of light. Now it burns, all burns, all is in flames. It is over. There was a moment of silence, then Rogan continued. I see a host gathered on a plane with strange banners flying. Black armoured figures sit silently on horseback, showing twisted shapes on shields and tabrets. Above them stands a mordel. The old man's eyes teared. He is beautiful. He is evil. He wears the mark of the dragon. He stands upon a hill while below him armies march past singing battle songs. Great machines of war are pulled by miserable human slaves. Again there was silence. Then, I see another city. The image shifts and wavers for his future is less certain. Its walls lie breached, and its streets are stained red. The sun hides its face behind grey clouds, and the city cries out in anguish. Men and women are chained in lines without end. They are whipped by creatures who taunt and torment them. They are being herded to a great square, where they face their conqueror. A throne is erected atop a mound, a mound of bodies. Upon it sits the beautiful one, the evil one. At his side stands another. A black robe hides his features, and behind them both is another something. I, I cannot see it. But it is real. It exists. It is... 
dark. It is insubstantial without being not truly there, but it is also there. It touches the one on the throne. Rogan tightly clutched Dominic's hands. Wait, he said, then hesitated. His hands began to tremble. Then, in piteous tones, nearly a sob, he cried, Oh, God's a mercy! It can see me! It can see me! The old man's lips trembled, while Gamina clutched at his shoulder, eyes wide, holding him closely, terror written upon her little face. Suddenly, Rogan's lips parted to emit a terrible groan, a sound of the purest agony and despair, and his body went rigid. Without warning, a lance of fire, a stab of pure pain erupted in the minds of all who sat in the room. Gamina screamed in silence. Gardan clutched at his head, nearly fainting from the impact, white-hot flash of searing agony. Dominic's face went ashen, and he reeled back in his chair under the onslaught of the cry, as if struck by a physical blow. Kasumi's eyes screwed closed as he fought to rise. Kulgan's pipe fell from slack lips as he clutched his temples. Pug staggered to his feet, using every shred of his magic power to erect some sort of mental barrier against the tearing in his mind. He pushed back the blackness that sought to overwhelm him, reaching out to touch the girl. Kamina, he croaked. The girl's mental screaming continued unabated, and she tore frantically at the old man's tunic, a mindless act, as if she sought somehow to snatch him back from whatever horror he faced. Her large eyes were wide, and her voiceless hysterics nearly drove those around her to madness. Pug lunged forward and grabbed her shoulder. Gamina ignored the touch, continuing to scream for Rogan. Mustering his powers, Pug forced aside the terror and pain in the girl's projected thoughts for a brief moment. Gardan's head fell forward onto the table, as did Kasumi's. Kulgan lurched upright, then fell back into his chair, stunned. Besides Pug and Gamina, only Dominic had managed to retain consciousness. Something inside him had struggled to reach out to the girl, no matter how much he wished to retreat from the pain being visited upon him by her. The girl's primitive terror nearly brought Pug to his knees, but he forced himself on. He cast a spell and the girl fell forward. At once the pain ceased. Pug caught her, but the effort drove him back and he staggered into his chair. He sat cradling the unconscious girl, stupefied by the onslaught. Dominic felt as if his head would burst, but hung on to consciousness. The old man's body was still rigid, nearly bowed back with pain, his lips working feebly. Dominic encountered a spell of healing, one used to cease pain. Finally, Rogan went limp, seeming to collapse into his chair but his face was still a mask of terror and pain, and he cried out in a hoarse whisper words the monk could not understand before he lapsed into unconsciousness. Pug and the monk exchanged confused looks. Dominic felt blackness overtake him and, before he passed out, wondered why the magician suddenly looked so frightened. Gardan paced the room where they had dined the night before. Next to the fire, Kalgan said, You'll wear a furrow in the stones of the floor if you don't sit down. Kasumi rested quietly on a cushion beside the magician. Gardan lowered himself next to the Surani and said, It's this infernal waiting. Dominic and Pug, with the aid of some healers in the community, were tending to Rogan. The old man had lain near death since he had been carried from the meeting-house. Gamina's mental scream had touched all within a mile of her, though striking those at a distance with less force. Still, several people near the building had been rendered senseless for a time. When the cries had stopped, those with their wits about them had rushed to see what had occurred. 
they had found all in the meeting house unconscious. Katala was soon on the scene and ordered them all carried to the quarters where she could oversee their care. The others had recovered in a few hours, but Rogan had not. The vision had begun in mid-morning, and now it was after supper. Gardan struck hand with fist and said, Damn! I was never meant for this sort of business. I am a soldier. These monsters of magic, these nameless powers. Oh, for an enemy of flesh and blood! Too well do I know what you can do to a flesh and blood enemy, Kasumi said. Kalgan looked interested, and Kasumi said, In the early years of the war, the captain and I faced one another at the siege of Criddy. It wasn't until we were exchanging histories that I discovered he was second to Prince Aratha during the siege, or he that I led the assault. The door opened, and a large man entered, removing a great cloak. He was bearded and weather-beaten in appearance, looking like a hunter or woodcutter. He smiled slightly and said, <laughs> I go away for a few days and look who wanders in. Gardan's dark face broke into a broad smile and he rose, extending his hand. Meacham! They shook, and the man called Meacham said, Well met, Captain. Kasumi followed suit, for Meacham was an old acquaintance. He was a Franklin, a free man with his own land in service to Kulgan, though he was more a friend to the magician than any sort of servant. Kulgan said, any luck? The forester absently stroked the scar on his left cheek, and he said, No, all fakes. Kalgan said to the others, We heard of a travelling caravan of fortune-tellers and gypsies camped a few days this side of Landreth. I sent Meacham to discover if any of them were true talents. There was one, said Meacham. Might have been what he seemed, but he quieted down when I told him where I was from. Maybe he'll show up on his own hook. He looked around the room. All right. Isn't anyone going to tell me what's going on here? As Kalgan finished recounting everything to Meacham, the door opened and further conversation was interrupted. William entered, leading Gamina by the hand. The old man's ward looked even more pale than when Gardan had seen her the day before. She looked at Kalgan, Kasumi and Gardan, and her voice entered their minds. I am sorry I caused so much pain. I was frightened. Kalgan slowly extended his arms, and the girl gingerly allowed him to gather her up onto his ample lap. With a gentle hug, he said... It's all right, lass. We understand. The others smiled at the girl reassuringly, and she seemed to relax. Fantus came padding into the room. William threw him a quick look and said, Fantus is hungry. Meacham said, That beast was born hungry. Now, came the thought. He said he was hungry. No one remembered to feed him today. I heard. Kogan gently held the little girl away from him so he could look at her. What do you mean? He told William he was hungry, just now. I heard him. Kogan looked at William. William? Can you hear, Fantus? William looked at Kogan with a curious expression. Of course. Can't you? They talk to each other all the time. Kogan's face became animated. This is wonderful. I had no idea. <laughs> no wonder you two have been so close. William, how long have you been able to speak to Fantus this way? 
The boy shrugged. Ever since I can remember, Fantas has always talked to me. And you could hear them speak to each other? Gamina nodded. Can you speak to Fantas? No, but I can hear him when he talks to William. He thinks funny. It is hard. Gardan was astonished by the conversation. He could hear Gamina's answers in his head as if he were listening. From observing the girl's private remarks to Rogan the day before, he realised that she obviously was able to speak with whomever she chose in a selective way. William turned towards the drake. All right, he said in aggravated tones. He said to Kulgan, I'd better go to the kitchen and get him something. Can Gamina stay here? Kulgan gave the girl a gentle hug and she nestled deeply into his lap. Of course. William dashed from the room and Fantas hurried after, the prospect of a meal motivating him to an atypical display of speed. When they were gone, Kulgan said, Gamina, can William speak to other creatures besides Fantas? I don't know. I'll ask him. They watched in fascination as the girl's head cocked to one side, as if she were listening to something. After a moment, she nodded. He said, Only sometimes. And most animals aren't very interesting. They think a lot about food and other animals is all. Kulgan looked as though he had been given a present. This is wonderful! Such a talent! We have never heard of a case of a human communicating directly with animals. Certain magicians have hinted at such an ability in the past, but never like this. We shall have to investigate this fully. Gamina's eyes widened as her face took on an expectant look. She sat up, and her head came around to face the door, and an instant later Pug and Dominic entered. Both looked weary, but there was no sign of the sorrow Kulgan and the others had feared. Before the question could be asked, Pug said, He still lives, though he was deeply afflicted. He noticed Gamina in Kulgan's lap, looking as if that physical contact were somehow vital to her. Are you better? Pug asked. She ventured a slight smile and a nod. Some communication passed between them, and Pug said, I think he will recover. Katala will stay at his side. Brother Dominic has proved a great help, for he is versed in healing arts. But Rogan is very old, Gamina, and if he doesn't recover, you must understand and be strong. Gamina's eyes rimmed with moisture, but she nodded slightly. Pug came over and drew up a chair, as did the monk. Pug seemed to notice the addition of Meacham for the first time, and they greeted each other. A quick introduction to Dominic was made, and then Pug said, Gamina, you could be of a big help to us. Are you willing? How? There has never been an occurrence like today's, to my knowledge. I must know what made you so afraid for Rogan. There was something in Pug's manner that revealed deep concern. He masked it well, so as not to distress the child, but it still wasn't completely hidden. Gamina looked frightened. She shook her head, and something passed between the little girl and Pug. Pug said, Whatever it was, it could make the difference in Rogan's living. Something we do not understand is involved in this. We should know about it. Gamina bit her lower lip slightly. Gardan was struck by the fact that the girl was showing considerable bravery. From what little he had heard of the girl's lot, it had been a terrible one. To grow up in a world where people were always suspicious and hostile, and those thoughts were always heard, must have kept the child on the edge of madness. For her to trust these men at all bordered on the heroic. 
Rogan's kindness and love must have been endless to counterbalance the pain this child had known. Gardan thought that if any man deserved the occasionally bestowed title of saint the temples used for their heroes and martyrs, then it was Rogan. More conversation passed between Pug and Gamina, all silent. Finally, Pug said, Speak so we might all hear. All these men are your friends, child, and they will need to hear your story to stop Rogan and others from being hurt again. Gamina nodded. I was with Rogan. What do you mean? asked Pug. When he used his second sight, I went with him. How were you able? said Colgan. Sometimes when someone thinks things or sees things, I can see or hear what they do. It's hard when they aren't thinking at me. I can do it best with Rogan. I could see what he saw in my mind. Colgan pushed the child slightly away so he might better look at her. Do you mean to say you can see Rogan's visions? The girl nodded. What about dreams? Sometimes. Colgan hugged her tightly. Oh, what a fine child you are. Two miracles in one day. Thank you, wonderful child. Gamina smiled, the first happy expression any of them had seen. Pug threw him a questioning look, and Colgan said, Your son can speak to animals. Pug's jaw dropped, and the stout magician continued, But that's not important for the moment. Gamina, what did Rogan see that hurt him so badly? Gamina began to tremble, and Kilgan held her closely. It was bad. He saw a city burning, and people being hurt by bad creatures. Pug said, Do you know the city? Is it some place you and Rogan have seen? Gamina shook her head, her big eyes seemingly as round as saucers. No, it was just a city. What else? asked Pug gently. The girl shivered. He saw something. A man. There was a strong feeling of confusion, as if she was dealing with concepts she could not fully comprehend. The man saw Rogan. Dominic said softly, How could... Something in a seeing sense the seer. A vision is a prophetic look at what might happen. What sort of thing could sense a magic witness across the barriers of time and probability? Pug nodded. Gamina, what did this man do to Rogan? It... He reached out and hurt him. He said some words. Katala entered the room, and the child looked up at her expectantly. Katala said, He's fallen into a deep, normal sleep. I think he will recover now. She came up behind the chair Kulgan sat in and leant on the back. She reached down and cupped Gamina's chin. You should be getting to bed, child. Pug said, a little longer. Katala sensed her husband was concerned with something vital and nodded agreement. He said, just before he fainted, Rogan used a word. It is important for me to know where he heard that word. I think he heard the thing... The bad man in the vision used the word. I need to know what Rogan heard the bad man say. Can you remember the words, Gamina? 
She laid her head down on Kalgan's chest and nodded only slightly, obviously afraid to remember them. Pug spoke in reassuring tones. Would you tell them to us? No. But I can show you. How? asked Pug. I can show you what Rogan saw, she answered. I just can. All of us? asked Kalgan. She nodded. The tiny girl sat up in Kalgan's lap and took a deep breath as if stealing herself. Then she closed her eyes and took them all into a dark place. Black clouds raced overhead, angry on the bitter wind. Storms threatened the city. Massive gates lay shattered, for engines of war had worked their destruction on wood and steel. Everywhere, fires burned out of control as a city died. Creatures and men savaged those found hiding in cellars and attics, and blood pooled in the gutters of the streets. In the central market, a mound of bodies had been piled nearly twenty feet high. Atop the corpses rested a platform of dark wood, upon which a throne had been placed. A mordel of striking appearance sat on the throne, surveying the chaos his servants had visited upon the city. At his side stood a figure draped all in black robes, deep hood and large sleeves hiding every physical clue as to what manner of creature it was. But the attention of Pug and the others was drawn to something beyond the pair, a presence of darkness, some strange unseen thing that could be felt. Lurking in the background, it was the true source of power behind the two upon the platform. The black-robed creature pointed at something, and a green-scaled hand could be seen. Somehow, the presence behind the two made contact, made itself known to the onlookers. It knew it was being observed, and its response was one of anger and disdain. It reached out with alien powers and spoke, carrying to those in the room a message of grey despair. All in the room shook themselves from the girl's vision. Dominic, Kulgan, Gardan and Meacham appeared disturbed, chilled by the menace in what the girl had shown them, though it could only be a shadow of the first-hand experience. But Kasumi, Katala and Pug were rocked. When the child had finished, tears streaked down Katala's face and Kasumi had lost his usual Surani mask, his face ashen and drawn. Pug appeared hardest hit of all as he sat back heavily on the floor. He lowered his head, withdrawing inside himself for a moment. Kulgan looked about in alarm. Gamina seemed more distressed by the reaction than by recalling the image. Katala sensed the child's distress and picked her up from Kulgan's lap, hugging her closely. Dominic said, What is it? Pug looked up and, more than anything, appeared suddenly fatigued, as if the weight of two worlds once again was his to bear. Finally, he spoke slowly. When Rogan was at last freed of the pain, the last words he spoke were, The darkness. The darkness. That is what he saw behind those two figures. The darkness Rogan saw spoke these words. Intruder, whoever you are, wherever you are, know my power is coming. My servant prepares the way. Tremble, for I come. As was in the past, so shall be in the future, now and forever. Taste my power. He, it must have somehow reached out and touched Rogan then, causing the terror and the pain. Kulgan said, How can this be? Softly, hoarsely, Pug spoke. I do not know, old friend. But now a new dimension is added to the mystery of who seeks Aratha's death and what lies behind all the black arts being thrown at him and his allies. 
Pug buried his face in his hands a moment, then looked around the room. Gamina clung to Katala, and all eyes were upon Pug. Dominic said, But there is something else. He looked at Kasumi and Katala. What is that tongue? I heard it as well as you, as I heard Rogan's foreign words, but know it not at all. It was Kasumi who said, The words were... ancient. A language used in the temples. I could only understand a little. But the words were... Tsirani. Chapter 14 Elvendar The forest was silent. Large branches, ancient beyond memory, arched high overhead, blocking out most of the day's sunlight. The surrounding environment revealed a soft green glow, devoid of direct shadows, and full of deep recesses of dimly perceived paths winding away. They had been in the elven forests for over two hours since mid-morning, and as yet had seen no sign of elven activity. Martin had thought they would be intercepted shortly after crossing the River Criddy, but as yet no elf had been seen. Baru spurred his horse forward and pulled even with Martin and Aratha. I think we are being watched, said the Hadati. Martin said, For some minutes now. I only caught a glimpse a while ago. If the elves are watching, why don't they come forward? asked Jimmy. Martin said, It may not be elves who watch us. We will not be completely free from care until we are within the bounds of Elvender. Keep alert. For several minutes they rode. Then even the chirping birds ceased their noise. The forest seemed to be holding its breath. Martin and Aratha pushed their mounts through narrow paths, barely wide enough for a man afoot. Suddenly, the silence was broken by a raucous hooting, punctuated by shrieks. A stone came hurling past Baru's head, and a storm of rocks, twigs and sticks followed. Dozens of small, hairy figures jumped from behind trees and brush, howling furiously while pelting the riders with missiles. Aratha charged forward, fighting to keep his mount under control, as did the others. He steered through the trees while ducking under branches. As he moved towards four or five child-sized creatures, they shrieked in terror and leapt away in different directions. Aratha singled out one and rode up behind it. The creature found itself blocked by a deadfall, a jumbled mass of fallen trees, heavy brush and a large rock. It turned to face the prince. Aratha had his sword drawn and reined in, ready to strike. Then all anger flowed out of him at the sight before him. The creature made no effort to attack, but instead backed as far as possible into the tangle, an expression of pure terror on its face. It was a very man-like face, with large, soft brown eyes, a short but human nose was set above a wide mouth. The creature's lips were drawn back in a mock snarl, showing an impressive arrangement of teeth. But the eyes were wide with fear, and large tears flowed down its hairy cheeks. Otherwise, it looked like a small ape or large monkey. A loud racket erupted around Aratha and the creature as more of the small man-thing surrounded them. They howled fiercely, pounding on the ground with savage fury, but Aratha saw it was all show. There was no real threat in their actions. Several feigned attacks, but ran shrieking in terror if Aratha turned to face them. The others came riding up behind, and the little creature Aratha had trapped cried piteously. Baru pulled up alongside the prince and said, As soon as you charged, these others fled after you. The riders could see that the gathered creatures were abandoning their mock fury and their expressions were now concerned. They chattered to one another in what sounded like words. Aratha put away his sword. We will not hurt you. As if they understood, the creatures quieted. 
The one who was trapped watched guardedly. Jimmy said, What are they? Martin said, I don't know. Man and boy, I've hunted these woods and I've never seen their like. They are Gwali, Martin Longbow. The riders turned in their saddles and were greeted by the sight of a company of five elves. One of the creatures raced to stand before the elves. He pointed an indicting finger towards the riders. In a sing-song voice he said, Carlin, man's come! Hatralala! Make stop hurt her! Martin left his horse. Well, well, Carlin! He and the elf embraced, and the other elves greeted him in turn. Then Martin led them to where his companions waited and said, Carlin, you remember my brother. Greetings, Prince of Crondor. Greetings, elf prince. He cast a sidelong glance at the surrounding Gwali. You save us from being overwhelmed. Carlin smiled. I doubt it. You look a capable company. He came up to Aratha. It has been a while since we last spoke. What brings you to our forests, Aratha, and with so strange an entourage? Where are your guardsmen and banners? <sighs> that is a long tale, Carlin, and one I wish to share with your mother and Tomas. Carlin agreed. To an elf, patience was a way of life. With the tension broken, the Gwali cornered by Aratha broke and ran to join the others of her kind, who stood around watching. Several examined her, grooming her hairy hide, patting her reassuringly after her ordeal. Satisfied she was unharmed, they quieted down and watched the elves and humans. Martin said, Carlin, what are these creatures? Carlin laughed, his pale blue eyes crinkling at the corners. He stood as tall as Aratha, but was even more slender than the rangy prince. As I have said, they are called Gwali. This rascal is named Apala. He patted the head of the one who had spoken to him. He is something of a leader among them, though I doubt they really entertain the concept. It may be he is simply more talkative than the others. Looking at the rest of Aratha's company, he said, Who are these with you? Aratha made introductions, and Carlin said, You are welcome to Elvandar. What is a Gwali? asked Rold. Carlin said, These are, and that is the best answer I can give. They have lived with us before, though this is their first visit in a generation. They are simple folk, Without guile, they are shy and tend to avoid strangers. When afraid, they will run unless they are cornered. Then they will feign attack. But don't be misled by those ample teeth. They are for tough nuts and insect carapaces. He turned his attention to a pallor. Why did you try to scare these men? The Gwali jumped up and down excitedly. Paula, make little Gwali, he grinned. She don't move. We afraid man's hurt Paula and little Gwali. They are protective of their young, said Carlin in understanding. Had you actually tried to hurt Paula and the baby, they would have risked attacking you. Had there been no birthing, you never would have seen them. He said to Apala, It is all right. These men are friends. They will not hurt Paola or her baby. Hearing this, the other Gwali came pouring out from the protecting trees and began examining the strangers with open curiosity. They tugged at the rider's clothing, which was quite different from the green tunics and brown trousers the elves wore. Aratha suffered the examination for only a minute, then said, we should get to your mother's court soon, Carlin, if your friends are finished. Please, said Jimmy, his nose wrinkling as he pushed away a Gwali who hung from a branch next to him. Don't they ever bathe? Unfortunately, no, answered Carlin. 
he said to the Gwali, That's enough. We must go. The Gwali accepted the instruction with good grace and quickly vanished among the trees, except Apala, who seemed more assertive than the rest. They will continue that sort of thing all day if you allow them to, but they don't mind when you shoot them off. Come, he told Apala. We go to Elvendar. Tend to Paola, come when you will. The Gwali grinned and nodded vigorously, then scampered off after his brethren. In a moment, there was no hint that a Gwali existed within miles. Carlin waited until Martin and Aratha had remounted. We are only a half-day's travel to Elvendar. He and the other elves began their run through the forest. Except for Martin, the riders were surprised at the pace the elves set. It was not taxing for the mounts, but for a human runner to keep it up for half a day would be close to impossible. After a short while, Aratha drew even with Carlin, who loped along at an easy pace. Where did those creatures come from? Carlin shouted, No one knows, Aratha. They're a comic lot. They come from some place to the north, perhaps beyond the great mountains. They will show up, stay a season or two, then vanish. We sometimes call them the little wood ghosts. Even our trackers can't follow them after they depart. It's been nearly fifty years since their last visit, and two hundred since the one before that. Carlin breathed easily as he ran in long, fluid strides. How fares Tomas? asked Martin. The Prince Consort fares well. What of the child? He is well. He is a fit, handsome child, though he may prove somewhat different. His heritage is... unique. And the Queen? Motherhood agrees with her, answered her elder son with a smile. They fell into silence, for Aratha found it difficult to continue the conversation while negotiating the trees, even if Carlin did not. Swiftly through the forest they travelled, each passing minute bringing them closer to Elvendar and hopes fulfilled, or hopes dashed. The journey was soon completed. One moment they were travelling through heavy forest, then they entered a large clearing. This was the first glimpse any of them save Martin had had of Elvendar. Giant trees of many colours rose high above the surrounding forest. In the afternoon light, the topmost leaves seemed ablaze with colour where golden sunlight struck them. Even from this distance, figures could be seen along the high paths spanning the gaps between bowls. Several of the giant trees were unique to this place, their leaves a dazzling silver, gold or even white. As the day's shadows deepened, they could be seen to have a faint glow of their own. It was never truly dark in Elvendar. As they crossed the clearing, Aratha could hear the astonished comments of his companions. Rold said, Had I known, you'd have had to tie me up to keep me from coming along. Laurie agreed. It makes the weeks in the forest worth it. Baru said, The tales of our singers do not do justice to it. Aratha awaited a comment from Jimmy, but when the voluble lad said nothing, Aratha looked behind. Jimmy rode in silence, his eyes drinking in the splendour of this place, so alien from anything seen in his life. The usually jaded boy had finally encountered something so outside his experience he was truly awestruck. They reached the outer boundary of the tree city and, on all sides, could hear the soft sounds of a busy community. A hunting party approached from another quarter, bearing a large stag, which they carried off to be butchered. An open area outside the trees was set aside for the dressing of carcasses. They reached the trees and reined in. Carlin instructed his companions to care for the horses and led Aratha's party up a circular stairway carved into the trunk of the biggest oak the prince and the others had ever seen. Reaching a platform at the top, they passed a group of elven fletchers practising their craft. One saluted Martin, who returned the greeting and briefly inquired if he might impose upon their generosity. 
With a smile, the Fletcher handed Martin a bundle of finely crafted bow shafts, which the Duke placed in his nearly empty quiver. He spoke quick thanks in the elven tongue, and he and his companions continued onwards. Carlin led them up another steep stairway to a platform. He said, From here, it may prove difficult for some of you. Keep to the centre of the paths and platforms, and do not look down if you feel discomforted. Some humans find the heights distressing. He said the last as if it was almost incomprehensible. They crossed the platform and mounted more steps, passing other elves hurrying about their business. Many were dressed like Carlin, in simple woods garb, but others wore long, colourful robes, fashioned of rich fabrics, or bright tunics and trousers equally colourful. The women were all beautiful, though it was a strange, inhuman loveliness. Most of the men looked young, about Carlin's age. Martin knew better. Some elves hurrying past were young, twenty, thirty years of age, while others, equally young in appearance, were several hundred years old. Though he looked younger than Martin, Carlin was past a hundred and had taught Martin hunting skills when the Duke had been a boy. They continued along a walkway nearly twenty feet wide, stretching along enormous branches until they came to a ring of trunks. In the midst of the trees, a large platform had been constructed, almost sixty feet across. Laurie wondered if even a single drop of rain could worm its way through the thick canopy of branches overhead to fall on a royal brow. They had reached the Queen's Court. Across this platform they walked to a dais upon which two thrones were erected. In the slightly higher of the two sat an elven woman, serenity enhancing her already near-flawless beauty. Her face, with its arched brows and finely chiselled nose, was dominated by her pale blue eyes. Her hair was light red-brown, with streaks of gold, like Carlin's, giving it the appearance of being struck by sunlight. Upon her head rested no crown, only a simple circlet of gold that pulled back her hair, but there was no mistaking Aglarana, the elf queen. Upon the throne to her left sat a man, he was an imposing figure, taller than Martin by two inches. His hair was sandy blonde, and his face looked young, while still holding some elusive, ageless quality. He smiled at the sight of the approaching party, giving him an even younger look. His face was similar to the elves, yet with a difference. His eyes lacked colour to the point of being grey, and his eyebrows were less arched. His face was less angular, possessing a strong, square jaw. His ears, revealed by the golden circlet that held back his hair, were slightly pointed, less upswept than those of the elves. And he was much more massive in the chest and shoulders than any elf. Carlin bowed before them. Mother and queen, prince and war leader, we are graced by guests. Both rulers of Elvendar rose and walked forward to greet their guests. Martin was greeted with affection by the Queen and Tomas, and the others were shown high courtesy and warmth. Tomas said to Aretha, Highness, you are welcome. Aretha replied, I thank Her Majesty and His Highness. Seated around the court were other elves, Aretha recognised the old councillor Tathar from his visit to Criddy years before. Quick introductions were made. The Queen bade them rise and led everyone to a reception area adjoining the court, where they were all informally seated. Refreshments were brought, food and wine, and Aglarana said, We are pleased to see the old friends. She nodded at Martin and Aretha, and to welcome you. She indicated the others. Still, men rarely visit us without cause. What is yours, Prince of Grondor? Aretha told them his tale while they dined. From first to last, the elves sat silently listening. When Aretha was finished, the queen said, Tatha? The old councillor nodded. The 
hopeless quest. Aretha asked, Are you saying you know nothing of Silverthorn? No, replied the queen. The hopeless quest is a legend among our people. We know the Alebra plant. We know of its properties. That is what the legend of the hopeless quest tells us. Tatha, please explain. The old elf, the first Jimmy and the others had seen who showed some signs of age, faint lines around the eyes and hair so pale it bordered on white, said, In the lore of our people, there was a prince of Elvendar who was betrothed. His beloved had been courted by a Moradel warrior whom she spurned. In his wrath, the Moradel poisoned her with a draught brewed from the Alebra, and she fell into a sleep unto death. Thus the prince of Elvendar began the hopeless quest, in search of that which could cure her, the Alebra, the Silverthorn. Its power is such that it can cure as well as kill, but the Alebra grows only in one place. Moralin, in your language, the Black Lake. It is a place of power, sacred to the Mordel, a place where no elf may go. The legend says the Prince of Elvandar walked the edge of Moralin until he had worn a canyon around it. For he may not enter Moralin, nor will he leave until he has found that which will save his beloved. It is said he walks there still. Aretha said, But I am not an elf. I will go to Moralin if you'll but show me the way. Tomas looked around the assembly. We shall place your feet upon the path to Moralin, Aretha, he said. But not until you have rested and taken counsel. Now we shall show you places where you may refresh yourselves and sleep until the nighttime meal. The meeting broke up as the elves moved away, leaving Carlin, Thomas and the Queen with Aretha's group. Martin said, What of your son? With a broad smile, Tomas motioned for them to follow. He led them through a bow-covered passage to a room, its vault formed by a giant elm where a baby lay sleeping in a cradle. He was less than six months old from the look of him. He slept deeply, dreaming, little fingers flexing slightly. Martin studied the child and could see what Carlin meant by saying his heritage was unique. The child looked more human than Elvin, his ears being only slightly pointed and possessing lobes, a human trait unknown among elves. His round face looked more like that of any chubby infant, but there was an edge to it something which said to Martin that this was a child who was more his father's than his mother's. Aglorana reached down and gently touched him while he slept. Martin said, What have you named him? Softly the queen said, Carlis. Martin nodded. In the elven tongue it meant child of the green, referring to life and growth. It was an auspicious name. Leaving the baby, Martin and the others were taken to rooms within the tree city of Elvendar, where they found tubs for bathing and sleeping mats. All were quickly clean and asleep, save Aretha, whose mind wandered from an image of Anita asleep to a silver plant growing on the shore of a black lake. Martin sat alone, enjoying the first evening of his first visit to Elvendar in a year. As much as any place, even Castle Criddy, this was his home. For as a boy he had played and been one with the elven children. Soft elven footsteps caused him to turn. Galain, he said, happy to see the young elf, cousin to Carlin. He was Martin's oldest friend. They embraced, and Martin said... I expected to see you sooner. I've just returned from patrolling along the northern edge of the forests. Some strange things are going on up there. I hear you may have some light to shed on what they may be. A small candle flicker, perhaps, said Martin. Some evil is at play up there, have no doubt. He filled Gelaine in, and the young elf said, Terrible deeds, Martin. 
He sounded genuinely sorry to hear about Anita. Your brother? The question, in elvish fashion, carried a variety of nuances in the intonation, each concerning itself with a different aspect of Aratha's trials. He perseveres, somehow. He puts it all out of his mind sometimes. Other times he is nearly overwhelmed by it. I don't know how he keeps from going mad. He loves her so very deeply. Martin shook his head. You've never wed, Martin. Why? Martin shook his head. I've never met her. You are sad? <laughs> Arath is a difficult man at times, but he is my brother. I remember him as a child. Even then it was hard to get close to him. Perhaps it was his mother's death when he was still so young. He kept things distant. For all the toughness, for all the hard edges, he's easily hurt. You two are much alike. There is that, Martin agreed. Gallane stood quietly next to Martin a while. We shall help as much as we can. We must go to Morolin. The young elf shivered, an unusual display even in one so inexperienced. That is a bad place, Martin. It is called Black Lake for a reason that has nothing to do with the colour of the water. It is a well of madness. The more they'll go there to dream dreams of power, it lies on the dark path. It was a Valheru place. Garlain nodded yes. Tomas? Again, the question carried a variety of meanings. Galen was especially close to Tomas, having followed him during the Rift War. He will not go with you. He has a new son. Callis will be tiny for so short a time, only a few years. A father should spend that time with his baby. Also, there is the risk. Nothing more needed to be said, for Martin understood. He had watched the night Tomas had almost succumbed to the mad spirit of the Valheru within him. It had nearly cost Martin his life. It would be some time before Tomas felt secure enough to challenge his own heritage, to again awaken that dread being contained within. And he would venture into a Valheru place of power only when he felt circumstances were grave enough to justify the risk. Martin smiled his crooked smile. Then we shall go alone, <laughs> we humans of meagre talents. Galane returned the smile. You are many things, so I doubt your talents meagre. Then he lost the smile. Still, you would do well to take counsel with the spellweavers before you go. There is dark power at Morolin, and magic overcomes much in the way of strength and courage. Martin said, We will. We speak soon. He looked to where an elf approached, Arthur and the others behind. I think now. Will you come? I've no place in the circle of elders. Besides, I have not eaten for a day. I will rest. Come talk if you need. I will. Martin hurried to join Arthur. They followed the elf who led the humans back to the council. When all were seated before Aglarana and Tomas, the queen said, Tatha, speak for the spellweavers. Say what counsel you have for Prince Aratha. Tatha stepped into the centre of the court circle and said, Strange things have been occurring for some turns of the Middle Moon. We expected southward movement of the Moradel and goblins back to the homes they were driven from during the Rift War. But this has not come to be. Our scouts in the north have tracked many bands of goblins heading across the great northern mountains into the Northlands. Moradel's scouts have come unusually close to our borders. The Gwali come to us again because they say they don't like the place they lived in any more. It is hard to make sense of them at times, but we know they came from the north. What you have told us, Prince Aratha, causes us deep concern. First, because we share your sorrow. Second, 
because the manifestations you tell of bespeak a power of great evil, with a long reach and far-flung minions. But, most of all, because of our own ancient history. Long before we drove the Mohredel from our forests for taking to the dark path of power, the elven people were one. Those of us who lived in the forests were farther from our masters, the Valheru, and because of this were less attracted to the intoxication of power dreams. Those of us who lived close to our masters were seduced by those dreams and became the Mordel. He looked to the Queen and Tomas, and both nodded. What is little spoken of is the cause of our divorcement from the Mordel, who once were our blood. Never before has any human been told all. In the dark era of the Chaos Wars, many changes in the lands occurred. From the people of the Elves, four groups rose. Martin leant forward, for as much as he knew of Elvenkind more than almost any man alive, this was all new to him. Until this moment, he had always believed only the Moradel and Elves were the sum total of Elvenkind. The most wise and powerful, numbering the greatest spellweavers and scholars, were the Eldar. They were the caretakers for all that their masters had plundered from across the cosmos. Arcane works, mystical knowledge, artifacts and riches. It was they who first began fashioning what is now Elvendar, lending it magic aspect. They vanished during the Chaos Wars, for they were among our master's first servants, and it is supposed that, being very close to them, they perished with them. Of the Elves and Brotherhood of the Dark Path, the Elidel and Mordel in our tongue, you know something. But there were yet other kin of ours. The Glamredel, which means the chaotic ones or the mad ones. They were changed by the Chaos Wars, becoming a nation of insane, savage warriors. For a time, Elves and Mordel were one, and both were warred upon by the Mad Ones. Even after the Mordel were driven from Elvendar, they remained the sworn enemy of the Glamredel. We speak little of these days, for you must remember that while we speak of Eladel, Moradel, and Glamredel, all elven kind is one race, even to this day. It is simply that some of our people have chosen a dark way of life. Martin was astonished. For all he knew of elven culture, he had, like other humans, always supposed the Moradel a race apart, related to the elves, but somehow different. Now he realised why the elves had always been reticent in discussing their relationship to the Moradel. They saw them as being one with themselves. In an instant Martin understood. The elves mourned the loss of their brothers to the lure of the dark path. Tathar continued. Our lore tells of the time when the last great battle in the north was fought when the armies of the Mordel and their goblin servants at last crushed the Glamredel. The Mordel rampaged, obliterating our mad cousins in a terrible war of genocide. Even to the smallest infant, the Glamredel were supposedly slaughtered, lest they rise again and challenge the supremacy of the Mordel. It is the single blackest shame in the memory of our race, that one segment of our people utterly destroyed another. But what concerns you is this. At the heart of the Moradel host stood a company called the Black Slayers, Moradel warriors who had renounced their mortality to become monsters with but one purpose, to kill 
for their master. Once dead, the Black Slayers rise again to do their master's bidding. Once risen from the dead, they may be halted only by magic means, by utterly destroying the body, or by cutting the hearts out of their bodies. Those who rode against you on the road to Sarth were black slayers, Prince Aratha. Before the Battle of Obliteration, the Moradel had already gone far down the dark path, but something caused them to descend to these new depths of horror the Black Slayers, and the Genocide. They had become a tool of an insane monster, a leader who sought to emulate the vanished Valheru and bring all the world under his dominion. It was he who had gathered the Moradel under his banner and who had given rise to the abomination that was the Black Slayers. But in that last battle... He was wounded unto death, and with his passing the Moradel ceased to be a nation. His captains gathered and sought to determine a successor. They quickly fell out with one another and became much like the goblins, tribes, clans, families, never able to combine under one leader for long. The siege of Kars Keep, fifty years past, was but a skirmish compared to the might the Moradel mustered under this leader. But with his passing, an era of Moradel might came to an end, for he was unique, a charismatic, hypnotic being of strange abilities, able to weld the Moradel into a nation. The leader's name was... Mamandamus. Aratha said, Is it possible he's somehow returned? Anything may be possible, Prince Aratha, or so it seems to one who has lived as long as I, answered Tatha. It may be that one seeks to unite the Moradel by invoking that ancient name, gathering them together under one banner. Then there is this business of the serpent priest. So despised are the Pantathians that even the Moradels slaughter them when they find them. But that one of them is a servant of this Mermandimus hints at dark alliances. If the nations of the North are rising, we all must again face a testing, one which will rival that of the outworlders in peril for our peoples. Baru stood in Hadati fashion, indicating he wished to speak. Tathar inclined his head in Baru's direction, and he said, Of Moradel law, my people know little, save that the Dark Brothers are enemies of our blood. This much I may add. Murad is counted a great chieftain, perhaps the greatest living today. One who might command many hundreds of warriors. That he serves with the Black Slayers speaks of Mermandamus's power. Murad would serve only one whom he feared, and one who could visit fear upon Murad is one to be feared indeed. Aratha said, As I told the Ishapians, much of this is speculation. I must be concerned with finding Silverthorn. But even as he uttered these words, Aratha knew he was speaking falsely. Too much indicated that the threat from the north was real. This was no rash of goblin raids on northern farmers. This was a potential for invasion surpassing that of the Surani. In the face of this... His refusal to set aside all considerations except finding a cure for Anita was shown for what it was, an obsession. They may be one and the same, Highness, said Algarana. What seems to be unfolding here is a madman's desire to gather the Moradel and their servants and allies under his dominion. To do so, he must bring a prophecy to fruition. He must destroy the bane of darkness. And what has he accomplished? He has forced you to come to the one place he is certain to find you. 
Jimmy sat upright, his eyes wide. He's waiting for you, he blurted, ignoring protocol. He's at this black lake. Laurie and Roald put their hands upon his shoulders in reassurance. Jimmy sat back, looking embarrassed. Tathar said, From the lips of youth, I and the others have considered, and, in our judgment, that is what must be occurring, Prince Aratha. Since the gift of the Ishapian talisman, Mamandamus must devise another way to find you, or he risks his alliances dissolving. The Moradel are much as others. They need to raise crops and tend herds. Should Mamandamus tarry over long in bringing the prophecy to fruition, they may desert him, save for those who have taken dark vows, such as the Black Slayers. His agents will have passed word that you have quit Sarth, and by now intelligence from Krondor will tell him you are upon a quest for that which will save your princess. Yes, he will know you seek Silverthorn, and he, or one of his captains, such as Murad, will be waiting for you at Moralin. Arthur and Martin looked at each other. Martin shrugged. We never thought it would be easy. Arthur regarded the Queen, Tomas, and Tathar. My thanks for your wisdom. But we will go to Moralin. Aratha looked up as Martin came to stand nearby. Brooding? asked the elder brother. Just considering things, Martin. Martin sat next to Aratha at the edge of a platform near the rooms they had been given. In the night, Elvendar glowed with a faint light, a phosphorescence that kept the elven city cloaked in a soft magic. What things are you considering? That I may have let my preoccupation with Anita get in the way of my duty? Martin said, Doubt. Well, then you reveal yourself at last. <laughs> Listen, Aratha. I've had doubts about this journey from the start. But if you let doubt block you, nothing gets done. You must simply make your best judgment and act. And if I'm wrong? Then you're wrong. Aratha lowered his head until it rested against a wooden rail. The problem is one of stakes. When I was a child, if I was wrong, I lost a game. Now... I could lose a nation. Perhaps. But it still doesn't change the need to make your best judgment and act. Things are getting out of hand. I wonder if it might not be best to return to Yarbon and order Vandross's army into the mountains. That might do it. But then there are places six may go, an army may not. Aratha smiled a wry smile. Not very many. Martin returned the smile, almost a mirror image. True. But still there are one or two. From what Gallane said about Morolin, stealth and cunning will be more important than strength. What if you marched Van Dross's army up there and found Morolin laid just the other side of a lovely road like the one up to the Abbey at Sarth? Remember, the one Gardan avowed could be held by a half-dozen grannies with brooms? I'll warrant Mamandamus has more than a half-dozen grandmothers up there. Even if you could battle Mamandamus's hordes and win, could you order one soldier to give his life so Anita should live? No. You and this Mamandamus play a game for high stakes, but still a game. As long as Mamandamus thinks he can lure you up to Morolin, we have a chance of stealing in and getting Silverthorn. Aratha looked at his brother. We do? he asked, already knowing the answer. Of course. As long as we don't spring the trap, it remains open. That is the nature of traps. If they don't know we're already inside, we might even get out. He spent a quiet moment looking northwards, then said, It's so close. It's just up in those mountains. 
week from here. No more. It's so close. He laughed at Aretha. It would be a shame to come so close and quit. Aretha said, You're mad. Perhaps, said Martin. But just think, it's so close. Aretha had to laugh. All right, we leave tomorrow. The six riders set out the next morning with the blessings of the elf queen and Tomas. Carlin, Gallane, and two other elves ran alongside the horsemen. As they lost sight of the queen's court, a gwali swung along through the trees, crying, Carlin! The elf prince signalled a halt, and the gwali dropped from the branches and grinned at them. Where man's going with Carlin? Apala, we take them to the northern road. Then they travel to Morolin. The Gwali became agitated and shook his furry head. No go, mans! Bad place! Little old Nolly eaten there by bad thing! What bad thing? said Carlin. But the Gwali ran off, shrieking in fright, before an answer could be forthcoming. Jimmy said, Nothing like a happy send-off. Carlin said, Galen, return and find Apala, and see if you can glean any sense from what he says. Galen said, I'll find out what he means and follow after. He waved to the travellers and headed back after the Gwali. Aretha motioned for the party to continue. For three days the elves guided them to the edge of their forests, up into the foothills of the great northern mountains. Then, at midday on the fourth day, they came to a small stream, and on the other side they could see the trail leading through the woodlands towards a canyon. Carlin said, Here is the limit of our holdings. Martin said, What of Gallane, do you think? It may be he discovered nothing of worth, or it may have taken him a day or two to find a pala. The Gwali can be difficult to locate if they decide to be. If Galane meets us, we'll direct him after you. He will overtake you as long as you haven't crossed over into the heart of Moralin. Where would that be? said Aratha. Follow that trail for two days until you come to a small valley. Cross it, and on the north face you'll see a waterfall. A trail leads up from there, and atop the plateau you'll be near the top of the falls. Follow the river upwards until you reach its source. From that lake you'll find a trail again moving upwards, again to the north. That is the only way to Morolin. You'll find a canyon which winds around the lake in a complete circle. Legend says it is the tracks made by the morning elf prince, wearing the ground down around the lake. It is called the Tracks of the Hopeless. There is only one way into Morolin, across a bridge made by the Moradel. When you cross the bridge over the Tracks of the Hopeless, you will be in Morolin. There you will find the Silverthorn. It is a plant with a light silver-green leaf of three lobes, with fruit like red holly berries. You will recognize it at once, for its name describes it. The thorns are silver. If nothing else, get a handful of the berries. It will lie close to the edge of the lake. Now go, and may the gods protect you. With brief farewells, the six riders rode off, Martin and Baru in the lead, Aratha and Lorry following, Jimmy and Roald bringing up the rear. As they followed a turn, Jimmy glanced back until he could no longer see the elves. He turned, eyes forward, knowing they were now on their own, without allies or haven. He said a silent prayer to Banath and took a deep breath. Chapter 15 Return Pug stared into the fire. The small brazier in his study threw a dancing pattern of lights on the walls and ceiling. He ran his hand over his face, feeling fatigue in the very fabric of his being. He had laboured since Rogan's vision, sleeping and eating only when Katala pushed him from his studies. 
Now, he carefully closed one of Macross's many books. He had been reading them exhaustively for a week. Since confronted with the impossibilities of Rogan's vision, he had sought every shred of information available to him. Only one other magic user upon this world had known anything pertaining to the world of Kelowan, and that had been Macross the Black. Whatever that dark presence in the vision, it had spoken a language that fewer than 5,000 on Midkemia might even recognise. Pug, Katala, Lori, Kasumi and his Tsirani garrison at Lamut, and a few hundred ex-prisoners scattered around the far coast. And of them all, only Pug could fully understand the words spoken in Gamina's vision, for that language was a distant, dead ancestor of the present-day Tsirani tongue. Now Pug searched in vain through Macross's library for some hint of what this dark power might be. Of the hundreds of volumes Macross had bequeathed to Pug and Kulgan, only a third had been catalogued. Macross, through his strange, goblin-like agent Gathis, had provided a listing of each title. In some cases that had proved helpful, for the work was well known by title alone. In other cases it was useless until the book was read. There were seventy-two works alone called Magic, and a dozen other instances of several books with like nomenclature. Looking for possible clues to the nature of what they faced, Pug had closeted himself with the remaining works and begun skimming them for any hint of useful information. Now he sat the work upon his knee with a growing certainty about what he must do. Pug placed the book carefully upon his writing table and left his study. He walked down the stairs to the hall that connected all the rooms in use in the academy building. Work upon the upper level next to the tower that housed his workrooms had been halted by the rain that now beat down upon Stardock. A cold gust blew through a crack in the wall, and Pug gathered his black robe about himself as he entered the dining hall, which was used as a common room these days. Katala looked up from where she sat embroidering near the fireplace in one of the comfortable chairs that occupied the half of the room used as common quarters. Brother Dominic and Kulgan had been talking, the heavy-set magician puffing on his ever-present pipe. Kasumi watched as William and Gamina played chess in a corner, their two little faces masks of concentration as they pitted their newly emerging skills against each other. William had been an indifferent student of the game until the girl had shown an interest. Being beaten by her seemed to bring out his sense of competition, heretofore limited to the ball yard. Pug thought to himself that, when time permitted, he would have to explore their gifts more closely. If time permitted. Meacham entered, carrying a decanter of wine and offered a wine cup to Pug. Pug thanked him and sat down next to his wife. Katala said, Supper is not for another hour. I had expected I would have to come and fetch you. I've finished that work I had and decided to relax a little before dining. Katala said, Good. You drive yourself too hard, Pug. With teaching others, supervising the construction of this monstrous building, and now... Locking yourself away in your study, you have had little time to spend with us. Pug smiled at her. Nagging? A wifely prerogative, she said, returning his smile. Katala was not a nag. Whatever displeasure she felt was openly voiced and quickly resolved by either compromise or one partner's acceptance of the other's intractability. Pug looked about. Where is Gardan? Colgan said, Bah, you see, if you hadn't been locked up in your tower, you'd have remembered he left today for Shamata, so he can send Liam messages by military pouch. He'll be back in a week. He went alone. Colgan settled back in his chair. I cast a foretelling. The rain will last three days. Many of the workers returned home for a short visit rather than sit in their barracks for three days. Gardan went with them. What have you been delving into in your tower these last few days? You've barely said a civil word for a week. Pug surveyed those in the room with him. 
Katala seemed absorbed by her needlework, but he knew she was listening closely for his answer. The children were intent upon their game. Colgan and Dominic watched him with open interest. Reading Macross's works? Seeking to discover something that might give a clue to what can be done? You? Dominic and I have counselled with others in the village. We've managed to come to some conclusions. Such as? Now that Rogan is healing and has been able to tell us in detail what he saw in his vision, some of our more talented youngsters have thrown themselves upon the problem. Pug detected a mixture of amusement and pride in the older magician's words. Whatever it is out there that seeks to bring harm to the kingdom, or Midchemia, is limited in power. Assume for a moment that it is as you fear some dark agency slipped through the rift from Kelowan somehow during the Rift War. It has weaknesses and fears to reveal itself fully. Explain, please, said Pug, his interest driving aside all fatigue. We will assume this thing is from Kasumi's homeworld and not seek some other more exotic explanation for its use of an ancient Surani dialect. But, unlike Kasumi's former allies, it comes not in open conquest, but rather seeks to use others as tools. Assume it came by the rift somehow. The rift is a year closed which means it has been here for at least that long, and perhaps as long as eleven years, gathering servants like the Pantathian priests. Then it seeks to establish itself by using a mordel, the beautiful one, as Rogan described him, as an agent. What we need truly fear is the dark presence behind that beautiful mordel and the others, that is the ultimate author of this bloody business. Now, if all this is true, it seeks to manipulate and employ guile rather than direct force. Why? Either it is too weak to act and must employ others, or it is biding its time until it is able to reveal its true nature and come to the fore which all means we still must discover the identity and nature of this thing, this power. True. Now, we also have done some speculation predicated upon the assumption that what we face is not of Kelowan. Pug interrupted. Oh, do not waste time with that, Kalgan. We must proceed on the assumption that what we face is from Kelowan, for that at least provides us with a possible avenue of approach. If Mamandamus is simply some Mordel witch-king come into his own, one who just happens to speak a long-dead Surani tongue, we can counter that. But an invasion by some dark power from Kelowan, that is the assumption we must make. Kalgan sighed loudly and relit his cold pipe. I wish we had more time and more idea of how to proceed, I wish we could examine some aspect of this phenomenon without risk. I wish a hundred things. But most of all, I wish for one work by one reliable witness to this thing. There is a place where such a work may exist. Dominic said, Well, I would gladly accompany you or anyone else to such a place, no matter what the risk. Kalgan barked a bitter laugh. Not likely, good brother. My former student speaks of a place upon another world. Kalgan looked hard at Pug. The Library of the Assembly. Kasumi said, The Assembly? Pug saw Katala stiffen. In that place there may be answers that would aid our coming battle, he said. Katala never took her eyes from her work. In controlled tones, she said, It is good the rift is closed and cannot be reopened save by chance. Your life may already be ordered forfeit. Remember that your status as a great one was called into question before the attack on the emperor. Who can doubt you are now named outlaw? No. 
It is good there is no way you might return. Pug said, There is a way. Instantly, Katala's eyes were ablaze as she looked hard at him. No, you cannot return. Kulgan said, How can there be a way back? When I studied for the black robe, I was given a final task, Pug explained. Standing upon the Tower of Testing, I saw a vision of the time of the Stranger, a wandering star that imperiled Kelowan. It was Macross who intervened at the last to save Kelowan. Macross was again on Kelowan on the day I nearly destroyed the Imperial Arena. It was obvious all the time, and only this week did I understand. Macross could travel between the worlds at will, said Kalgan, comprehension dawning in his eyes. Macross had the means to fashion controllable rifts. And I have found it. Clear instructions are in one of his books. Katala whispered, You cannot go. He reached over and took her white-knuckled hands in his own. I must. He faced Kalgan and Dominic. I have the means of returning to the assembly, and I must use it. Otherwise, should Mamandamus be a servant of some dark Kelowanese power, or simply a diversion while such a power comes into its own, we will be lost, without hope. If we are to find a way of dealing with such a one, we must first identify it, discover its true nature, and, to do that, I must go to Kelowan. He looked at his wife, then at Kalgan. I will return to Suranuani. It was Meacham who spoke first. Well then, when do we leave? Pug said, We? <laughs> I must go alone. The tall Franklin said, You can't go alone, as if that thought was the sheerest absurdity. When shall we leave? Pug looked up at Meacham. You don't speak the language. You're too tall to be a Surani. I'll be your slave. There are Midkemian slaves there, you've said often enough. His tone indicated the argument was over. He looked from Katala to Kalgan and said, There wouldn't be a moment's peace around here should anything happen to you. William came over, Gamina behind him. Papa, please take Meacham with you. Please. Pug put his hands in the air. Very well, we'll establish some charade. Kalgan said, I feel a little better, which is a relative statement not to be taken as approval. Your objection is duly noted. Dominic said, Now the issue has been broached. I too wish to again offer to accompany you. You offered before you knew where I was going. <laughs> One Midkemian I can look after. Two would prove too burdensome. I have my uses, replied Dominic. I know the healer's arts and can perform my own brands of magic, and I have a good arm and can wield a mace. Pug studied the monk. You are taller than I by only a little. You might pass as a Sirani, but there's the problem of language. In Ishap's order, we have magic means to learn languages. While you prepare your rift spells, I can learn the Surani tongue and aid Meacham in learning it as well, if the Lady Katala or Earl Kasumi will help. William said, I can help. I speak Surani. Katala didn't look pleased, but agreed. Kasumi said, I also... He looked troubled. Kalgan said, Of all here, Kasumi, I expected you would be the most likely to wish a return, yet you've said nothing. When the last rift closed, my life on Kelowan ended. I am now Earl of Lamut. My tenure within the Empire of Tsuranuani is but a memory. Even if it is possible to return, I would not, for I have taken oath to the king, but, he said to Pug, 
Will you carry messages for me to my father and brother? They have no way to know I live, let alone prosper. Of course. It is only right. He said to Katala, Beloved, can you fashion two robes of the order of Hangtukama? She nodded. He explained to the others, It is a missionary order. Its members are commonly seen travelling about. Disguised as such, we shall attract little attention as we wander. Meacham can be our begging slave. Kalgan said, I still don't like this idea. I am not happy. Meacham looked at Kalgan. When you worry, you're happy. Pug laughed at this. Katala put her arms around her husband and held him closely. She also was not happy. Katala held up the robe and said, Try this. Pug found it a perfect fit. She had carefully chosen fabrics that would most closely resemble those used upon Kalawan. Pug had been meeting daily with the others in the community, delegating authority for his absence and, as was understood but not spoken, against the probability that he would not return. Dominic had been learning Tsurani from Kasumi and William and aiding in Meacham's mastery of that language. Kalgan had been given Macross's work on rifts to study, so he could aid Pug in the formation of one. Kalgan entered Pug's private quarters as Katala was inspecting her handiwork. You'll freeze in that. Katala said, My homeworld is a hot place, Kalgan. These light robes are what is commonly worn. By women as well? When she said yes, he said, Positively indecent, as he pulled out a chair. William and Gamina ran into the room. The little girl was a changed child now that Rogan's recovery was assured. She was William's constant companion, playing, competing and arguing as if she were a sister. Katala had kept her in the family's quarters while the old man healed, in a room next to William's. The boy shouted, Meacham's coming! and broke out in gleeful laughter as he spun in a circle of delight. Gamina laughed aloud as well, imitating William's spin, and Kalgan and Pug exchanged glances, for it was the first audible sound the child had ever made. Meacham entered the room, and the adult's laughter joined with the children's. The burly forester's hairy legs and arms stuck out from the short robe, and he stood awkwardly in the imitation Sirani sandals. He looked around the room. So what's funny? Kalgan said, I've grown so used to seeing you in hunter's togs, I couldn't imagine what you'd look like. Pug said, You just look a little different than I had expected and tried to stifle a laugh. The Franklin shook his head in disgust. If you're done, when do we leave? Pug said, Tomorrow morning, just after dawn. Instantly, all laughter in the room died. They waited quietly around the hill with the large tree on the north side of Stardock Island. The rain had stopped, but a damp, cold wind blew, promising more rain shortly. Most of the community had come to see Pug, Dominic and Meacham on their way. Katala stood next to Kulgan, with her hands upon William's shoulders. Gamina clutched tightly to Katala's skirt, looking nervous and a little frightened. Pug stood alone, consulting the scroll he had fashioned. A short way off, Meacham and Dominic waited, shivering against the cold, while they listened to Kasumi speak. He was intensively speaking of every detail of Surani custom and life he could remember that might prove important. He was constantly remembering details he had almost forgotten. The Franklin held the travel bag Pug had prepared, containing the usual items a priest would carry. Also inside, under those items, were a few things uncommon to a priest on Kelawan, weapons and coins of metal a fortune by Kelawanese standards. Kalgan came to where Pug indicated, holding a staff fashioned by a woodcarver in the village. He planted it firmly in the soil, then took another handed to him and placed it four feet away. 
He stepped back as Pug began to read aloud from the scroll. Between the staves, a field of light grew, rainbow colours dancing up and down. A crackling noise could be heard, and the air began to smell as it did after a lightning strike, acrid and pungent. The light began to expand and change in colour, moving faster through the spectrum until it gleamed whitely. It grew in intensity until it was too bright to look upon. Still, Pug's voice droned on. Then came a loud explosion of noise, as if a thunderclap had peeled between the staves, and a short gust of wind towards the gap between them, as if a sudden drawing in of air had occurred. Pug put away his scroll, and all looked at what he had fashioned. A shimmering square of grey nothingness stood between the upright staves. Pug motioned to Dominic and said, I'll go through first. The rift is targeted to a glade behind my old estate, but it might have appeared elsewhere. If the environment proved hostile, he would have to step around the pole, entering it from the same side again, appearing back on Midkemia as if he had passed through a hoop, if he was able. He turned and smiled at Katala and William. His son jiggled around nervously, but Katala's reassuring pressure on the boy's shoulders quieted him. She only nodded, her face composed. Pug stepped into the rift and vanished. There was an audible intake of breath at the sight, for only a few there knew what to expect. The following moments dragged on, and many unconsciously held their breath. Suddenly, Pug appeared from the other side of the rift, and an audible sigh of relief came from those who waited. He came back to the others and said, It opens exactly where I had hoped it would. Macross's spellcraft was flawless. He took Katala's hands. It is next to the reflecting pool in the meditation glade. Katala fought back the tears. She had tended flowers around that pool, where a solitary bench looked over calm waters when she had been mistress of that great estate. She nodded understanding, and Pug embraced her, then William. As Pug knelt before William, Gamina suddenly threw her arms around his neck. Be careful. He hugged her in return. I will, little one. Pug motioned Dominic and Meacham to follow and walked through the rift. They hesitated the barest instant and followed him into the greyness. The others stood watching for long minutes after the three had vanished and the rain began again. No one wished to leave. Finally, as the rain took on a more insistent quality, Kalgan said, Those set to watch remain. The rest back to work. Everyone slowly moved off, no one resenting Kalgan's sharp tone. They all shared his concern. Yagu chief gardener on the estate of Natoa, near the city of Ontoset, turned to find three strangers walking the path from the meditation glade to the great house. Two were priests of Hantukama, the bringer of blessed health, though both were unusually tall for priests. Behind walked their begging slave, a captive barbarian giant from the late war. Yagu shuddered, for he was an ugly sort, with a horrible scar down his left cheek. In a culture of warriors, Yagu was a gentleman, preferring the company of his flowers and plants to that of men who spoke only of warfare and honour. Still, he had a duty to his master's house and approached the three strangers. When they saw him coming, they halted, and Yagu bowed first as he was initiating the conversation, common courtesy until rank was established. Greetings, honoured priests. It is... Yagu the gardener who presumes to interrupt your journey. Pug and Dominic bowed. Meacham waited to the rear, ignored, as was the custom. Pug said, Greetings, Yagu. For two humble priests of Hantukama, your presence is no interruption. Are you well? Yagu said, Yes, I am well. Finishing off the formal greeting of strangers. Then he took on a lofty stance, crossing his arms and sticking his chest out. 
What brings the priests of Hantukama to the house of my master? Pug said, We travel from Saran to the city of the plains. As we passed by, we saw this estate and hoped to beg a meal for poor missionaries. Is this possible? Pug knew it was not Yagu's prerogative to say, but he let the scrawny gardener play out the role of deciding. The gardener stroked his chin for a moment. It is permitted for you to beg, though I cannot say if you will be turned away or fed. Come, I will show you the kitchen. As they walked towards the house, Pug said, May I inquire who lives in this wondrous abode? Showing pride in the reflected glory of his master, Yagu said, This is the house of Netoa, called He Who Rises Quickly. Pug feigned ignorance, though he was pleased to know his former servant was still in possession of the estate. Perhaps, said Pug, it would not be too offensive for humble priests to pay respects to so august a personage. Yagu frowned. His master was a busy man, but he also made time for such as these. He would not be pleased to find the gardener had presumed to fend them off, though they were little more than beggars, not being from a powerful sect, such as the servants of Chochacan or Duran. I will ask. It may be my master will have a moment for you. If not, then perhaps a meal may be had. The gardener led them to a door Pug knew led into the kitchen area. The afternoon sun beat down upon them as the gardener disappeared inside. The house was a strange design of interconnecting buildings Pug had built nearly two years before. It had started something of a revolution in Surani architecture, but Pug doubted the trend had continued, given the Surani sensitivity to political fortune. The door slid open and a woman stepped out, followed by Yagu. Pug bowed before she could get a look at his face. It was Almarella, a former slave Pug had freed, now wed to Netoa. She had been Katala's closest friend. Yagu said, My mistress graciously agrees to speak with the priests of Hantukama. From his bowing position, Pug said, Are you well, mistress? Hearing his voice, Almarella gripped the doorframe as she fought for breath. When Pug straightened, she forced herself to breathe and said, I am well. Her eyes widened, and she began to speak his Surani name. Pug shook his head. I have met your honoured husband. I hoped he might spare a moment for an old acquaintance. Almost inaudibly, Almarella said, My husband... Always has time for old friends. She bade them enter and closed the door behind. Yagu stood outside a moment, perplexed at his mistress's behaviour. But as the door slid shut, he shrugged and returned to his beloved plants. Who could understand the rich? Almarella led them quickly and silently through the kitchen. She struggled to maintain her composure, barely concealing her shaking hands as she brushed past three startled slaves. They never noticed their mistress's agitated state, for their eyes were riveted on Meacham, the biggest barbarian slave they had ever seen, truly a giant among giants. Reaching Pug's former workroom, she slid aside the door and whispered, I will get my husband. They entered and sat. Meacham awkwardly upon plump cushions on the floor. Pug looked about the room and saw that little had changed. He felt a strange sense of being in two places at the same time, but he could almost imagine opening the door to find Katala and William outside in the garden. But he wore the saffron-coloured robe of a priest of Hantukama, not the black of a great one, and a terrible peril was possibly about to descend upon the two worlds with which his fate seemed forever intertwined. Since beginning the search for a return to Kelawan, a faint nagging had started at the back of Pug's mind. He sensed that his unconscious mind was operating as it often did, working on a problem while his attention was elsewhere. 
Something about all that had occurred on Midkemia had a faintly familiar quality to it, and he knew the time was soon coming when he would intuit what that quality was. The door slid open and a man entered, Almarella behind. She closed the door while the man bowed low. You honour my home, great one. Honours to your house, Netoa. Are you well? I am well, great one. How may I serve? Sit and tell me of the empire. Without hesitation, Netoa sat. Does Ichindar still rule the holy city? The light of heaven still rules the empire. What of the warlord? Almecho, he you knew as warlord, acted with honour and took his own life after you shamed him at the imperial games. His nephew, Aksantuka, wears the white and gold. He is of the Oaxatukan family, one who gained by the death of others when... the peace was betrayed. All with stronger claims were killed, and many with claims as valid as his to the office of warlord were... dealt with. The war party is still firmly in control of the High Council. Pug considered. With the war party still in control of the nations, there would be scant chance of finding sympathetic ears in the High Council, though the game of the Council would continue. That terrible, seemingly never-ending struggle for power might provide the opportunity for discovering alliance. What of the Assembly? I sent those things which you instructed, Great One. The others were burned as you commanded. I received only a note of thanks from the Great One, Hotcho Pepper, nothing more. What is the talk in the market? I have not heard your name mentioned in many months, but just after you departed, it was said you attempted to lure the light of heaven into a trap, bringing dishonour on yourself. You have been named outlaw and outcast by the assembly the first to have the black robe stripped away. Your words are no longer as law. Any who aid you do so at peril of their lives and the lives of their families and the lives of their clan. Pug rose. We shall not tarry here, old friend. I would not risk your lives nor the lives of your clan. Natoa spoke as he moved to the open door. I know you better than most. You would not do what they accused you of, Great One. <laughs> Great One no longer, by the edict of the Assembly. Then I honour the man, Milimba, he said, using Pug's Shurani name. You have given us much. The name Netoa of the Chinchimecha is upon the rolls of the Hunzan clan. My sons will grow in greatness because of your generosity. Sons? Almarella patted her stomach. Next planting season, the Hila priests think twins. Katala will be doubly pleased. First, to know the sister of her heart is well, and second, that you will be a mother. Almarella's eyes brimmed with moisture. Katala is well? And the boy? My wife and son are well, and send you their love. Return with our greetings and affection, Milimba. I have prayed that some day we may meet again. Perhaps we shall. Not soon, but some day. Netoa, is the pattern intact? It is, Milamba. Little has changed. This is still your home. Pug rose and motioned for the others to follow him. I may have need of it for a quick return to my own lands. If I sound the arrival gong twice, have everyone quit the house at once, for there may be others behind me who will harm you. I hope it will not be so. Your will, Milimba. They walked out of the room and made for the pattern room. Pug said, In the glade by the pool is the means for my return home. I would it remained undisturbed until I close it. It is done. I will instruct the groundskeepers to allow no one in the glade. At the door, Almarella said, Where are you bound, Milimba? That I will not tell you, for what you do not know cannot be forced from you. You are already in jeopardy for simply having me under your roof. I will add no more. 
Without further word, he led Dominic and Meacham into the pattern room and closed the door behind. Removing a scroll from his belt pouch, Pug placed it on the centre of a large tile pattern, a depiction of three dolphins. It was sealed with black wax, embossed with a large chop from the ring of the Great One. I send a message to a friend. With this symbol upon it, no one will dare touch it but him to whom it is addressed. He closed his eyes for a moment, then suddenly the scroll wasn't there. Pug motioned Dominic and Meacham to stand next to him on the pattern. Every great one in the Empire has a pattern in his home. Each is unique, and when it is remembered exactly, a magician can transport himself or send an object to it. In a few cases, a location that's very familiar, such as the kitchen at Criddy where I worked as a boy, might serve as well as a pattern. It is usual to will a gong to sound announcing our arrival, though I shall avoid that this time, I think. Come. He reached out and gripped each of them, closed his eyes and incanted. There seemed to be a sudden blur and the room appeared to change about them. Dominic said, What? Then realised they had transported to another place. He looked down at a different pattern, resembling an ornamental flower of red and yellow. Pug said, The one who lives here is brother to one of my old teachers for whom the pattern was in place. That great one called here often. I hope we may still find friends here. Pug went to the door and slid it slightly ajar. He peered up and down the corridor. Dominic stepped up behind him. How far did we travel? Eight hundred miles and more. Amazing. Dominic said softly. Pug led them swiftly to another room, where the afternoon sunlight could be seen coming through a window, casting the shadow of the room's lone occupant upon the door. Without announcing himself, Pug slid it open. Before a writing desk sat an old man, his once powerful body shrunken by age. He squinted at the parchment before him, and his lips moved silently as he read. His robe was a deep blue, Simple but finely made. Pug was shocked, for he remembered this man as a tower despite his advancing years. The last year had taken a toll. The man looked up at the intruders. His eyes grew large as he said, Milamba! Pug motioned his companions through the door and slid it behind. Honours to your house, Lord of the Shinzawai. Komatsu, lord of the Shinzawai, did not rise in greeting. He stared at the former slave who had risen to the rank of Great One and said, You are under edict, branded traitor and without honour. Your life is forfeit should you be found. His tone was cold, his expression hostile. Pug was taken aback. Of all his allies in the plot to end the Rift War, Komatsu had been among the staunchest. Kasumi, his son, had carried the Emperor's message of peace to King Roderick. Have I caused your offence, Komatsu? Pug asked. I had a son among those lost when you attempted to entrap the light of heaven with your deceit. Your son still lives, Komatsu. He honours his father and sends affection. Pug handed Komatsu the message from Kasumi. The old man peered at it for a long time, reading every character slowly. When he had finished, tears ran unashamedly down his leathery cheeks. Can all this be true? he said. It is true. My king had nothing to do with the deception at the truce table, nor had I a hand in it. That mystery is long in explaining, but first hear of your son. He not only is alive, but is now counted highly in my nation. Our king sought no vengeance upon our former enemies. He granted freedom to all who would serve him. Kasumi and the others are free men in his army. All? said Kamatsu, incredulously. Four thousand men of Kelawan are now soldiers of my king's army. They are counted among the most loyal of his subjects. They bring honour to their families. 
When King Liam's life was in danger, the task of guaranteeing his safety was given to your son and his men. Pride shone in Komatsu's eyes. The Surani live in a city called Lamut and fight well against the enemies of our nation. Your son is named Earl of that city, as important a rank as Lord of a family, closer to Clan War Chief. He is married to Megan, the daughter of a powerful merchant of Rilanan, and some day you will be a grandfather. The old man seemed to gain in strength. He said, Tell me of his life. Pug and Komatsu began to speak of Kasumi, his life for the last year and his rise, his meeting Megan just before Liam's coronation, and their rapid courtship and marriage. For nearly a half hour they spoke the urgency of Pug's mission forgotten for the moment. When they were done, Pug said, And Hokanu? Kasumi asked after his brother, My younger son is well. He patrols the northern frontier against the Thun raiders. Then the Shinzawai rise to greatness on two worlds, said Pug. Alone among Tsurani families can the Shinzawai make that claim. Komatsu said, that is a strange thing to contemplate. His voice turned serious. What has caused your return, Milimba? It is not only to ease an old man's loss, I am certain. Pug introduced his companions and then said, A dark power rises up against my nation, Komatsu. We have faced only a part of its might, and we seek to understand its nature. Komatsu said, What has this to do with your return here? What cause have you to return? In a vision, one of our seers confronted this dark agency and was addressed in the ancient temple language. He spoke of Mamandimus and the dark power behind the Moradel. How can this be? Well, that is what has caused me to risk a return. I hope to find an answer in the library of the assembly. Komatsu shook his head. You risk much. There is a certain tension within the High Council beyond what is usual for the great game. I suspect we are on the verge of some major upheaval, as this new warlord seems even more obsessed with controlling the nations than was his uncle. Understanding at once the Surani subtlety, Pug asked, Do you speak of a final schism between warlord and emperor? With a heavy sigh, the old man nodded. I fear civil war. Should Ichindar press forward with the certainty he showed to end the rift war, Aksantuka would be blown away as chaff upon the wind for the majority of the clans and families still hold the emperor as supreme, and few trust this new warlord. But the emperor has lost much face. For him to have forced the five great clans to the peace table, only to be betrayed, has robbed him of his moral authority. Aksantuka is free to act without opposition. I think this warlord seeks to unite the two offices. The gold trim on white is not enough for this one. I think he seeks to wear the gold of the light of heaven. In the game of the council, anything is possible, quoted Pug. But look you, all were betrayed at the peace talks. He spoke of the last message of Macross the Black, reminding Komatsu of the ancient teachings of the enemy's attacks upon the nation and speaking of Macross's fear that the rift would draw that terrible power. Such duplicity shows that the Emperor was no more a fool than the rest, but it still does not forgive him the mistake. Yet such a tale may win him a little more support in the High Council, <laughs> if support has any meaning. You think the Warlord ready to act? Any time now. He has neutralized the assembly by having his own pet magicians call its own autonomy into question. Great ones sit in debate over their own fate. Hotchopepper and my brother Fumita 
dare not take a hand in the great game at this time. Politically, the Assembly might as well not exist. Then seek allies in the High Council. Tell them this. Somehow our two worlds stand linked again by some dark power of Tsurani origin. It moves against the kingdom. It is power beyond human understanding, perhaps power to challenge the gods themselves. I cannot tell you how I know, but I feel certain that, should the kingdom fall, then will Midkemia fall. Should Midkemia fall, then surely will Kelowan fall after. Kamatsu, Lord of the Shinzawai, former war chief of the Kanazawai clan, showed an expression of concern. Softly, he said, Can it be? Pug's expression showed he believed it true. It may be I will be captured or killed. If so, I must have allies on the High Council who will speak this cause to the light of heaven. It is not my life I fear for, Kamatsu, but the lives of two worlds. If I fail, the Great Ones Hochopepa or Shimon must return to my world with whatever can be learned of this dark power. Will you help? Kamatsu rose. Of course. Even had you not brought word of Kasumi, even had our doubts about you been true, only a madman would be unwilling to put aside former grievances in light of such warning. I will leave at once by fast boat down river to the holy city. Where will you be? Seeking help from another. If I am successful, I shall plead my case before the assembly. No one gains the black robe without having learned to listen before acting. No, my true risk is falling into the warlord's hands. If you do not hear of me in three days, assume that has come to pass. I will be either dead or captive. Then you must take action. Only silence will aid this Mamandamus. In this you must not fail. I will not fail, Milimba. Pug, once known as Milimba, greatest of the great ones of Suranuani, rose and bowed. We must leave. Honours to your house, Lord of the Shinzawai. Komatsu bowed lower than was required of his station and said, Honours to your house, great one. Hawkers shouted to passing buyers as the sun beat down. The market square at Ontoset was a throng with business. Pug and his companions had taken a place in the section of the plaza set aside for licensed beggars and priests. For three mornings they rose from under the protective wall of the square and spent the day preaching to those willing to stop and listen. Meacham would pass among the small crowds, holding out the beggar's bowl. There was only one temple of Hantukama, east of the holy city of Kentusani, in the city of Yankora, far from Ontoset, so there was little risk of them being discovered by another wandering priest in the short time they would be staying in the city. The order was widely and thinly spread, and many who served had not seen another priest of the order for years. Pug finished his sermon for the morning and returned to Dominic's side as the monk instructed an injured girl's mother in proper care for the child. Her broken leg would be fully mended within days. The woman's grateful thanks were all she could give, but Dominic's smile indicated that was sufficient. Meacham joined them, showing several of the tiny gemstones and slivers of metal that served as currency in the Empire. A man could make a decent living this way, Pug said. You scared them into giving. A companion in the crowd made them all look as a company of horsemen rode past. They wore the green armour of a house known to Pug by reputation, the Hoxaka. They were members of the war party. Meacham said, They've taken to riding for certain. Like the Surani in Lamut, Pug whispered back. It seems once a Surani gets over being terrified of horses, he becomes mad for them. I know Kasumi did. Once upon a horse, it was near impossible to get him off. It appeared the horse had become accepted in the Empire and cavalry firmly established in the arsenal of Surani weapons. When the horses had passed, another noise made them turn. 
Standing before them was a heavy-set man in black robes, his bald head gleaming in the noonday sun. On every side, citizens were bowing and moving away, not wishing to crowd the august presence of a great one of the empire. Pug and his companions bowed. The magician said, "You three will come with me." Pug made a show of stammering. "Your will, great one." They hurried to follow after. The black-robed magician walked directly to the nearest building, a leather workers' establishment. The magician entered and said to the proprietor, "I have need of this building. You may return in an hour." Without hesitation, the owner said, "Your will, great one," and called for his apprentices to join him outside. In a minute, the building was empty except for Pug and his friends. Pug and Hotcha Pepper embraced. Then the stout magician said. Milimba, you are mad to return. When I received your message, I could scarcely believe my senses. Why did you risk sending it through the pattern, and why this meeting in the heart of the city? Pug said, "Meacham, watch the window." To Hotcha Pepper, he said, "What better place to hide than in plain sight? You receive messages by the pattern often, and who would think of questioning you about speaking to common priests?" He turned and said, "These are my companions," and made the introductions. Hotcha Pepper swept clear a bench and sat. "I have a thousand questions. How did you manage to return? The magicians who serve the warlord have been trying to relocate your homeworld. For the light of heaven, may the gods protect him, is determined to avenge the betrayal of the peace conference. And how did you manage to destroy the first rift and live?" He saw Pug's amusement at his flood of questions and ended. But most important, why have you returned? Pug said, "There is loose upon my homeworld some dark power of Surani origin, an evil thing of dark magic. I seek knowledge, for it is of Kelawan." Hotcha Pepper looked questioningly at him. Many strange things occur on my world. And it is the most elegant answer, Hotcho. I hope to discover some clue to the nature of this dark power, and it is a fearful agency. He went into detail about what had occurred since the first, from explaining the reason for the betrayal to the attempts on Prince Arthur to his own interpretation of Rogan's seeing. Hotcho Pepper said, "This is strange, for we know of no such power upon Kelawan, at least." None I have heard about. One advantage to our organization is that two thousand years of cooperative effort by the Black Robes has rid this world of a great many such menaces. In our law, we know of demon lords and witch kings, spirits of dark powers and things of evil, all of whom fell before the combined might of the assembly. From the window, Meacham said, "Seems you might have missed one." Hotcha Pepper appeared taken aback at being addressed by a commoner. Then he chuckled, "Perhaps, or perhaps there is another explanation. I do not know." But he said to Pug, "You have always been a force for social good within the empire, and I have no doubt that all you have said is truth." I will act as your agent, seeking safe passage to the library, and I will aid in your research. But understand, the assembly is hamstrung by internal politics. The vote to let you live is by no means a certainty. I shall have to return and lobby. It may take days before I can openly voice the question. But I think I can succeed at this. You raise too many questions to ignore. I will convene a meeting as soon as possible and return for you once I have pleaded your case. Only a madman would fail to heed your warning, even should it prove to be something not of this world that plagues your land. At worst, you gain a parole to use the library and depart. At best, perhaps a reinstatement. You will have to justify your past actions. I can and will, Hotcho. 
Hot Chip Pepper left the bench and stood before his old friend. It may be we can yet have peace between our nations, Millenberg. Should the old wound somehow be healed, we could benefit both worlds. I, for one, would love to visit this academy you build and meet this seer who predicts the future and this child who speaks with the mind. I have many things I would share, Hotcho. The making of controllable rifts is but a tenth part of it. But all that later. Go now. Pug began to guide Hotcha Pepper to the door, but something in Meacham's pose caught his eye. It was too stiff and awkward. Dominic had been closely following the magician's conversation and had not seemed to notice any change in the Franklin. Pug studied Meacham a second, then shouted, A spell! Pug moved towards the window and touched Meacham. The tall man was unable to move. Past him, Pug could see men running towards the building. Before Pug could react and encant a spell of protection, the door exploded inwards with a thunderous sound, knocking everyone inside to the floor and stunning them momentarily. Senses reeling, Pug tried to regain his feet, but his ears rang from the sound and his vision blurred. As he staggered upright, an object was hurled in through the door. It was a ball-like object the size of a man's fist. Pug again tried to establish a spell of protection around the room, but the sphere emitted a blinding orange light. Pug's eyes felt seared, and he closed them, breaking the pattern of his spell. He began again, but the object made a high-pitched whine, which seemed somehow to drain away his strength. He heard someone hit the floor, and couldn't tell if Hotcha Pepper or Dominic had tried to rise and failed, or if Meacham had toppled. Pug fought against the magic of the sphere with all his considerable might, but he was off balance and confused. He staggered to the door, trying to get away from the object. For once, free of its debilitating effects, he could easily save his friends, but its own spell was too quick and strong. At the threshold of the shop, he collapsed. He fell to his knees, blinking against the double vision the sphere or explosion had inflicted upon him. He could make out men approaching the building from across the plaza. They wore the armour of the Warlord's Imperial Whites, his personal honour guard. Sinking downwards into darkness, Pug could see that the one who led them wore a black robe. Pug could hear the magician's voice as if coming from a vast distance through the ringing in his ears, saying, Bind them! Chapter 16. Moralin. Mist blew through the canyon. Aratha signalled a halt. Jimmy peered downwards through the blowing moisture. A waterfall thundered beside the trail that was their route towards Moralin. Now they were properly in the great northern mountains, in that area between the elven forests and the northlands. Moralin lay higher in the mountains, in a rocky, barren place just below the crest. They waited while Martin scouted the pass ahead. Since leaving their elven guides, they had become a military mission in enemy-held lands. They could trust Aratha's talisman to hide them from Mamandamus's scrying magic, but that he knew they would soon come to Moralin was beyond question. It was never to be a question of if they would encounter his minions, but simply when. Martin returned, signalling that the way ahead was clear. Then he put up his hand for a halt again. He dashed past the others, heading back down the trail. As he passed Baru and Roald, he motioned for them to follow. They jumped down from their mounts, and Laurie and Jimmy took the reins. Aratha looked back, wondering what Martin had seen, while Jimmy kept eyes ahead. Martin and the others returned, another figure walking easily with them. Aratha relaxed when he saw it was the elf Gallane. The oppressive nature of their journey was such that when they spoke it was in hushed tones, lest echoes in the hills betray them. Aratha greeted the elf. We thought you not coming. Gallane replied, The war leader sent me after you with this intelligence but a few hours after you departed. 
After he was found, the Gwali Apala said two things of importance. First, a beast of some ferocious nature, unclear from the Gwali's description, inhabits the area near the lake. Tomas pleads caution. Second, there is another entrance to Morelin. He felt it of sufficient import to dispatch me after. Gawain smiled. Besides, I thought it might also prove useful to see if you were being followed. Were we? Gawain nodded. Two Monadel scouts cut your trail less than a mile north of our forests. They were marking your way, and one surely would have run ahead to warn when you got close to Morelin. I would have joined you earlier, but I needed to be certain neither could escape to give warning. Now there is no such risk. Martin nodded, knowing the elf would have killed them both suddenly and without chance for alarm. There are no signs of others. Martin asked, Do you return? Tomas gave me discretion. It is not of much use to go back at this point. I may as well travel with you. I may not pass over the tracks of the hopeless, but until that portal is reached, another bow may prove useful. Welcome, said Aretha. Martin mounted, and without words, Galen ran on ahead to scout the way. They moved swiftly upwards, the falls chilling them despite the early summer warmth. At these heights, hail and occasionally snow were not uncommon, except in the hottest months of summer, still weeks away. The nights had been damp, though not as bitter as had been feared, for they made cold camp. The elves had given them trail rations, dried meat and hard cakes of nut flour and dried fruit, nourishing but cheerless fare. The trail led along the face of the cliffs until it came out in a high meadow overlooking the valley. A silver, sparkling lake lapped its shores gently in the late afternoon light, the only sound being the singing of birds and the rustling of the wind in the trees. Jimmy looked about. How can... How can the day be so nice when we move towards nothing but trouble? Rold said, One thing about soldiering. If you're going to risk dying, there's no sense doing it wet, cold and hungry, unless absolutely necessary. Enjoy the sunshine, lad. It's a gift. They watered their horses. After a welcome rest, they continued onwards. The path Carlin had spoken about, north of the lake, was easily found but steep and difficult to negotiate. As sunset approached, Galen returned with news of a promising cave in which they might safely build a small fire. It is curved twice, and the air moves upwards through fissures that will carry smoke away. Martin, if we leave now, we might have time to hunt game near the lake's edge. Aretha said, Don't be overly long in the hunt. Signal your approach with that raven's honk you do so well, or you'll be greeted by some sword points. Martin nodded once, giving the reins of his horse to Jimmy. He said, Two hours after sunset at the latest. And he and Gawain were heading back down the trail towards the lake. Rold and Baru took point, and, after a five-minute ride, found the cave Gawain had mentioned. It was flat, wide, and free of other occupants. Jimmy explored back and found it narrow after a hundred feet, so that unexpected visitors would have to come through the mouth. Laurie and Baru gathered wood, and the first fire in days was built, though it was a small one. Jimmy and Aretha settled in with the others, waiting for Martin and Gawain. Martin and Gawain lay in wait. They had constructed a natural-looking blind using brush gathered from other parts of the woods. They were certain they could observe any animal coming down to the lake's edge without being seen. They had lain downwind from the lake, neither speaking for half an hour, when the sound of hooves upon the rocks sounded from below the cliff. Both knocked arrows, but otherwise remained silent. Into the meadow from the trail below rode a dozen horsemen dressed in black. Each wore the strange dragon helm seen at Sarth, and their heads moved constantly as if they looked for something or someone. Then, behind them, came Murad, his cheek still showing the additional cut Aretha had given him on the road to Sarth. 
The black slayers reined in and watered their mounts, staying in the saddle. Murad seemed relaxed but alert. For a silent ten minutes they let the horses drink. When they were finished watering their horses, they moved out, turning up the trail after Aratha's band. When they were out of sight, Martin said, They must have come in between Yarbon and Stone Mountain to have avoided your forests. Tathar is correct in his assumption that they will move to Morrilin to wait for us. Gelaine said, Few things in life disturb me, Martin, but those black slayers are one. You're just now coming to that conclusion? You humans are given to overreaction upon occasion. Gelaine looked to where the riders had gone. Martin said, They will overtake Arthur and the others shortly. If this Murad can track, then they will find the cave. Gelaine stood. Let us hope the Hadati knows his trailcraft. If not, at least we will be attacking from the rear. Martin smiled a grim smile. That will certainly be of comfort to those in the cave. Thirteen against five, and only one way in or out. Without further comment, they shouldered their bows and began to lope up the trail behind the Moradel. Riders come said Baru. Jimmy was instantly covering the fire with dirt, carried in against the need. That way the fire would die quickly without smoke. Then Laurie touched Jimmy on the arm and motioned that he should come to the rear of the cave to help quiet the horses. Rold, Baru and Aratha moved forward to where they could, they hoped, see out of the cave mouth without being seen. The evening looked murky dark after the bright fire, but soon their eyes adjusted and they could see the riders passing by the cave. The rearmost pulled up a moment before the others answered some silent command and halted. He looked about, as if sensing something nearby. Aratha fingered his talisman, hoping the Moradel was simply cautious and not feeling his presence. A cloud passed from before the little moon, the only one up this early and the vista before the cave became slightly more illuminated. Baru stiffened at sight of Murad, for the hillman could now clearly see the Moradel. He had begun to draw his sword when Aratha's hand gripped his wrist. The prince hissed in the hillman's ear, Not yet! Baru's body trembled as he struggled against his desire to avenge his family's death and complete his blood quest. He burned to attack the Moradel without regard for his own safety, but there were his companions to consider. Then Rold gripped the back of the Hadati's neck and put his cheek against Baru's so he could speak into his ear almost without sound. If the Twelve in Black cuts you down before you reach Murad, what honour do you do to your village's memory? Baru's sword slipped noiselessly back into its sheath. Silently, they watched as Murad surveyed the surroundings. His eyes fell on the mouth of the cave. He peered at the entrance and, for a moment, Aratha could feel the scar-faced Moradel's eyes upon him. Then they were moving again. Then they were gone. Aratha crept forward until he hung out of the cave, watching for signs the riders were returning. Suddenly, a voice behind said, I thought a cave bear might have run you all out of there. Aratha spun, his heart racing and his sword coming out of its scabbard, to find Martin and Gelaine standing behind. He put up his weapon and said, I could have run you through. The others appeared and Gelaine said, They should have investigated, but they seem determined to be somewhere in a hurry, so we might do well to follow. I'll keep them under watch and mark the trail. Aratha said, What if another band of dark brothers comes along? Won't they find your trail markings? Only Martin will recognise my trail markings. No mountain Moradel can track like an elf. He shouldered his bow and began to run after the riders. As he vanished into the night's gloom, Laurie said, What if the dark brothers are forest dwellers? Gelaine's voice came back out of the dark. I'll have almost as much to worry about as you will. After Gelaine was out of earshot, Martin said, 
I wish he were only joking. Gillane ran back down the trail, motioning towards a stand of trees off to the left of the road. They hurried to the trees and dismounted. They led the mounts down into a drawer as deep into the woods as possible. Gillane whispered, A patrol comes. He, Martin and Aratha hurried back to the edge of the trees where they could spy anyone on the trail. A few minutes passed with agonising slowness. Then a dozen riders came down the mountain road, a mixed band of Moradel and men. The Moradel were wearing cloaks and were clearly forest dwellers from the south. They rode past without pause, and when they were out of sight, Martin said, Renegades now flock to Mamandamus's banner. He almost spat as he said, There are few I'd gladly kill. But humans who would serve the Moradel for gold are among them. As they returned to the others, Gillane said to Aratha, There is a camp athwart the road a mile above here. They are clever, for it is a difficult passage around the camp, and we would need to leave your horses here. It is that, or ride through the camp. How far to the lake is it? asked the prince. Only a few miles, but once past the camp... We rise above the tree line, and there is little cover, save down among the rocks. It will be a slow passage, and better done at night. There are bound to be scouts around, and many guards on the road to the bridge. What about the second entrance the Gwali told of? If we understood rightly, by descending down into the tracks of the hopeless, you'll find a cave or fissure that will lead through the rock up to the surface of the plateau near the lake. Aratha considered. Let us leave our mounts here. Lorry said with a faint smile, Might as well tether the horses to the trees. If we die, we won't need them. Rold said, My old captain used to get downright short with soldiers who harped on death before a battle. Enough, said Aratha. He took a step away, then turned. I've been worrying this over and over. I've come this far, and I'll continue, but... You may leave now if you wish, and I'll not object. He looked at Laurie and Jimmy, then Baru and Rold. He was answered by silence. Aratha looked from face to face, then nodded brusquely. Very well. Tie up the horses and lighten your packs. We walk. The Moradel watched the trail below, well lit by large and middle moons as little moon rose. He perched atop an outcropping of rock, nestled behind a boulder. He was positioned so he would be unobserved by any coming up the trail. Martin and Gillane took aim at the Moradel's back as Jimmy slipped behind the rocks. They would try to win past without being seen, but if the Moradel twitched in the wrong direction, Martin and Gillane meant to see him dead before he could speak. Jimmy had gone first as he was judged the least likely to make noise. Next came Baru, and the hillman moved through the rocks with the practised ease of one mountain-born. Lorry and Rold moved very slowly, and Martin wondered if he could hold his target for the week it was taking them to pass. Then, at last, Aratha slipped past, the light breeze making enough noise to disguise the faint scuff of boot upon rock as he stepped down into a shallow depression. He scampered along until he joined with the others out of sight of the sentry. Within seconds, Martin, then Gillane, followed, and the elf went past to take point again. Baru signalled he would go after, and Aratha motioned agreement. In a moment, Lorry and Rold followed. Just before he turned to follow, Jimmy put his face before Martin and Aratha's and whispered, When we get back... The first thing I'm going to do is scream my bloody head off. With a playful swat, Martin sent him along. Aratha looked at Martin and silently mouthed the words, Me too. Then the prince was going down the wash. Martin took a last backwards glance, then followed. Silently they lay in a depression near the road, a small ridge of rock hiding them from the passing Moradel horsemen. Reluctant even to breathe, they remained motionless as the riders seemed to pause in their slow passage. For a long, torturous moment, Aratha and his companions feared discovery. 
Just as every nerve seemed to scream for action, as every muscle demanded motion, the riders continued along their patrol. With a sigh of relief close to a sob, Aratha rolled over and discovered the trail empty. With a nod to Gallane, Aratha ordered a resumption of the trek. The elf was off along the defile, and the others slowly rose and followed. The night wind blew bitter along the face of the mountains. Aratha sat back against the rocks, looking where Martin pointed. Gallane hugged the opposite wall of the crevice they crouched in. They had taken a rise over a crest to the east of the trail, seeming to take them away from their destination, but a necessary detour to avoid increasing Moradel activity. Now they looked down upon a broad canyon, in the middle of which a high plateau rose upwards. In the centre of the plateau a small lake could be seen. To their left they could see the trail returning as it ran past the edge of the canyon, then disappeared over the crest of the mountains farther up, clearly shown in the light of all three moons. Where the trail came closest to the edge of the canyon, twin towers of stone had been erected. Another pair stood opposite on the plateau. Behind them, a narrow suspension bridge swayed in the wind. On top of all four towers, torches burned, their flames dancing madly in the wind. Movement along the bridge and atop the towers told them the entire area around the plateau was heavily guarded. Aratha leant back against the rocks. Morelin. Gallane said, Indeed. It appears they feared you might bring an army with you. Martin said, It was a thought. Aratha said, You were right about its comparing to the road to Sarth. This would have been almost as bad. We'd have lost a thousand men reaching this point, if we could have got this far. Across the bridge, single file, it would have been mass slaughter. Martin asked, Can you see that black shape across the lake? A building of some sort, said Gallane. He looked perplexed. It is unusual to see a building, that building, any building, though the Valheru were capable of anything. This is a place of power. That must be a Valheru building, though I've never heard of its like before. Where shall I find Silverthorn? asked Aratha. Gallane said, Most of the stories say it needs water, so it grows on the edge of the lake. Nothing more specific. Martin said, Now, as to gaining entrance... Gallane signalled them away from the front of the crevice, and they returned to where the others waited. The elf knelt and drew in the ground. We are here, with the bridge here. Somewhere down at the base is a small cave or large fissure, large enough for a gwali to run through, so I guess it would be big enough for you to crawl through. It might be a chimney in the rock you can climb up, or it might be connecting caves but Apala was emphatic that he and his people had spent some time on that plateau. They didn't stay long because of the bad thing, but he remembered enough to convince Tomas and Carlin he wasn't confused about being here. I've spotted a broken facing on the other side of the canyon, so we'll work along past the bridge entrance until we have that black building between myself and the bridge guards. You'll find what appears to be the start of a way down there. Even if you can only get a short way down, you can lower yourself with ropes. Then I'll pull them up and hide them. Jimmy said, oh, That'll be really handy when we want to climb back up. Gallane said, At sundown tomorrow, I'll lower the ropes again. I'll leave them down until just before sunrise. Then I'll pull them up again. I'll lower them again the next night. I think I can stay hidden in the crack in the broken facing. I may have to scamper into the brush but I'll stay free of any Moradel who are looking about. He didn't sound too convinced. If you need the rope sooner than that, he added with a smile, simply shout. Martin looked at Aratha. As long as they don't know we're here, we have a chance. They still look to the south, thinking us somewhere between Elvendar and here. As long as we don't give ourselves away. Aratha said, it's as good a plan as I can come up with. Let's go. Quickly, 
for they needed to be down in the canyon before sunrise, they moved along the rocks, seeking to reach the far side of the canyon rim. Jimmy hugged the face of the plateau, hiding in the shadow below the bridge. The rim of the canyon was some hundred and fifty feet above them, but there was still a chance of being seen. A narrow black crack in the face of the plateau presented itself. Jimmy turned his head to Lorry and whispered, Of course, it has to be right under the bridge. Let's just hope they don't bother to look down. Word was passed back and Jimmy entered the fissure. It was a tight squeeze for only ten feet, then opened into a cave. Turning back towards the others, he said, Pass a torch and flint through. As he took them, he heard a movement behind him. He hissed a warning and spun, his dirk almost flying into his hand. The faint light coming from behind was more a hindrance than a help, for it caused most of the cave to be inky black to his eyes. Jimmy closed his eyes, relying on his other senses. He backed up and towards the crack, saying a silent prayer to the god of thieves. From ahead, he heard a scrabbling sound, like claws on rock, and heard a slow, heavy breathing. Then he remembered the Gwali talking of a bad thing that ate one of his tribe. Again came the noise, this time much closer, and Jimmy wished fervently for a light. He moved to the right as he heard Lorry speak his name in a questioning tone. The boy hissed, There's some kind of animal in here! Jimmy could hear Lorry say something to the others and the scramble as the singer moved back, away from the cave entrance. Faintly, he could hear someone, perhaps rolled, saying, Martin's coming! Holding on to the knife with fierce intensity, Jimmy thought to himself, Yes, if it comes to fighting animals, I'd send in Martin too. He expected the large Duke of Criddy to leap in beside him at any moment and wondered what was taking so long. Then there was sudden movement towards the boy and he leapt back and up instinctively, almost climbing a rock face. Something struck his lower leg and he could hear the snapping of jaws. Jimmy turned in mid-air and, using his native abilities, tucked and rolled with the fall, coming down on something that wasn't rock. Without hesitation, Jimmy lashed out with his dirk, feeling the point dig into something. He continued to roll off the back of the creature while a reptilian hiss and snarl filled the cave. The boy twisted as he came to his feet, pulling the dirk free. The creature spun, moving quickly, almost as quickly as Jimmy, who leapt away from the creature blindly and struck his head against a low-hanging outcropping of rock. Stunned, Jimmy fell hard against the wall as the creature launched itself again, again missing by only a little. Jimmy, half stunned, reached out with his left hand and found his arm wrapping around the thing's neck. Like the legendary man riding the tiger, Jimmy couldn't release his hold, for the creature could not reach him as long as he held fast. Jimmy sat, letting the animal drag him around the cave while he stabbed repeatedly at the leathery hide. With little leverage, his blows were mostly ineffective. The creature thrashed about, and Jimmy was battered against the rock walls and scraped as he was dragged about the cave. Jimmy felt panic rising up inside, for the animal seemed to be gaining in fury, and his arm felt as if it would be torn from his shoulder. Tears of fear ran down the boy's cheeks, and he hammered at the creature in terror. Martin! he half shouted, half gulped. Where was he? Jimmy felt with sudden certainty that he was at last at the end of his vaunted luck. For the first time he could remember, he felt helpless, for there was nothing he could do to extricate himself from this situation. He felt himself go sick to his stomach and numb all over and, with dread certainty, felt fear for his life. Not the exhilarating thrill of danger during a chase across the thieves' highway, but a horrible numbing sleepiness, as if he wished to curl up in a ball and end it all. The creature leapt about, banging Jimmy against the wall repeatedly, and suddenly was still. Jimmy continued to stab at it for a moment, then a voice said, It's dead. The still woozy thief opened his eyes and saw Martin standing over him. Baru and Rold stood behind, the mercenary with a lit torch. 
Next to the boy lay a lizard-like creature seven feet in length, looking like nothing as much as an iguana with a crocodile's jaws. Martin's hunting knife threw the back of its skull. Martin knelt before Jimmy. You all right? Jimmy scuttled away from the thing, still showing signs of panic. When it penetrated his fear-clouded senses that he was unhurt, the boy shook his head vigorously. No, I'm not all right. He wiped away the tear stains on his face and said, No, damn it all, I am not. Then, with tears again coming, he said, Damn it, I thought I... Aretha came through the fissure last and took stock of the boy's condition. He moved next to the boy, who leant tearfully against the rock wall. Gently placing his hand upon Jimmy's arm, he said, It's over. You're all right. His voice betraying a mixture of anger and fear, Jimmy said, I thought it had me. Damn, I've never been so scared in my life. Martin said, If you're going to be scared of something at long last, Jimmy, this beastie's a good choice. Look at the jaws on it. Jimmy shivered. Aretha said, We all get scared, Jimmy. You've just finally found something to be truly fearful of. Jimmy nodded. I hope it doesn't have a big brother about. Aretha said, Did you sustain any wounds? Jimmy took a quick inventory. Just bruises. Then he winced. A lot of bruises. Baru said, A rock serpent. Good-sized one. You did well killing it with that knife, Lord Martin. In the light, the creature looked respectable, but nothing near the horror Jimmy had imagined in the dark. That's the bad thing. Martin said, Most likely. As bad as it looked to you, imagine what it looks like to a three-foot-tall Gwali. He held up his torch as Laurie entered. Let's see what this place is like. They were in a narrow but high-ceiling chamber, mostly limestone from its look. The floor climbed slightly as it moved away from the fissure that led outside. Jimmy appeared ragged, but went to the fore, taking Martin's torch and saying, I'm still the expert at climbing into places I'm not welcome. They moved quickly through a series of chambers, each slightly larger and located higher up than the others. The connecting chambers had an odd appearance and strange feel to them, somehow disquieting. The plateau was large enough for them to move for some time without much sense of moving upwards, until Jimmy said, We move in a spiral. I'll swear we are now above the place where Martin killed that rock serpent. They continued their progress until they came to an apparent dead end. Looking about, Jimmy pointed upwards. Above their heads, by three feet, was an opening in the roof. A chimney, said Jimmy. You climb up by putting your back to one side and feet to the other. What if it widens too much? asked Laurie. Then it's usual to come back down. The rate of descent is up to you. I suggest you do it slowly. Martin said, oh, If the Gwali can get up there, we should be able. Rold said, Begging your grace's pardon. But do you think you could swing through the trees like them, too? Ignoring the remark, Martin said, Jimmy? Yep, yeah, I'll go first. I'm not in my days because one of you lost his grip and fell on me. Keep clear of the opening until I call down. With assistance from Martin, Jimmy easily made it into the chimney. It was a good fit, with just enough room to negotiate easily. The others especially Martin and Baru, would find it a tight fit, but they would squeeze through. Jimmy quickly made it to the top, about 35 feet from the chamber below, and found another cave. Without light, he couldn't tell its size, but faint echoes of his breathing told him it was a good size. He lowered himself down just far enough to call the come ahead, then scrambled up to the lip. By the time the first head, Rolls, popped into view, Jimmy had a torch lit. Quickly, they all climbed up the chimney. The cave was large, easily 200 feet across. The roof averaged a full 25 feet high. Stalagmites rose from the floor, 
some joining together with the stalactites above to form limestone pillars. The cave was a forest of stone. In the distance, several other caves and passages could be seen. Martin looked about. How high do you judge we've climbed, Jimmy? No more than seventy feet. Not yet halfway. Now which way? asked Aretha. Jimmy said, "Nothing for it except to try and one at a time." Picking one of the many exits, he marched towards it. After hours of searching, Jimmy turned to Laurie and said, "The surface." Word was passed, and Aretha squeezed up past the singer to look. Above the boy's head was a narrow passage, little more than a crack. Aretha could see light above, almost blinding after the faintly lit passages. With a nod, Jimmy climbed up until he blocked out the brilliance above. When he returned, he said, "It comes out in an outcropping of rocks. We're about a hundred yards from the bridge side of the black building. It's a big thing, two stories tall." And he guards. None I could see. Aretha considered, then said, "We'll wait until dark. Jimmy, can you hang close to the surface and listen?" There's a ledge," said the boy, and scrambled back upwards. Aretha sat, and the others did likewise, waiting for darkness to come. Jimmy tensed and relaxed muscles to avoid cramping. The top of the plateau was deathly silent, except for an occasional sound carried by the wind. Mostly, he heard a stray word or the sounds of boots coming from the direction of the bridge. Once, he thought he heard a strange low sound coming from the black building, but he couldn't be certain. The sun had dipped beneath the horizon, although the sky still glowed. It was certainly two hours after normal supper time, but this high on the face of the mountains, this close to midsummer, and this far north, the sun set long after it did in Crondor. Jimmy reminded himself that he had worked jobs before where he'd had to skip meals, but somehow that didn't stop his stomach from demanding attention. At last, it was dark enough. Jimmy, for one, was glad, and it seemed the others shared his feelings. Something about this place brought them to the edge of outright agitation. Even Martin had several times been heard muttering curses at the need to wait. No, there was something alien about this place, and it was a subtle sort of effect they were feeling. Jimmy knew he wouldn't feel secure again until this place was miles behind him and a dim memory. Jimmy climbed out and kept watch while Martin came next, followed by the others. By agreement, they split up into three groups: Baru with Laurie, Roald with Martin, and Jimmy with the Prince. They would scout the lake shore for the plant, and as soon as one found it, he would return to the crack in the rocks, waiting down below for his companions. Aretha and Jimmy were slated to move towards the big black building, and by agreement, had decided to begin their search behind the building. It seemed wise to check for guards before searching near the ancient Valheru edifice. It was impossible to know the Moradel attitude towards the place. They might hold it in similar awe to the elves and refuse to enter, give it wide berth until some ceremony, as if it were a shrine, or they might be inside the building in numbers. Slipping through the dark, Jimmy reached the edge of the building and hugged it. The stones felt unnaturally smooth. Jimmy ran his hand over them and discovered they were textured like marble. Aretha waited, weapons ready, while Jimmy did a quick circumnavigation of the building. No one in sight," he whispered, "except at the bridge towers. Inside," Aretha hissed. Jimmy said, "Don't know. It's a big place, but only one door. Want to look?" He hoped the prince would say no. Yes. Jimmy led Aretha down along the wall and around the corner until he came to the solitary door to the large building. Above it was a half-circle window with a faint light showing. Jimmy signalled for Aretha to give him a boost, and the young thief scampered up to the cornice above the door. He gripped it and pulled himself up to peek through the window. Jimmy peered about. Below him, behind the door, was an anteroom of some sort with a stone slab floor. Beyond, double doors opened into darkness. Jimmy noticed something strange about the wall below the window. The exterior stone was only facing. 
Jimmy jumped back down. There's nothing I can see from the window. Nothing. There's a passage into the darkness, that's all. No sign of any guards. Let's start looking around the lake's edge, but keep an eye on this building. Jimmy agreed, and they headed down towards the lake. The building was beginning to make his something odd bump itch, but he shoved aside any distraction and concentrated on the search. Hours were spent stalking the shore. Few water plants lined the lake's edge. The plateau was almost devoid of flora. In the distance, there would be an occasional faint rustling sound, which Aratha supposed came from one of the other pairs who searched. When the sky became grey, Jimmy alerted Aratha to the coming dawn. Giving up in disgust, the prince accompanied the boy thief back to the crevice. Laurie and Baru were already there, and Martin and Roll joined them a few minutes later. All reported no sight of Silverthorn. Aratha remained silent, turning slowly until his back was to the others. Then he clenched his fist, looking as if he had been struck a terrible blow. All eyes were on him as he stared away into the darkness of the cave, his profile etched in relief by the faint light from above, and all saw tears upon his cheeks. Suddenly he spun to confront his companions. Hoarsely he whispered, It must be here! He looked at each of them in turn, and they glimpsed something in his eyes. A depth of feeling, a sense of overwhelming loss that caused them to share his dread. All of them saw suffering and something dying. If there was no Silverthorn, Anita was lost. Martin shared his brother's pain and more, for in this instant he saw his father in those quiet moments before Aratha had been old enough to know the depths of Boric's loss of his Lady Catherine. The elven-taught hunter felt his own chest constrict at the thought of his brother reliving those lonely nights before the hearth, beside an empty chair with only a portrait over the fire to gaze upon. Of the three brothers, only Martin had glimpsed the profound bitterness that had haunted their father's every waking moment. If Anita died, Aratha's heart and joy might well die with her. Unwilling to surrender hope, Martin whispered, It will be here somewhere. Jimmy added, There is one place we haven't looked. Aratha said, Inside that building. Martin said, And then there's only one thing to do. Jimmy hated to hear himself say, one of us must get inside and take a look. Chapter 17 Warlord The cell stank of damp straw. Pug stirred and found his hands tethered to the wall with nidrahide chains. The skin of the stolid, six-legged Sirani beast of burden had been treated to almost the hardness of steel and was anchored firmly to the wall. Pug's head ached from the encounter with the strange, magic-disrupting device. But there was another irritation. He fought off his mental sluggishness and looked at the manacles. As he began to encant a spell that would cause the chains to change to insubstantial gases, a sudden wrongness occurred. He could put no other name to it but a wrongness. His spell would not work. Pug sat back against the wall, knowing the cell had been blanketed by some ensorcelment, neutralising any other magic. Of course, he thought. How else does one keep a magician in jail? Pug looked about the room. It was a dark pit of a cell with only a little light coming through a small barred opening high in the door. Something small and busy bustled through the straw near Pug's foot. He kicked and it scurried off. The walls were damp, so he judged that he and his companions were below ground. He had no way of telling how long they had been here, nor had he any idea where they were. They could be anywhere upon the world of Kelowan. Meacham and Dominic were chained to the wall opposite Pug, while to his right Hotchapepper was likewise bound. 
Pug knew at once that the Empire rested upon a fine balancing point for the warlord to risk bringing harm to Hotcha Pepper. To capture a denounced renegade was one thing, but to incarcerate a great one of the Empire was another. By rights, a great one should be immune from the dictates of the warlord. Besides the Emperor, a great one was the only possible challenge to the warlord's rule. Komatsu had been correct. The warlord was nearing some major ploy or offensive in the game of the council, for the imprisonment of Hotchapepper showed contempt for any possible opposition. Meacham groaned and slowly looked up. My head, he mumbled. Finding himself chained, he tugged experimentally at his bonds. Well, he said, looking at Pug, what now? Pug looked back and shook his head. We wait. It was a long wait, perhaps three or four hours. When someone appeared, it was suddenly. Abruptly, the door had swung open and a black-robed magician entered, followed by a soldier of the Imperial Whites. Hotchapepper nearly spat as he said, Ergoran, are you mad? Release me at once! The magician motioned for the soldier to release Pug. He said to Hotchapepper, I do what I do for the Empire. You consort with our enemies, fat one. I will bring word to the assembly of your duplicity when we have finished with our punishment of this false magician. Pug was quickly herded outside, and the magician named Ergoran said, Milampa, your display at the Imperial Games a year ago has earned you some respect. Enough to ensure you do not wreak any more havoc upon those around you. Two soldiers fastened rare and costly metal bracelets upon his wrists. The wards placed in this dungeon prevented any spell from operating within. Once you are outside the dungeon, these bracelets will cancel your powers. He motioned for the guards to bring Pug, and one pushed him from behind. Pug knew better than to waste time on Ergoran. Of all those magicians called the Warlord's Pets, he had been among the most rabid. He was one of the few magicians who believed that the Assembly should be an arm of the ruling body of the Empire, the High Council. It was supposed by some who knew him that Ergoran's ultimate goal was to see the Assembly become the High Council. It had been rumoured that, while the hot-tempered Almecho had publicly ruled, as often as not, Ergoran had been the one behind him deciding the policy of the war party. A long flight of stairs brought Pug into sunlight. After the darkness of the cell, he was blinded for a moment. As he was pushed along through the courtyard of some immense building, his eyes quickly adjusted. He was taken up a broad flight of stairs, and as he climbed... Pug looked over his shoulder. He could see enough landmarks to know where he was. He saw the river Gargajin, which ran from the mountains called the High Wall down to the city of Jamar. It was the major north-south thoroughfare for the Empire's central provinces. Pug was in the holy city itself, Kentosani, the capital of the Empire of Suanuani, and, from the dozens of white-armoured guards, he knew he was in the Warlord's palace. Pug was pushed along through a long hall until he reached a central chamber. The stone walls ended and a rigid painted wooden hide door was slid aside. A personal council chamber was where the Warlord of the Empire chose to interrogate his prisoner. Another magician stood near the centre of the room, waiting upon the pleasure of a man who sat reading a scroll. The second magician was one Pug knew only slightly, Elgahar. Pug realised he could expect no aid here, even for Hotchapepper, for Elgahar was Ergoran's brother. Magic talent had run deep in their family. Elgahar had always seemed to take his lead from his brother. The man sitting upon a pile of cushions was of middle years, wearing a white robe with a single golden band trimming the neck and sleeves. Remembering Almecho, the last warlord, Pug couldn't think of a more striking contrast. 
This man, Aksan Tukar, was the antithesis of his uncle in appearance. While Almecho had been a bull-necked, stocky man, a warrior in his manner, this man was more like a scholar or teacher. His wire-thin body made him look the ascetic. His features were almost delicate. Then he lifted his gaze up from the parchment he had been reading, and Pug could see the resemblance. This man, like his uncle, had the same mad hunger for power in his eyes. Slowly putting away his scroll, the warlord said, Milambo, you show courage, if not prudence, in returning. You will, of course, be executed, but before we have you hung, we would like to know one thing. Why have you returned? Upon my homeworld, a power grows, a dark and evil presence that seeks to advance its cause, and that cause is the destruction of my homeland. The warlord seemed interested and motioned for Pug to continue. Pug told all he knew, completely and without embellishment or exaggeration. Through magic means, I have determined that this thing is of Kelowan. Somehow, the fates of both worlds are again intertwined. When he was finished, the warlord said, You spin an interesting tale. Ergoran appeared to brush aside Pug's story, but Elgahar looked genuinely troubled. The warlord went on. Milamba, it is truly a shame you were taken from us during the betrayal. Had you remained, we might have found employment for you as a storyteller, a great power of darkness, a borning from some forgotten recess within our empire. <laughs> what a wonderful tale! The man's smile vanished and he leant forward, elbow upon knee, as he looked at Pug. Now, to the truth. This shabby nightmare you spin is but a weak attempt to frighten me into ignoring your true reasons for returning. The Blue Wheel Party and its allies are on the verge of collapse in the High Council. That is why you return for those who counted you as ally before are desperate, knowing the utter domination of the war party to be all but a fact. You and the Fat One are again in league with those who betrayed the Alliance for War during the invasion of your homeworld. You fear the new order of things we represent. Within days I shall announce the end of the High Council, and you have come to thwart that event, true? I don't know what you have in mind, but we shall have the truth from you. If not now, then soon. And you shall name those who stand arrayed against us. And we will have the means of your return. Once the Empire is secure under my rule, then shall we return to your world and quickly do what should have been done under my uncle. Pug looked from face to face and knew the truth. Pug had met and spoken with Roderick, the Mad King. The warlord was not as mad as the king had been, but there was no doubt that he was not entirely sane and behind him stood one who betrayed little but just enough for Pug to understand. Ergoran was the power to be feared here, for he was the true genius behind the dominance of the war party. It would be he who would rule in Suranuani, perhaps some day even openly. A messenger arrived and bowed before the warlord, handing him a parchment. The warlord read quickly, then said, I must go to the council. Inform the Inquisitor I require his services the fourth hour of the night. Guards, return this one to his cell. As the guards pulled Pug about by his chain, the warlord said, Think on this, Millenburg. You may die slowly or quickly, but you will die. The choice is yours. Either way, we shall have the truth from you eventually. Pug watched as Dominic entered his trance. 
Pug had told his companions of the warlord's reaction, and, after Hotcher Pepper had raged on for a time, the fat magician had lapsed into silence. Like others of the black robe, Hotcher Pepper found the notion of any whim of his being ignored almost unfathomable. This imprisonment was nearly impossible to contemplate. Meacham had shown his usual taciturnity, while the monk had also seemed unperturbed. The discussion had been short and resigned. Dominic had soon after begun his exercises, fascinating to Pug. He had sat and begun meditating until he was now entering some sort of trance. In the silence, Pug considered the monk's lesson. Even in this cell, apparently without hope, there was no need for them to surrender to fear and become mindless wretches. Pug turned his mind back, remembering his boyhood at Criddy. The frustrating lessons with Culgan and Tully as he sought to master a magic that he would discover years later he was unsuited to practice. A shame, he thought to himself. There were many things he had observed during his time at Stardock that had convinced him the lesser magic of Midchemia was significantly further advanced than on Kelowan. Most likely, it was a result of there being only one magic on Midchemia. For variety, Pug tried one of the cantrips taught him by Kulgan as a boy, one he had never mastered anyway. Hmm, he mused. The lesser path spell isn't affected. He began to encounter the strange blocking from within himself and almost felt amusement at it. As a boy, he had feared that experience, for it signalled failure. Now he knew it was simply his mind, attuned to the greater path, rejecting lesser path discipline. Still, somehow the effects of the anti-magic wards caused him to attack the problem more obliquely. He closed his eyes, imagining the one thing he had tried on innumerable occasions failing each time. The pattern of his mind balked at the requirements of that magic, but as it shifted to take on its normal orientation, it somehow rebounded against the wards, recoiled and... Pug sat up, eyes wide. He had almost found it. For the briefest instant, he had almost understood. Fighting down excitement, he closed his eyes, head down, and concentrated. If he could only find that one instant, that one crystalline instant when he had understood. An instant that had fled as soon as it had come. In this dank, squalid cell, he had stood upon the brink of perhaps one of the most important discoveries in the history of Tsurani magic. If only he could recapture that instant. Then... The doors to the cell opened. Pug looked up, as did Hotcher Pepper and Meacham. Dominic remained in his trance. Elgahar entered, motioning for a guard to close the door behind him. Pug stood, uncramping legs that had succumbed to the cold stones beneath the straw while he had meditated upon his boyhood. "'What you say is disturbing,' said the black-robed magician. "'As it should be.' for it is true. Perhaps, but it may not be, even if you believe it to be true. I would hear everything. Pug motioned for the magician to sit, but he shook his head in negation. Shrugging, Pug returned to his place on the floor and began his narrative. When he reached the portion relating to Rogan's vision, Elgahar became observably agitated, halting Pug to ask a series of questions. Pug continued. And when he was through, Elgahar shook his head. Tell me, Melamba, on your homeworld, are there many who could have understood what was said to this seer in the vision? No. Only myself and one or two others could have understood it. Only the Surani in Lamut would have recognised it as ancient high temple Surani. There is a frightening possibility. I must know if you've considered it. What? Elgahar leant close to Pug and whispered a single word in his ear. Colour drained from Pug's face and he closed his eyes. Back on Midchemia, his mind had begun the process of intuiting what it could from all the information at hand. 
He had subconsciously known all along what the answer would be. With a single long sigh, he said, I have. At every turn I have shied from admitting that possibility, but it is always there. Hotcha Pepper said, What is this you speak of? Pug shook his head. No, old friend, not yet. I want Elgahar to consider what he has deduced without hearing your opinion or mine. This is something that must make him re-evaluate his loyalties. Perhaps. But even if I do, it will not necessarily alter our present circumstance. Hotcho Pepper exploded in rage. How can you say such a thing? What circumstances can matter in the face of the warlord's crimes? Have you come to the point where all your free will has been surrendered to your brother? Elgahar said, Hotcho Pepper, you of all who wear the black robe should understand, for it was you and Fumitar who played in the great game for years with the Blue Wheel Party. He spoke of those two magicians' part in helping the Emperor end the Rift War. For the first time in the history of the Empire, the Emperor is in a unique position. With the betrayal at the peace conference, he has come to the position of having ultimate authority while having lost face. He may not use his influence, and he will not again utilise his authority. Five clan war chiefs died in that betrayal, the five most likely to achieve the office of warlord. Many families lost position in the High Council because of their deaths. Should he again attempt to order the clans, he may be refused. You speak of regicide, said Pug. It has happened before, Millenburg, but that would mean civil war, for there is no heir. The light of heaven is young and has yet to father sons. Of his issue, there are only three girls as yet. The warlord desires only the stabilization of the empire, not the overthrow of a dynasty more than two thousand years old. I have neither affection nor disaffection for this warlord. But the emperor must be made to understand that his position in the order of things is spiritual only. Surrendering all final authority to the warlord. Then shall Suranuani enter an era of endless prosperity. Hotcha Pepper barked a bitter laugh. That you can believe such drivel shows only that our screening at the assembly is not rigorous enough. Ignoring the insult, Elgahar said, Once the internal order of the empire has been made stable, then we can counter any possible threat you may herald. Even should what you say be true, and my speculation prove accurate, there may be years before we need deal with the issue upon Kelawan. Ample time to prepare. You must remember, we of the Assembly have reached new pinnacles of power never dreamt of by our ancestors. What may have been a terror to them may prove only a nuisance to ourselves. You fail in your arrogance, Elgahar. All of you. Hotcho and I have discussed this before. Your assumption of supremacy is in error. You have not surpassed your ancestors' might. You have yet to equal it. Among the works of Macross the Black, I have found tomes that reveal powers undreamt of in the millennia the assemblies existed. Elgahar seemed intrigued by the notion, and was silent for a long time. Perhaps, he said in a thoughtful tone at last. He moved towards the door. You have accomplished one thing, Milamba. You convince me it is vital to keep you alive longer than the warlord's pleasure dictates. You have knowledge we must extract. As to the rest, I must think upon it. Pug said, Yes, Algahar, think upon it. Think upon one word, that which you whispered in my ear. 
Elgahar seemed on the verge of saying something, then spoke to the guard outside, ordering the door opened. He left, and Hotchapepper said, He's mad! No, said Pug, not mad. He simply believes what his brother tells him. Anyone who can look into Axon Tukar's and Ergoran's eyes and think they are the ones to bring prosperity to the Empire is a fool, a believing idealist, but not mad. Ergoran is the one we must truly fear. They settled back to silence, and Pug returned to brooding on what Elgahar had whispered to him. The chilling possibility that it represented was too dreadful to dwell upon. So he turned his mind to consider again the strange moment where, for the first time in his life, he glimpsed the true mastery of the lesser path. Time had passed. Pug didn't know how long, but he assumed it was four hours past sunset, the time the warlord had set for interrogation. Guards entered the cell, unshackling Meacham, Dominic and Pug. Hotcher Pepper was left behind. They were marched to a room equipped with devices of torture. The warlord stood resplendent in green and golden robes, speaking to the magician Ergoran. A man in a red hood waited silently while the three prisoners were shackled to pillars in the room, situated so they could see one another. Against my better judgment, Ergoran and Elgahar have convinced me it would be beneficial to keep you alive, though each has different reasons. Elgahar seemed inclined to believe your story somewhat, at least enough to think it prudent to learn all we may. Ergoran and I are not so disposed, but there are other things we wish to know. Therefore... We shall begin to ensure we have only the truth from you. He signalled to the Inquisitor, who tore Dominic's robes from him, leaving him wearing only a loincloth. The Inquisitor opened a sealed pot and took out a heavy stick with some whitish substance. He daubed some on Dominic's chest and the monk stiffened. Without metals, the Surani had developed methods of torture different from those used on Midkemia, but equally as effective. The substance was a sticky caustic that began to blister the skin as soon as administered. Dominic screwed his eyes shut and bit back a cry. For reasons of economy, we thought you'd be more likely to tell us the truth if your companions were given attention first. From what your former compatriots tell us, and from that unforgivable outburst at the Imperial Games... You seem to have a compassionate nature, Milimba. Will you tell us the truth? Everything I have said is true, warlord. Torturing my friends will not change that. Master, came a cry. The warlord looked at his inquisitor. What? This man. Look. Dominic had lost his pained expression. He hung from the pillar, beatific peace upon his face. Ergoran stepped up before the monk and examined him. He's in some manner of trance. Both warlord and magician looked at Pug, and the magician said, What tricks does this false priest practice, Milimba? He is no priest of Hantukama, true, but he is a cleric of my world. He can place his mind at rest regardless of what occurs with his body. The warlord nodded towards the Inquisitor, who removed a sharp knife from the table. He stepped before the monk and, with a sudden cut, sliced open his shoulder. Dominic did not move, not even an involuntary twitch in reaction. Using pincers, the Inquisitor took a hot coal and applied it to the cut. Again, the monk did not react. The Inquisitor put away his pincers and said, It is useless, Master. His mind is blocked away. We've had this problem with priests before. Pug's brow furrowed. While not free of politics, the temples tended to be circumspect in their relationship with the High Council. If the Warlord had been interrogating priests, that indicated movement on the part of the temples towards those allied against the War Party. From Hotchapepper's ignorance of this fact, it also meant the warlord was moving covertly and had stolen the march on his opposition. 
As much as anything, this told Pug that the Empire was in serious straits, even now poised on the brink of civil war. The assault upon those who stood with the Emperor would come soon. This one's no priest, said Ergoran, coming up to Meacham. He looked up at the tall Franklin. He's a simple slave, so he should prove more manageable. Meacham spat full in the magician's face. Ergoran, used to the unhesitating fear and respect due a great one, was as stunned as if he had been clubbed. He staggered back, wiping spittle from his face. Enraged, he said coldly, You've earned a slow, lingering death, slave. Meacham smiled for the first time Pug could remember, a broad grin, almost leering. His face was rendered impossibly demonic by the scar on his cheek. It was worth it, you genderless mule. In his anger, Meacham had spoken in the king's tongue, but the tone of the insult was not lost on the magician. He reached over, pulled the sharp blade from the Inquisitor's table and slashed a long furrow on Meacham's chest. The Franklin stiffened, his face draining of colour as the wound began to bleed. Ergoran stood before him in triumph. Then the Midkemian spat again. The Inquisitor turned to the Warlord. Master, the Great One is interfering with delicate work. The Magician stepped back, letting the knife drop. He again wiped the spittle from his face as he returned to the Warlord's side. With hatred in his voice, he said, Don't be too hasty in speaking what you know, Milimba. I wish this carrion a long session. Pug struggled to battle with the magic neutralising properties of the bracelets upon his wrists, but to no avail. The Inquisitor began to work upon Meacham, but the stoic Franklin refused to cry out. For half an hour the Inquisitor practised his bloody trade, until at last Meacham sounded a strangled groan and passed into semi-consciousness. The Warlord said, Why have you returned, Milimba? Pug, feeling Meacham's pain as if it were his own, said, I've told you the truth. He looked at Ergoran. You know it's the truth. He knew his plea fell on deaf ears, for the enraged magician wished Meacham to suffer for spite, not caring that Pug had told all. The warlord indicated to the Inquisitor that he was to begin upon Pug. The red-hooded man tore Pug's robes open. The pot of caustic was opened and a small daub was applied to Pug's chest. Years of hard work as a slave in the swamp had left Pug a lean, muscled man and his body tensed as the pain began. At first daub there had been no sensation. Then... An instant later, pain seared his flesh as the chemicals in the paste reacted. Pug could almost hear the skin blister. The warlord's voice cut through the pain. Why have you returned? Whom have you contacted? Pug closed his eyes against the fire on his chest. He sought refuge in the calming exercises Colgan had taught him as an apprentice. Another daub of paste and another fire erupted, this time on the sensitive flesh inside his thigh. Pug's mind rebelled and sought to find refuge in magic. Again and again he battled to break through the barrier imposed by the magic-limiting bracelets. In his youth, he had been able to find his path to magic only under great stress. When his life had been threatened by trolls, he had found his first spell. When battling Squire Roland, he had lashed out magically, and, when he had destroyed the Imperial Games, it had been from a deeply held well of anger and outrage. Now, his mind was an enraged animal bouncing off the bars of a magically imposed cage, and, like an animal, he reacted blindly, striking against the barrier again and again, determined either to be free or to die. Hot coals were placed against his flesh, and he screamed. It was an animal cry, mixed pain and rage, and his mind lashed out. His thoughts became blurred. 
as if he existed in a landscape of reflecting surfaces, a mad spinning room of mirrors, each casting back an image. He saw the kitchen boy of Criddy looking back at him in one surface, then Culgan's student in another. In a third was the young squire, and the fourth a slave in the Shinzawai swamp camp. But in the reflections behind the reflections, the mirrors seen within the mirrors, in each he saw a new thing. Behind the boy in the kitchen he saw a man, a servant, but there was no doubt who that man was. Pug, without magic, without training, grown to manhood as a simple member of the castle serving staff, laboured in the kitchen. Behind the image of the young squire he saw a kingdom noble, with Princess Carline upon his arm, his wife. His mind whirled. He frantically sought something. He studied the image of Kulgan's student. Behind him, he saw the reflected image of an adult practitioner of the lesser art. In his mind, Pug spun, seeking the origin of that reflected image within an image, of the Pug grown to be a master of the lesser magic. Then he saw the source of that image, a possible future never realised, a chance of fate having diverted his life from that outcome. But... In the alternate probabilities of his life, he found what he sought. He found an escape. Suddenly, he understood. A way was open to him, and his mind fled down that path. Pug's eyes snapped open, and he looked past the red-hooded figure of the Inquisitor. Meacham hung groaning, again conscious, while Dominic was still lost in a trance. Pug used a mental ability to turn off his awareness of the injury done to his body. In an instant, he stood without feeling pain. Then, his mind reached towards the black-robed figure of Urgaran. The Great One of the Empire almost staggered as Pug's gaze locked upon his own. For the first time in memory, a magician of the Greater Path employed a talent of the Lesser Path, and Pug engaged Urgaran in a contest of wills. With mind-shattering force, Pug overwhelmed the magician, stunning him instantly. The black-robed figure sagged for a moment until Pug took control of his body. Closing his own eyes, Pug now saw through Ergorans. He adjusted his senses, then had complete command over the Surani Great One. Ergorans' hand shot forward and a cascade of energy sprang from his fingers, striking the Inquisitor from behind. Red and purple lines of force danced along the man's body as he arched and shrieked. Then the Inquisitor danced across the room like a mad puppet, his movements jerky and spastic as he cried out in agony. The warlord stood briefly stunned, then screamed, Argoran, what insanity is this? He grabbed at the magician's robe as the Inquisitor slammed against the far wall and fell to the stone floor. The instant the warlord came into contact with the magician, the painful energy ceased to strike the Inquisitor and engulf the warlord. Aksantukar writhed as he fell back from the onslaught. The Inquisitor rose from the floor, shaking his head to clear it, and staggered back towards the captives. The red-hooded torturer pulled a slender knife from the table, sensing Pug to be the author of this pain. He stepped towards Pug, but Meacham gripped his chains and hoisted himself up. With a heave, Meacham reached out and encircled the Inquisitor's neck with his legs. In a scissor's grip, he held the struggling Inquisitor, squeezing with tremendous power. The Inquisitor struck at Meacham's leg with the knife, slashing it across the flesh over and over, but Meacham kept pressure on. Again and again the knife cut, until Meacham's legs were covered in his own blood but the Inquisitor couldn't cut deeply with the blood-slick little knife. Meacham only gave a joyous cry of victory. Then, with a grunt and a jerk, he crushed the man's windpipe. As the Inquisitor collapsed, strength flowed out of the Franklin. Meacham dropped, held up only by his chains. With a weak smile, he nodded towards Pug. Pug broke off the pain spell, and the warlord fell back from Ergoran. Pug commanded the magician to approach. 
The Great One's mind felt like a soft, malleable thing under Pug's magic control. And somehow, Pug knew how to command the magician to act, while keeping aware of what he himself was doing. The magician began freeing Pug from his chains, while the warlord struggled to his feet. One hand was free. Aksantuka staggered to the outer door. Pug made a decision. If he could be free of the bonds, he could handle any number of guards called in by the warlord. But he couldn't control two men, and he didn't think he could keep control of the magician long enough to destroy the warlord and free himself. Or could he? Then Pug recognised the danger. This new magic was proving difficult, and his judgement was slipping. Why was he allowing the warlord to gain his freedom? The pain of torture and the exertion were taking a terrible toll, and Pug felt himself weakening by the moment. The warlord pulled open the door, screaming for guards, and, when it opened, Aksantukar grabbed at a spear. With a heave, he struck Ergoran full in the back. The blow knocked the magician to his knees before he could loosen Pug's other hand. It also had the effect of sending a psychic shock back to strike Pug. Pug screamed in concern with Ergoran's dying pain. Fog shrouded Pug's mind. Then something within cracked, and his thoughts became a sea of glittering shards as the mirrors of memory shattered. Scraps of past lessons, images of his family, smells, tastes and sounds rang through his consciousness. Lights danced through his mind, first scattering motes of starlight, reflections of new vistas within. They weaved and danced, forming a pattern, a circle, a tunnel, then a way. He plunged through the way and found himself upon a new plane of consciousness. New paths were walked, new understandings achieved. That path, open to him before, through pain and terror, was now his to walk at will. At last, he stood in command of those powers which were his legacy. His vision cleared, and he saw soldiers struggling on the stairs. Pug turned his attention to the remaining shackle upon his wrist. Suddenly, he remembered an old lesson of Kulgan's. With a caress of his mind, the hardened leather shackle was made soft and supple again, and he pulled his hand free. Pug concentrated, and the magic-inhibiting bracelets fell away, broken in half. He looked up at the stairs, and for the first time the full impact of what he saw registered. The warlord and his soldiers had fled the room as some sort of struggle took place above. A soldier in the blue armour of the Kanazawai clan lay dead next to an imperial white. Pug quickly released Meacham, easing him to the ground. He was bleeding heavily from the leg wounds and cuts to his body. Pug sent Dominic a questing mental message. Return. Dominic's eyes opened at once as his shackles fell off, and Pug said, Tend to Meacham. Without asking for explanation, the monk turned to treat the wounded Franklin. Pug dashed up the stairs and ran to where Hotra Pepper lay imprisoned. He entered the cell, and the startled magician said, What is it? I heard some noise outside. Pug bent over and changed the manacles to soft leather. I don't know. Allies, I think. I suspect the Blue Wheel Party is attempting to free us. He pulled Hotchapepper's hands free of the now soft restraints. Hotchapepper stood on wobbly legs. We must help them help us, he said with resolution. Then he considered his freedom and the softened restraints. Milamba, how did you do that? Passing through the door, Pug answered, I don't know, Hotcho. It will be something to discuss. Pug raced up the stairs towards the upper level of the palace. In the central gallery of the warlord's palace, armed men struggled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Men in armour of various colours battled with the warlord's imperial whites. Looking about the bloody combat, Pug saw Aksantukar fighting past a struggling pair of soldiers. Two white-armoured soldiers covered his retreat. Pug closed his eyes and reached out. His eyes opened and he could see the invisible hand of energy he had created. He could feel it as he could his own. 
As if picking up a kitten by the neck, he reached out and gripped the warlord. Raising him up, he drew the struggling, kicking man towards him. The soldiers halted their struggle at the sight of the warlord above them. Aksantuka, supreme warrior of the Empire, shrieked in unashamed terror at the invisible force that had grabbed him. Pug pulled him back towards where he and Hocho stood. Some of the Imperial Whites recovered from their shock and deduced that the renegade magician must be the cause of their master's dilemma. Several broke off from their struggles with the soldiers in coloured armour and ran to aid the warlord. Then a loud voice cried out, Echinda! Ninety-one times Emperor! Instantly, every soldier in the room, regardless of which side he struggled for, dropped to the floor, putting forehead against the stone. The officers stood with heads bowed. Only Hotchapepper and Pug watched as a cortege of war chiefs, all in the armour of those who constituted the Blue Wheel Party, entered the room. In the forefront, wearing armour not seen in years, came Kamatsu, again for a time war chief of the Kanazawa clan. Forming up, they parted to allow the emperor to enter. Ichinda, supreme authority of the empire, walked into the hall, resplendent in his ceremonial golden armour. He stalked to where Pug waited, the warlord still hanging in mid-air above him, and surveyed the scene. At last he said, Great One, you do seem to cause difficulty whenever you appear. He looked up at the warlord. If you'll put him down, we can get to the bottom of this mess. Pug allowed the warlord to fall, striking the ground heavily. That is an amazing tale, Melambar said Ichindar to Pug. He sat on the pillows occupied earlier that day by the warlord, sipping a cup of the warlord's chocha. It would be simple to say, I believe you, and that all is forgiven. But the dishonour visited upon me by those you call elves and dwarves is an impossible thing to forget. Around him stood the war chiefs of the clans of the Blue Wheel and the magician Elgahar. Hotchapepper said, If the light of heaven will permit me. Remember, they were but tools, soldiers, if you will, in a game of Shah. That this Macross was attempting to prevent the arrival of the enemy is but another concern. That... He is responsible for the betrayal, rids you of the responsibility of avenging yourself upon anyone but Macross. And, as he is presumed dead, it is a moot issue. The Emperor said, Hotchapepper, your tongue is as facile as a relly. He referred to the water-snake-like creature known for its supple movement. I will not be punitive without good cause, but I am also reluctant to take my former stance of conciliation towards the kingdom. Pug said, Majesty, that would not be wise at this time in any event. When Ichindar looked interested in the comment, Pug continued, while I hope that some day our two nations may meet again as friends, at this time there are more pressing matters that demand attention. For the short term, it must be as if the two worlds were never rejoined. The Emperor sat up. From what little I understand of such matters, I suspect you are correct. Larger issues need to be resolved. I must make a decision shortly that may forever change the course of Tsurani history. He lapsed into silence. For a long time he held his own counsel, then said, When Komatsu and the others came to me, 
telling me of your return and your suspicion of some black terror of Surani origin upon your world, I wished to ignore it all. I cared nothing for your problems or those of your world. I was even indifferent to the possibility of once more invading your land. I was fearful of acting again, for I had lost much face before the High Council after the attack on your world. He seemed lost in thought for a brief moment. Your world was lovely. What little I saw before the battle. He sighed, his green eyes fastening on Pug. Melamba. Had Elgahar not come to the palace, confirming what your allies in the Blue Wheel Party reported, you most likely would be dead, and I would soon follow after, and Aksantuka on his way to bloody civil war. He gained the white and gold only because of the outrage against the betrayal. You prevented my death, if not some greater calamity for the Empire. I think that warrants some consideration, though you know the turmoil in the Empire is just beginning. Pug said, I am enough a product of the Empire to understand that the game of the Council will become even more vicious. Ichindar looked outside the window, where the body of Aksang Tukar hung twisting in the wind. I will have to consult the historians, but that is the first warlord hung by an Emperor, I believe. Hanging was the ultimate shame and punishment for a warrior. Still... As he no doubt planned the same fate for myself, I don't think I'm likely to have a rebellion. At least, not this week. The war chiefs of the High Council who were in attendance looked at one another. Finally, Komatsu said, Light of heaven, if I may. The war party retires in confusion. The betrayal by the warlord has robbed them of any base for negotiation within the High Council. Even as we speak, the war party is no more, and its clans and families will be meeting to discuss which parties to join to regain some shred of their influence. For now, the moderates rule. The Emperor shook his head, and in a surprisingly strong tone said, No, honoured lord, you are wrong. In Suaru Anoani, I rule. He stood surveying those around him. Until these matters Milamba brought to our attention are resolved, and the Empire is truly safe, or the threat has been shown to be false, the High Council is recessed. There will be no new warlord until I have commanded an election within the Council. Until I decree otherwise, I am the law. Pepper said, Majesty, the assembly? As before, but be warned, great one. See to your brothers. If another black robe is ever discovered involved in a plot against my house, the status of great ones outside the law will end. Even should I be forced to pit all the armies of the Empire against your magic might, even to the utter ruination of the Empire, I will not allow any to challenge the supremacy of the Emperor again. Is that understood? Hotcher Pepper said, It will be done, Imperial Majesty. Elgahar's renunciation and his brothers and the warlord's acts will give others in the assembly pause to think. I shall bring the matter before the membership. The emperor said to Pug, Great one, I cannot instruct the assembly to reinstate you, nor am I entirely comfortable having you around, but until this matter is resolved... You are free to come and go as long as you need. When you again depart for your homeworld, 
inform us of your findings. We shall be willing to accommodate you somewhat in preventing the destruction of your world, if we may. Now, he started for the door, I must return to my palace. I have an empire to rebuild. Pug watched as the others left. Komatsu came up to him and said, Great one, it seems to have ended well for a time. For a time, old friend. Seek to aid the light of heaven, for his life may be a short one when tonight's decrees are made public tomorrow. The lord of the Shinzawai bowed before Pug. Your will, great one. To Hotcha Pepper, Pug said, Let's fetch Dominic and Meacham from where they rest and go to the assembly, Hotcha. We have work to do. In a moment, for I have a question of Elgahar. The stout magician faced the former warlord's pet. Why the sudden reversal of position? I had always counted you your brother's tool. The slender magician replied, What Milumbur carried warning of upon his homeworld gave me pause to think. I spent time weighing all possibilities, and when I suggested the obvious answer to Milumbur, he concurred. It was a risk too grave to ignore. Compared to this, all other matters are inconsequential. Hotcho Pepper turned to face Pug. I do not understand. What does he speak of? Pug sagged in fatigue, and something more, a deep hidden terror coming to the fore. I hesitate even to speak of it. He looked at those about him. Elgahar concluded something I suspected but was afraid to admit even to myself. For a moment he was silent, and those in the room seemed to hold their breath. Then he said, The enemy has returned. Pug pushed back the leather-covered volume before him and said, Another dead end. He passed a hand over his face, closing tired eyes. He had so much to deal with and a sense of fleeing time. The discovery of his ability as a lesser path magician he kept to himself. There was a side to his nature he had never suspected, and he wished more private conditions under which to explore these revelations. Hotchapepper and Elgahar looked up from where they sat reading. Elgahar had worked as hard as any, demonstrating some wish to make amends. These records are in a shambles, Milumba, he commented. Pug agreed. I told Hotcho two years ago that the assembly had become lax in its arrogance. This confusion is but one example. Pug adjusted his black robe. When his reasons for returning were made known, he had, on a motion by his old friends, seconded by Elgahar, been reinstated to full membership without hesitation. Of the members in attendance, only a few abstained, and none voted in opposition. Each had stood upon the Tower of Testing and had seen the rage and might of the enemy. Shimon, one of Pug's oldest friends in the assembly and his former instructor, entered with Dominic. Since the encounter with the Warlord's Inquisitor the night before, the priest had shown remarkable recuperative powers. He had used his magic healing arts on Meacham and Pug, but something in the way they worked prevented him from using them upon himself. However, he had also possessed the knowledge to instruct the magicians at the assembly in concocting a poultice that prevented festering in the cuts and burns he had endured. Milumba, this priest friend of yours is a wonder. He has some marvellous means of cataloguing our works here. Dominic said, I have only shared what we have learned at Sarth. There is a great deal of confusion here, but it is not as bad as it appears on casual inspection. Hotcho Pepper stretched. What has me concerned is that there is little here we don't already know. It is as if the vision we shared upon the tower is the earliest recollection of the enemy, and no other has been recorded. Well, that may be true, said Pug. 
Remember that most of the truly great magicians perished at the Golden Bridge, leaving only apprentices and lesser magicians behind. It may have been years before any attempt to keep records commenced. Meacham entered, carrying a huge bundle of ancient tomes heavily bound in treated skins. Pug indicated a spot on the floor nearby, and Meacham put them down. Pug opened the bundle and handed copies of the work around. Elgahar carefully opened one, the book's binding creaking as he did. Gods of Tsuranuani! These works are old! Among the oldest in the assembly, Dominic said. It took Meacham and myself an hour just to locate them and another to dig them out. Shimon said, This is almost another dialect, it's so ancient. There are verb usages here, inflections I've never heard of. Hotcho said, Milamba, listen to this. And when the bridge vanished, still did Avari insist on counsel. Elgahar said, The Golden Bridge. Pug and the others stopped what they were doing and listened as Hotcho Pepper continued reading. Of the Alstwanabi, those remaining were but thirteen, numbering Avari, Mali, Karon, uh, the list goes on, and little comfort among them. But Mali spoke her words of power and calmed their fears. We are upon this world made for us by Chaka Khan. Could that be an ancient form of Chochokan? And we shall endure. Those who watched say we are safe from the darkness. The darkness? Can it be? Pug reread the passage. Well, this is the same name used by Rogan after his vision. It's too far a stretch to be called coincidence. There is our proof. The enemy is somehow involved in the attempts upon Prince Arthur. Dominic said, And there is something else there as well. Elgahar agreed. Yes. Who are those who watched? Pug pushed away the book, the toll of the last day bringing on sleep unbidden. Of all those who had searched through the day with him, only Dominic remained. The Ashapian monk seemed able to disregard fatigue at will. Pug closed his eyes, intent on resting them for a short while only. His mind had been occupied with many things, and many things he had put aside. Now images flickered past, but none seemed to abide. Soon Pug was asleep, and while he slept, he dreamt. He stood upon the roof of the assembly again. He wore the grey of a trainee, and he was shown the tower steps by Shimon. He knew he must mount again to face the storm, again to pass that test which would gain him the rank of Great One. He mounted and climbed in his dream, seeing something at each step, a string of flashing images. A stover bird struck the water for a fish, its scarlet wings flashing against the blue of sky and water. Then other images came flooding in. Hot jungles where slaves toiled. A clash of warriors, a dying soldier. Thun running over the tundra of the north. A young wife seducing a guard of her husband's household. A spice merchant at his stall. Then his vision travelled to the north, and he saw ice fields, bitter cold and swept by steel-edged wind. He could smell the bitterness of age here. From within a tower of snow and ice, figures emerged bundled against the wind. Human-shaped, they walked with a smooth tread that marked them other than human. They were beings old and wise in ways unknown to men, and they sought a sign in the sky. They looked up, and they watched. They watch. Watchers. Pug sat up, eyes open. What is it, Pug? asked Dominic. Get the others, he said. I know. Pug stood before the others, his black robes blowing in the morning breeze. 
You'll have no one with you, Hotcho Pepper asked again. No, Hotcho. You can help by getting Dominic and Meacham back to my estate so they may return to Midkemia. I've passed along all I've learned here for Culgan and the others, with messages for all who need to know what we've discovered so far. I may be seeking a legend, trying to find these watchers in the north. You can help more by getting my friends back. Elgahar stepped forward. If it is permitted, I would accompany your friends to your world. Pug said, Why? The Assembly has little need for one caught up in the affairs of the Warlord, and from what you have said, there are great ones in training at your academy who need instruction. Count it an act of appeasement. I will remain there at least for a while, continuing the education of these trainees. Pug considered. Very well. Colgan will instruct you in what needs to be done. Always remember that the rank of Great One means nothing on Midkemia. You will be simply one among a community. It will prove difficult. Elgahar said, I shall endeavour. Hotcha Pepper said, That's a capital idea. I've long wondered about this barbaric land you hail from. And I could use a vacation from my wife. I'll go too. Hotcho, said Pug, laughing. The Academy is a rough place, devoid of your usual comforts. He stepped forward. Never mind that, Milambar. You'll require allies on your world. I may speak lightly, but your friends will need help, and soon. The enemy is something beyond the experience of any of us. We'll start now to combat it. As for the discomfort, I'll manage. Besides, said Pug, you've been licking your lips over Macross's library ever since I've spoken of it. Meacham shook his head. Him and Culgan, two peas in a pod. Hotcho Pepper said, What's a pea? You'll discover soon, old friend. Pug embraced Hotcho and Shimon, shook hands with Meacham and Dominic, and bowed to the other members of the assembly. Follow the instructions on activating the rift as I've written them, and be certain to close it once through. The enemy may still seek a rift to enter our worlds. I go to the Shinzawai estate, the northernmost destination where I can use a pattern. From there I'll take horse and cross the Thun Tundra. If the Watchers still exist, I shall find them and return to Midkemia with what they know of the enemy. Then shall we meet again. Until then, my friends, care for one another. Pug incanted the required spell and, with a shimmer, he was gone. The other stood about a while. Finally, Hotcho Pepper said, Come, we must make ready. He looked at Dominic, Meacham and Elgahar. Come, my friends. Chapter 18 Vengeance Jimmy woke with a start. Someone had walked by on the surface. Jimmy had slept through the day with the others awaiting the fall of night for the investigation of the black building. He had taken the position closest to the surface. Jimmy shivered. Throughout the day his dreams had been alien, haunted by troubling images, not true nightmares, but rather dreams filled with odd longings and dim recognitions. It was almost as if he had inherited another's dreams, and that other hadn't been human. Somehow he felt lingering memories of rage and hatred. It left him feeling dirty. Shaking off the odd, fuzzy feeling, he looked down. The others were dozing except for Baru, who seemed to be meditating. At least he sat upright with legs crossed and his hands before him, eyes closed and breath even. Jimmy cautiously pulled himself upwards until he was just below the surface. Two voices sounded some distance away. Here somewhere! If he was stupid enough to go inside, then the fault is his. 
came another voice with a strange accent. A dark brother, Jimmy thought. Well, I'm not going in after him. Not after being warned to keep clear, said a second human voice. Wright said to find Jack on. And you know how he is about desertion. If we don't find Jack on, he'll likely have our ears just for spite, complained the first human. Rights is nothing, came the voice of the Mordel. Murad has ordered that none should enter the black building. Would you invoke his wrath and face his black slayers? No, said the first human voice. But you better think of something to tell Rights. I'm fresh out. The voices trailed off. Jimmy waited until the voices couldn't be heard, then chanced another brief look. Two humans and a Moradel were walking towards the bridge, one of the humans gesturing. They halted at the end of the bridge, pointing towards the house and explaining something. It was Murad they were speaking to. At the far end of the bridge, Jimmy could see an entire company of human horsemen waiting as the four crossed over. Jimmy dropped down and woke Aretha. We've got company upstairs, the boy whispered. Lowering his voice so Baru would not hear, he said, And your old scar-faced friend is back with him. How close is it to sundown? Less than an hour, perhaps two to full darkness. Aretha nodded and settled in to wait. Jimmy dropped past him to the floor of the upper cavern and foraged through his pack for some jerked beef. His stomach had been reminding him that he had not eaten for the last day, and he decided that if he was going to die tonight, he might as well eat first. Time passed slowly, and Jimmy noticed that something beyond the normal tension expected in this situation had infected the mood of each of Aretha's company. Martin and Laurie had both fallen into deep, brooding silences, and Aretha seemed introverted almost to the point of being catatonic. Baru silently mouthed chants and appeared in a trance, while Rold sat facing a wall staring at some unseen image. Jimmy shook off distant images of strange people oddly dressed and engaged in alien undertakings and forced himself alert. Hey, he said, with just enough authority to jar everyone and turn their attention to him. You all look... lost... Martin's eyes seemed to focus. I... I was thinking of father. Aretha spoke softly. It's this place. I was... nearly without hope, ready to give up. Rold said, I was at Cutter's Gap again. Only High Castle's army wasn't going to arrive in time. Baru said, I was singing my death chant. Laurie crossed to stand next to Jimmy. It's this place. I was thinking Carl Ein had found another while I was gone. He looked at Jimmy. You? Jimmy shrugged. It hit me funny too, but maybe it's my age or something. It only made me think of strange people dressed in weird clothing. I don't know. It sort of makes me angry. Martin said, well, The elves said the Mordell come here to dream dreams of power. Jimmy said, Well, all I know is you look like those walking dead. He moved towards the crevice. It's dark. Why don't I go and look about? And if things are quiet, then we can all go. Aretha said, I think perhaps you and I should go together. No, said the boy thief. I hate to show a lack of deference, but if I'm to risk my life doing something I'm expert in, let me do it. You need to have someone crawl about inside that place, and I'll not have you tagging after. It's too dangerous, said Aretha. I'll not deny that, answered Jimmy. I'll guarantee that Dragon Lord Shrine will need some skill cracking, and if you've any sense, you'll let me go alone. Otherwise, You'll be dead before I can say don't step there, Highness, and we might as well not have bothered in the first place. We could have just let the night all skewer you, and I'd have spent many more comfortable nights in Crondor. Martin said, He's right. Aretha said, I don't like this. 
but you are right. As the boy turned to go, he added, Have I told you that you put me in mind of that pirate Amos Trask sometimes? In the darkness, they could sense the boy's grin. Jimmy scampered up through the crevice and peered out. Seeing no one, he made a quick run for the building. Coming up against the wall, he edged around until he was before the door. He stood quietly for a moment, judging the best way to approach the problem. He studied the door once again, then quickly clambered up the wall, finding finger and toe holds in the moulding next to the door. Again, he studied the anteroom through the window. Double doors opened up into darkness beyond, otherwise the room was empty. Jimmy glanced upwards and was confronted by a blank ceiling. What was waiting inside to kill him? As sure as dogs had fleas, there was a trap inside, and, if so, what sort and how to get around it? Again, Jimmy was visited by the nagging itch of something odd about this place. Jimmy dropped back to the ground and took a deep breath. He reached out and lifted the latch of the door. With a shove, he leapt aside, to the left, so the swinging door, hinged on the right, would shield him from anything behind it for an instant. Nothing happened. Jimmy peered cautiously inside, letting his senses seek out inconsistencies, flaws in the design of the place, any clue to reveal a trap. He saw none. Jimmy leant against the door. What if the trap were magic? He had no defences against some enchantment meant to kill humans, non mordel, anyone wearing green or whatever it might be. Jimmy stuck his hand across the portal, ready to snatch it back. Nothing happened. Jimmy sat. Then he lay down. From the low angle, everything looked different, and he hoped he might see something. As he rose, something did register. The floor was made of marble slabs of equal size and texture, with slight cracks between them. He lightly placed his foot on the slab before the door, slowly permitting his weight to fall upon it, feeling for any movement. There was none. Jimmy entered and moved around, towards the far doors. He inspected every stone slab before he stepped upon it and decided none were trapped. He inspected the walls and ceiling, gauging everything about the room that might provide him with some intelligence. Nothing. The old, familiar feeling plagued Jimmy. Something was wrong here. With a sigh, Jimmy faced the open doors into the heart of the building and entered. Jimmy had seen many unsavoury characters in his former occupation, and this jack-on would have fitted in perfectly. Jimmy lay flat and rolled the corpse over. As the dead man's weight landed upon the other stone before the door, there was a faint snapping sound and something sped overhead. Jimmy examined Jackon and found a small dart stuck in the man's chest near the collarbone. Jimmy didn't touch it. He didn't have to. He knew it contained a quick-acting poison. Another item of interest on the fellow was a beautifully carved dagger with a jewelled hilt. Jimmy plucked it from the man's belt and stuck it inside his tunic. Jimmy sat back upon his heels. He had walked through a long blank hall with no doors, down into a subterranean level of the building. He judged he stood less than a hundred yards from the caverns where Aretha and the others waited. He had stumbled upon the corpse at the only door leaving the hall. The stone slab directly beyond the door was ever so slightly depressed. He rose and stepped through the door diagonally to the stone next to the one before the door. The trap was so obvious it shouted for caution, but this fool, in his rush towards fabled wealth, had walked into it and paid the price. Something bothered Jimmy. The trap was too obvious. It was as if someone wanted him to feel confident in defeating it. He shook his head. Whatever tendency towards incaution he'd had was gone. Now he was fully professional, a thief who understood that any misstep would likely be his last. Jimmy wished for more light than was provided by the single torch he had brought along. 
he inspected the floor below Jackon and saw another displaced stone. He ran his hand along the door jamb and found no trip wire or other triggering device. Stepping across the threshold, avoiding the stones before the door, Jimmy passed the corpse and continued on towards the heart of the building. It was a circular room. In the centre of it, a slender pedestal rose. Upon the pedestal sat a crystal sphere lit from above by some unseen light source. And within the sphere rested a single branch with silver-green leaves, red berries and silver thorns. Jimmy walked cautiously. He looked everywhere but where the pedestal rested. He explored every inch of the room he could reach without entering the pool of light about the sphere and found nothing resembling a trap-springing device. But the nagging at the back of Jimmy's mind, which had been with him all along, kept shouting that something was wrong about this place. Since discovering Jackon, he had avoided three different traps, all easy enough for any competent thief to spot. Now here, where he expected the last trap to be, he found none. Jimmy sat down on the floor and began to think. Aretha and the others came alert. Jimmy came scrambling back down into the crevice to land with a thud on the floor of the cave. What did you find? asked Aretha. It's a big place. It's got lots of empty rooms, all cleverly fashioned so that you can only move one way from the door to the centre of the building and out. There's nothing in there but some sort of little shrine in the centre. There are a few traps, simple enough ones, to get around. But the old thing's too off-centre. Something's not right. The buildings are fake. What? said Aretha. Well, just suppose you wanted to catch you, and you were worried about you being very clever. Don't you think you might just add one last catch-all in case all the bright lads you hired to catch you were a mite slow? You think the building's a trap? said Martin. Yes, a big, elaborate, clever trap. Look, suppose you've got this mystic lake and all your tribe comes here to make magic or get power from the dead or whatever it is the Dark Brothers do up here. You want to add this one last catch-all, so you think like a human. Maybe dragon lords don't build buildings, but humans do. So you build this building, this big building with nothing in it. Then... You put a sprig of silver thorn in some place, like in a shrine inside, and you rig a trap. Someone finds the little L.O.s you put along the way, guess around them, thinking they're being very, very clever, wanders about, finds the silver thorn, pulls it, and... And the trap springs, said Laurie, his tone appreciative of the boy's logic. And the trap springs, said Jimmy. I don't know how they did it, but I'll bet the last trap is magic of some sort. The rest were too easy to find. Then, at the end, nothing. I bet you touch the sphere with a silver thorn in it and a dozen doors behind you in the outside slam shut and a hundred of those dead warriors come out of the walls or the old building simply falls on you. Aretha said, I'm not convinced. Look, you've got a greedy pack of bandits up there. Most of them aren't very smart, or they wouldn't be outlaws living in the mountains. They'd be self-respecting thieves in a city. Besides being stupid, they're greedy. So they come up here to earn some gold looking for the prince, and they're told, don't go in the building. Now, each of these clever lads thinks the Moradel are lying, because he knows everyone else is as stupid and greedy as he is. One of these clever lads goes up there looking around, and gets a dart in the gullet for his efforts. After I found the sphere on the pedestal, I doubled back and really looked round. That place was built by the Mordell recently. It's about as ancient as I am. It's mostly a wood building with stone facing. I've been in the old buildings. This isn't one. I don't know how they did it. Maybe with magic or just a whole lot of slave labour, but it's no more than a few months old. But Galen said this was a Valheru place, said Aretha. Martin said, I think him right but I think Jimmy right as well. Remember what you told me of Tomas's rescue from the Valheru underground hall by Dolgan, just before the war? Aretha said he did. Well, that place sounds much like this. Light a torch, said Aretha. Roll did so, and they moved away from the crevice. Laurie said, 
Has anyone noticed that for a cave, the ground is fairly flat? And the walls are pretty regular, added Rold. Baru looked about. In our haste, we never examined this place closely. It is not natural. The boy is right. The building is a trap. Martin said, This cave system has had two thousand years or more to wear away. With that fissure above us, rain comes through here every winter as well as seepage from the lake above. It has worn away most of what was carved upon the walls. He ran his hand over what seemed at first glance to be swirls in the stone. But not all. He indicated some design on the walls, rendered abstract by years of erosion. Baru said, And so we dream ancient dreams of hopelessness. Jimmy said, There are some tunnels we haven't explored yet. Let's have a look. Aretha looked at his companions. Very well. You take the lead, Jimmy. Let's backtrack to that cave with all the tunnels, then you pick a likely one and we'll see where it leads. In the third tunnel, they found the stairway leading down. Following it, they came to a large hallway, ancient from the look of the sediment upon the floor. Regarding it, Baru said, No foot has trod this hall in ages. Tapping the surface of the floor with his boot, Martin agreed. This is years of build-up. Jimmy led them along under giant vaulted arches from which hung dust-laden torch holders, long rusted to near uselessness. At the far end of the hall, they discovered a chamber. Rold inspected the giant iron hinges, now grotesquely twisted lumps of rust, barely recognisable, where once huge doors had hung. Whatever wanted to get through the door that was here didn't seem willing to wait. Passing through the portal, Jimmy halted. Look at this. They faced what seemed a large hall, with faint echoes of ancient grandeur. Tapestries, now little more than shredded rags with no hint of colour, hung along the walls. Their torches cast flickering shadows upon the walls, giving the impression that ancient memories were awakening after eons of sleep. What might have once been any number of recognisable things were now scattered piles of debris tossed about the hall. Splinters of wood, a twisted piece of iron, a single gold shard, all hinted at what might have once been, without revealing lost truths. The only intact object in the room was a stone throne atop a raised dais halfway along the right-hand wall. Martin approached and gently touched the centuries-old stone. Once a Valheru sat here. This was his seat of power. As if remembering a dream, all in the hall were visited with a sense of how alien this place was. Millennia gone, the power of the Dragon Lord was still a faint presence. There was no mistaking it now. Here they stood in the heart of an ancient race's legacy. This was a source of the Moradel dreams, one of the places of power along the dark path. Rold said, There's not much left. What caused this? Looters? The Dark Brotherhood? Martin looked about, as if seeing ages of history in the dust upon the walls. I don't think so. From what I know of ancient lore, this may have endured from the time of the Chaos Wars. He indicated the utter destruction. They fought on the backs of dragons. They challenged the gods, or so legends say. Little that witnessed that struggle survived. We will probably never know the truth. Jimmy had been scampering about the chamber, poking here and there. At last he returned and said, Nothing growing here. Then where is the silver thorn? Aretha asked bitterly. We have looked everywhere. Everyone was silent for a long minute. Finally, Jimmy said, Not everywhere. We've looked around the lake and... He waved his hand around the hall. Under the lake. But we ain't looked in the lake. In the lake? 
said Martin. Jimmy said, Carlin and Gelaine said it grew very close to the edge of the water. So had anyone thought to ask the elves if there have been heavy rains this year? Martin's eyes widened. The water level's risen. Anyone want to go swimming? asked Jimmy. Jimmy pulled his foot back. It's cold, he whispered. Martin said to Baru, Silly boy, he's 7,000 feet up in the mountains and he's surprised the lake's cold. Martin waded into the water slowly so as not to splash. Baru followed. Jimmy took a deep breath and followed, wincing every step as the water reached higher. When he stepped off a ledge, he plunged in up to his waist and opened his mouth in a silent gasp of pain. Upon the shore, Laurie winced in sympathy. Aretha and Rold kept watch for any sign of alarm on the bridge. All three crouched low, behind the gentle slope down to the water. The night was quiet, and most of the Moradel and human renegades slept on the far side of the bridge. They had decided to wait until the hours just before dawn. It was likely the guards would be half asleep if they were humans, and even Moradel were likely to make the assumption that nothing would occur just before sunrise. Faint sounds of movement in the water were followed by a gasp as Jimmy ducked his head underwater for the first time and came right up again. Gulping air, he ducked back under. Like the others, he worked blind, feeling along. Suddenly, his hand smarted as he stuck himself on something sharp among the moss-covered rocks. He came up with what seemed a noisy gasp, but nothing at the bridge indicated he was heard. Ducking under, he felt the slimy rocks. He located the thorny plant by sticking himself again, but he didn't jump out. He took two more punctures, getting a grip on the plant and pulling, but suddenly it came up. Breaking the surface, he whispered, I've got something. Grinning, he held up a plant that gleamed almost white in the light of the little moon. It looked like red berries stuck onto the branches of a rose branch with silver thorns. Jimmy turned it in appreciation. With a tiny ah of triumph, he said, I've got it. Martin and Baru waded over and inspected the plant. Is this enough? asked the Hadati. Aretha said, The elves never told us. Get some more if you can, but we wait only a few more minutes. Gingerly, he wrapped the plant in a cloth and stowed it in his pack. In ten minutes, they had found three more plants. Aretha was convinced this was enough and signalled it was time to return to the cave. Jimmy, Martin and Baru, dripping and chilled, hurried to the crevice and entered, with the others keeping watch. Inside the cave, Aretha looked a man reborn as he inspected the plants under the faint light of a small brand rolled held aloft. Jimmy couldn't keep his teeth from chattering as he grinned at Martin. Aretha couldn't take his eyes from the plant. He marvelled at the odd sensations that coursed through his body as he regarded the branches with their silver thorns, red berries and green leaves. For beyond the branches, in a place only he could see, he knew a soft laugh might be heard again, a soft hand might touch his face, and the embodiment of every happiness he had known might somehow be his again. Jimmy looked at Laurie. Damn me if I don't think we're going to do it. Laurie threw Jimmy his tunic. Now all we have to do is get back down. Aretha's head came up. Dress quickly. We leave at once. As Aretha breasted the rim of the canyon, Gelaine said, I was about to pull the ropes up again. You cut it fine, Prince Aretha. I thought it best to be down the mountain as soon as possible rather than wait another day. That I cannot argue, agreed the elf. Last night there was some argument between the chief of the renegades and the Moradel leaders. I couldn't get close enough to hear, but as the dark ones and humans don't get along very well, I judged this arrangement soon to end. If that happens, this Murad may decide to cease waiting and begin looking once more. Then we had best get as far from here as we can before light. 
Already the sky was turning grey as false dawn visited the mountains. Fortune was with them in part, for on this side of the mountains they would have shadows to hide within a while longer than had they faced the sunrise. It would only be a little help, but any was welcome. Martin, Baru and Rold were quickly up the ropes. Lorry struggled a little, not having the knack of climbing, a fact he had failed to mention to the others. With silent urging from his companions, he finally cleared the rim. Jimmy scampered quickly upwards. The morning light was growing. Jimmy feared being seen against the rock face of the canyon should anyone move from the bridge. In his haste, he became incautious and slipped on an outcropping, the toe of his boot skidding off the rock. He gripped the rope as he fell a few feet and grunted as he slammed into the face of the canyon. Then pain exploded along his side and he bit back a shout. Gasping silently for breath, he turned his back to the wall of the canyon. With a spasm of movement, he wrapped the rope under his left arm and gripped it tightly. Gingerly, he reached inside his tunic and felt the knife he had pilfered from the dead man. When dressing, he had hastily returned it to his tunic rather than place it in his pack as he should have done. Now, at least two inches of steel stuck in his side. Keeping his voice in control, he whispered, Pull me up! Jimmy nearly lost his grip with the first wave of pain that struck as they hauled the rope upwards. He slipped and gritted his teeth. Then he was over the rim. What happened? asked the prince. I got careless, answered the boy. Lift my tunic. Lorry did so and swore. Martin nodded at the boy who returned the gesture. Then he pulled the knife and Jimmy almost fainted. Martin cut a section of a cloak and bound the boy's side. He motioned to Laurie and Rold, who supported the boy between them, as they moved away from the canyon. As they hurried through the quickly brightening morning, Laurie said, You just couldn't do it the easy way, could you? They had managed to avoid detection while carrying Jimmy for the first half of the day. The Moradel still did not know Moralin had been invaded and looked outwards, awaiting the approach of those who now sought to escape. But now they watched a Moradel lookout. He sat perched upon the outcropping that had caused so much trouble getting past before and under which they must again pass. It was near noon and they huddled down inside a depression barely out of sight. Martin signalled to Gallane, asking if the elf wanted to move first or second. The elf moved out, letting Martin follow. The afternoon was still, the day lacking even the slight breeze that had covered small movements when they had passed three nights earlier. Now it took all the skill the elf and Martin possessed to move a scant twenty feet without alerting the sentry. Martin knocked an arrow and took aim over Gallane's shoulder. Gallane pulled his hunting knife and rose up beside the Moradel. Gallane tapped him on the shoulder. The dark elf spun at the unexpected contact and Gallane slashed his knife across his throat. The Moradel reared up and Martin's arrow took him in the chest. Gallane grabbed him about the knees, lowering him back to his sitting position. He twisted Martin's arrow, breaking it off rather than trying to pull out the barb. In only moments, the Moradel had been killed and still seemed at his post. Martin and Gallane ducked back down and faced the others. He'll be discovered in a few hours. They may think us on our way in and search above us first, but then they'll be down the mountain. Now we must fly. We've two days to the outer reaches of the elven forests if we don't stop. Come. They scrambled down the trail, Jimmy wincing as he was half carried by Laurie. If the horses are still there, muttered Rold. If they're not, said Jimmy weakly, at least it's all downhill. They stopped only to let the horses get the minimal rest they required to survive a cross-country run. It would be likely the animals would not be usable after the dash, but that couldn't be helped. Arthur would let nothing prevent his return now that he possessed the means for Anita's cure. Before, 
He had been a man on the edge of despair. Now a flame burned within, and he would let nothing extinguish it. Through the night they rode. Lathered, panting horses were led by exhausted riders down the woodland trail. They had entered deep forest, still in the foothills of the mountains, but close to the boundary of the elven forests. Jimmy was half-conscious from loss of blood, fatigue and pain. The wound had opened again sometime during the night, and he had been unable to do more than clutch his side. Then the boy's eyes rolled up, and he fell face down onto the trail. When he regained consciousness, he sat up, held by Lorry and Baru, while Martin and Rold wrapped him in fresh bandages, cut from Martin's cloak. "'This'll have to do until we reach Elvendor,' said Martin. Aretha said, "'If it opens again, say something. Gelaine, ride double with him, and don't let him fall off.' Once again they were in the saddle, and once again they endured the nightmare ride. Near sundown of the second day, the first horse faltered. Martin put it down quickly and said, I'll run for a while. For nearly three miles the Duke ran. Though the fatigued horse's pace was slower than normal, this was still an impressive feat. Baru took to the trail for a while, then Gelaine, but still they were reaching their limit. The horses were reduced to a loping canter and trotting. Then they could only walk. In silence they moved through the night, simply counting the passing yards as each minute took them closer to safety. Knowing that somewhere behind the mute Muradel captain and his black slayers followed. Near morning they crossed a small trail and Martin said, Here they must split forces, for they can't know we haven't turned east for Stone Mountain. Aretha said, Everyone dismount. They did, and the prince said, Martin, lead the horses towards Stone Mountain for a while, then turn them loose. We'll continue on foot. Martin did as he was bidden, while Baru masked the tracks of those on foot. Martin caught up with them an hour later. As he ran down a woodland trail towards them, he said, I think I heard something behind. I can't be sure. The wind is picking up and the noise was faint. Aretha said, We continue towards Elvendar, but keep alert for a defensible position. He started a stagger-legged run, and the others took off after him, Jimmy supported in part by Martin. For nearly an hour they half ran, half stumbled along, until the sounds of pursuit could be heard echoing through the woods. They felt a surge of energy as fear drove them onwards. Then Aretha pointed towards an outcropping of rock in a semicircle that formed an almost perfect natural breastwork. He asked Gelaine, how far until help? The elf studied the woods in the early morning light and said, We are near the edge of our forests. My people will be an hour away, perhaps two. Aretha quickly gave the elf the pack containing the silver thorn and said, Take Jimmy. We'll hold them here until you return. They all knew the pack was against the possibility the elf didn't return in time. At least Anita could still be cured. Jimmy sat down on the rock. Don't be ridiculous. I would double the time he'll take to find help. I can fight standing still better than I can run. With that, he crawled over the stone breastwork and pulled out his dirk. Aretha looked at the boy. Tired, bleeding again, almost collapsing from fatigue and blood loss, but grinning at him while holding his dirk. Aretha gave a curt nod and the elf was off. Quickly, they got behind the rocks, drew weapons and waited. For long minutes they huddled down behind the rocks, knowing that as each minute passed their chances of rescue increased. Almost with each breath they could feel rescue and obliteration racing towards them. Chance, as much as anything, would determine their survival. If Carlin and his warriors were waiting close to the edge of the forest and Gelaine could quickly locate them, there was hope. If not, no hope. In the distance, the sound of riders grew louder. 
Each moment passed slowly, each instant of possible discovery dragging by, and the agony of waiting increased. Then, in almost welcome relief, a shout was sounded, and the Moradel were upon them. Martin rose up, his bow already drawn by the time he had a target. The first Moradel to see them was propelled backwards out of his saddle by the force of the arrow taking him in the chest. Aratha and the others made ready. A dozen Moradel riders milled about, startled at the sudden bow fire. Before they could react, Martin had another down. Three turned and rode away, but the others charged. The outcropping reared up and spread out, making it impossible for the Moradel to overrun them, but they came at full gallop anyway, their horses' hooves making dull thunder upon the still damp ground. Though they rode close to the necks of their horses, two more were taken by Martin's bow before they reached the stone redoubt. Then the Moradel were upon them. Baru leapt atop the rocks, his long sword a blur as he sliced through the air. A Moradel fell, his arms severed from his body. Aratha ran up and jumped from the rocks, dragging a dark brother from the saddle. The Muradel died under his knife. He spun in place, his rapier coming from its sheath as another rider charged. The prince stood his ground until the last, then, with a sideways leap and a slash, unseated the rider. A quick thrust, and the Muradel died. Rold pulled one from his saddle, and they both slid down into the protection of the rocks. Jimmy waited as they rolled about. Then, when he saw an opening, another dark brother died as the boy used his dirk. The two remaining saw Laurie and Martin ready and chose to retreat. Both died as Martin's bows sang in the morning light. As soon as they were out of the saddle, Martin was over the rocks. He quickly scavenged the bodies and returned with a short bow and two quivers of arrows. I'm almost out he said, indicating his depleted quiver. These are no cloth-yard shafts, but I can use this little horse-bow if I need. Aratha looked about. There'll be more along soon. Do we run? asked Jimmy. No. We would only gain a little, and we might not find a place nearly as defensible. We wait. Minutes passed, and all waited with eyes turned towards the trail they knew the Moradel would use to attack them. Laurie whispered, Run, Gawain, run! For what seemed an eternity, the woods were silent. Then, in clouds of dust, with hooves pounding the ground, horsemen came into view. The giant mute Murad rode in the van, a dozen black slayers behind him. Other Murdel and human renegades followed. Murad reined in, signalling for the others to halt. Jimmy groaned. There's a hundred of them. Rold said, Not a hundred. More like thirty. Laurie said, That's enough. Aratha looked over the rock, saying, We may be able to hold for a few minutes. They all knew it was hopeless. Then Baru stood, and before anyone could prevent him, he started shouting at the Moradel in a language unknown to Jimmy, the Prince, and Martin. Laurie and Rold shook their heads. Aratha began to reach for the hillman, but Laurie said, Don't. He's challenging Murad to personal combat, a matter of honour. Will he accept? Rold shrugged. They're a funny lot. I have fought the Dark Brothers before. Some of them are cutthroat renegades, but most are caught up in honour and ritual and the like. Depends on where you find them. If that lot's a gang of moss troopers from North Yarbon, they'll simply attack. But if Murad's got a band of old-fashioned deep forest dark brothers under his command, they may not take kindly to him saying no. If he's trying to show some magic powers are backing him, he can't rightly refuse and keep their loyalty. But mostly... It depends on what Murad thinks about matters of honour. Whatever's the outcome, Baru's thrown them into confusion, observed Martin. Aratha could see the Moradel standing about while the mute stared impassively at Baru. 
Then Murad waved his hand towards Baru and the others. A Muradel in a cloak rode forward, turning his horse to face Murad, and said something in a questioning tone. The mute motioned again, and the Muradel who confronted him waved the other away. The Muradel riders, except for those wearing black armour, retreated their mount several yards. One of the humans rode up and turned his horse to face Murad. He shouted something at the Muradel leader, several other humans behind echoing the tones. Martin, said Aretha, can you make out what's being said? No, but whatever it is, it isn't flattering, that's for certain. Suddenly, Murad drew his own sword and struck the offending human. Another human shouted something and seemed ready to ride forward, but two Muradel rode to intercept him. With a sullen expression, the first brigand turned his horse and rode back to join the other humans. Murad again gestured towards the humans and charged his horse. Baru leapt from the rocks and ran a short way forward to take up position. He stood his ground, his sword drawn back to strike. As the horse was almost upon him, Baru lashed out with a circling step that took him from harm's way and the horse nickered in pain as it stumbled. The wounded animal went down. Murad, despite his bulk, rolled from the falling animal and came up sword still in hand. He was quick and turned in time to meet Baru's attack. The two combatants clashed, steel ringing on steel. Aratha looked about. The dozen black slayers waited quietly, though for how long Aratha did not know. With Murad involved in a matter of honour, they might wait until the issue was decided. The prince fervently hoped so. All eyes watched. Martin said, Don't let down your guard. As soon as this is over, either way, they'll hit us again. At least I can catch me breath, said Jimmy. Aratha surveyed the area. Twenty more Muradel were approaching the area. All Baru did was buy them time. Murad struck out and was struck in return. Within minutes, both combatants were a mass of bleeding wounds, testimony to how much each was able almost to deliver a death blow, but not quite. Cut and parry, lunge and riposte, slash and dodge, the struggle went on. The Hadati was equal in height to the Moradel, but the Dark Elf bulked larger. With a series of overhead clubbing blows, Murad began to drive Baru back. Martin brought his sword to the ready. Baru's tiring. It'll be over soon. But, like a dancer timing his moves to the music, Baru let Murad fall into a pattern. Up and down the sword rose and fell. Then, when it was rising, Baru ceased his retreat, instead stepping forward and to the side. With a sweeping cut, he sliced Murad's ribs. It was a deep cut that bled fiercely. That's a surprise, Martin said calmly. Damn fine move, said Roald in professional appreciation. But Murad didn't let the surprising blow finish him. He turned in place and grabbed the Hadati's sword arm. Murad was off balance, but he pulled Baru down with him. They grappled and rolled down the hill towards the rocks where Aratha stood. Weapons slid from blood-wet fingers, and the two combatants struck at each other with fists. Then they were up again, but Murad had his arms around Baru's waist. Hoisting the Hadati into the air, the Muradel placed interlocked hands in the small of Baru's back, squeezing to break his spine. Baru's head went back as he cried out in pain. Then he brought his hands together in a thunderous slap over the Muradel's ears, rupturing his eardrums. Murad gave a warbling, gurgling cry of pain as he dropped Baru. The creature covered his ears with his hands, blinded by pain for a moment. Baru reared back and struck the Muradel in the face with his fist, a staggering blow that pulped Murad's nose, broke some teeth and split his lip. Again, Baru struck him in the face, jerking his head back. And again. The Hadati seemed on the verge of clubbing the Muradel to death, but Murad gripped Baru's wrist and pulled him down and again they rolled upon the ground. 
Then Murad was atop Baru, and each had his hands around the other's neck. With grunts of pain and exertion, the two began choking each other. Jimmy reached down and took a dagger from the body of the dead Muradel at his feet to supplement his dirk. Martin said, Soon. Soon. Murad bore down with all his weight, his face turning red, as did Baru's. Neither could breathe, and it was only a question of who succumbed first. Baru bore the bulk of the Muradel atop him, but Murad had a deep wound in his side which still bled, weakening him as every second passed. Then, with a grunt and sigh, Murad fell forwards onto Baru. There was silence in the woods for a long moment before Murad moved. With a roll, he fell over, off Baru. The Hadati slowly rose, taking a knife from the Muradel's own belt. He slowly cut Murad's throat. Sitting back upon his heels, Baru breathed deeply. Then, with deliberate contempt for his own danger, he plunged his knife deep into Murad's chest. "'What's he doing?' asked Rold. Martin said, "'Remember what Tathar said about the Black Slayers. "'He's cutting Murad's heart out, "'just in case he might try to rise again.' More Moradel and Renegades had joined the company overlooking the combat, and now more than fifty riders watched the Hadati butcher the Moradel chieftain. The Hadati cut down into the chest, then his hand plunged deep within the wound, and, with a single jerk, he pulled Murad's heart free. Holding his hand up so that all might see, he showed the assembled Mordel and humans that Murad's heart beat no longer. Then he tossed it aside and rose drunkenly to his feet. With a staggering, wobbling run, he tried for the rocks only ten yards away. A Moradel rider moved to strike him from the side, and Jimmy threw his dagger. The point took the creature in the eye, causing him to scream as he fell back out of the saddle. But another came at Baru and cut at him. The sword took him in the side, and the Hadati fell forward. Damn you! shouted Jimmy, near tears. He won! You could have let him come back! He threw his dirk, but the other rider dodged. The Muradel who had struck Baru stiffened and turned, and Aratha and his companion saw an arrow in his back. Another Muradel shouted something as he put away his bow. This brought an angry shout from a third and one of the humans. What's all this? asked Aratha. Rold said, The one who killed Baru is a renegade, no honour. That fellow on the horse seems to have had the same opinion as Jimmy. The Hadati won. He should have been allowed to return to die with his companions. Now the Slayer, another renegade, and the human bandits are all shouting at one another. We might gain a little time, or at least have some of them quit, now that their big chieftain is dead. Then the Black Slayers charged. Martin reared up and began firing. The archer's speed was phenomenal, and three riders were unhorsed before they reached the rock abutment. Steel clashed upon steel, and the battle was joined. Rold leapt atop the rock, as had Baru before, and his sword also struck out at all who came within his reach. No Moradel could ride in close enough to strike him with their short swords, while his broadsword delivered death to whoever rode within reach. Aratha parried a blow aimed at Lorry, then struck upwards from a crouch to take a rider. Rold leapt and dragged one from the saddle and clubbed him with the hilt of his sword. Seven Moradel died before the others withdrew. Aratha said, They didn't all charge. The others could see that some of the Moradel had held back and others were still arguing along with two human renegades. A few of the Black Slayers were still mounted, and they were ignoring what transpired with their companions, forming for another charge. Jimmy liberated another dagger from a Moradel just at the edge of the rocks, then noticed something. He tugged at Martin's sleeve. See that ugly-looking fellow with a fancy red breastplate and all those gold rings and things? 
Martin saw such a one sitting at the head of the human riders. Yes. Can you kill him now? It's a difficult shot. Why? Because as sure as there's elves in the woods, that's rights. He's captain of the band of outlaws. You knock him off and the others will most likely run away or at least keep holding back until a new captain's elected. Martin rose up, took aim and let fly. The shaft sped between the boles of the trees and took the indicated rider in the throat. With a snap, his head came up and he somersaulted backwards out of his saddle. Amazing, said Jimmy. Martin said, I had to clear the top of that breastplate. Laurie said dryly, not very sporting, shooting without warning. You may convey my apologies, said Martin. I forgot you singers always have the heroes acting that way in your sagas. If we're the heroes, said Jimmy, the outlaws should run away. True to Jimmy's prediction, the human renegades began muttering among themselves and were suddenly riding away. One Moradel shouted after them angrily, then waved another attack upon the prince's party. Another Moradel spat on the ground before the first and turned his horse, motioning some companions away as well. Twenty or so rode after the humans. Aratha counted. Fewer than twenty this time, and the slayers. The riders dismounted, including those who had held back during the previous attack. They had discovered they couldn't close in to the rocks while on horseback. They ran close, using the trees as cover, and fanned out to surround Aratha's position. Rold said, This is what they should have done the first time. They're a little slow, but not entirely stupid, commented Laurie. Jimmy clutched his dagger as the Dark Brothers charged. I'd have preferred stupidity. The Moradel came in a wave, and suddenly there was fighting on all sides. Jimmy leapt away as a sword came crashing down from above. He thrust upwards with his dagger and took the Moradel in the stomach. Rold and Laurie battled back to back, surrounded by Dark Brothers. Martin shot until he was out of arrows when he grabbed up the Moradel bow and arrows. His firing was rapid and accurate, and a dozen more Dark Brothers were struck before he dropped the bow and pulled his sword. Aratha fought like a man possessed, his rapier delivering injury at every quarter. No Moradel could get close and remain free of wounds. But the prince knew time would eventually win. The defenders would fatigue and slow and then they would die. Aratha could feel the strength drain from his arms as the certainty of death came to him. There was little point in hoping. There were more than twenty Moradel still standing, and they were but five. Martin hewed with his sword, cutting all who came before him. Rold and Lorry lunged and parried, giving up only inches, but slowly being worn down by the attackers. A Moradel leapt over the stone breastwork and spun to face Jimmy. Jimmy acted without hesitation, his stiff side slowing him only slightly. He lashed out and sliced the Moradel's hand, causing it to drop its sword. The Dark Brother yanked its belt knife loose as Jimmy slashed again, but the Moradel leapt back, avoiding the boy's cut. Then it closed and was upon Jimmy. The boy slashed wildly, losing his balance and his knife, and the Moradel was atop him. A knife blade came rushing towards the boy's face, but he dodged it and it struck rock. Jimmy gripped at the creature's wrist, holding the blade away. The blade came towards his face, for the weakened boy could not hold back the Moradel's superior strength. Then the Moradel's head snapped backwards, and Jimmy could see a knife drawn across the Dark Elf's throat, leaving a bloody track. The Moradel was pulled off by the hand gripping his hair. Then the hand was extended to Jimmy. Gulain stood over the boy and helped him to his feet. Stunned, Jimmy looked about. Hunting horns sounded in the forests, and the air was filled with arrows. The Moradel retreated before the attacking elves. Martin and Aratha dropped their weapons, slumping in exhaustion. Rold and Lorry collapsed where they stood. Carlin ran towards them, directing his elven warriors in pursuit. Aratha looked up, relief bringing tears unbidden to his eyes. 
In a hoarse voice, he said, Is it over? Carlin said, It is, Aretha, for a while. They'll be back, but by then we will all be safely within the boundary of our forests. Unless they plan invasion, the Muradil will not cross that border. Our magic is still too strong there. An elf leant over the body of Baru. Carlin! This one still lives! Martin lay back on the rocks, panting. That Hadati is tough. Aretha waved away Gawain's hand as he stood, his legs feeling like water. How far? Less than a mile. We need only to cross a small stream and we are in our forests. Slowly, the survivors of the attack felt a lifting of their hopelessness, for they knew their chances now were excellent. With the elven escort, it would be unlikely the Moradel would muster enough strength to overwhelm them, even should they mount another attack. And with Murad dead, it was likely their leadership would crumble. From the behaviour of many of the Dark Brothers, it was clear he had been of major importance to them. His death would surely weaken Mamandamus's plans for some time. Jimmy hugged himself, wondering at the chill he felt, for suddenly he was returned to the moment he stood in the cave at Morolin. He felt the strange dislocation in time and knew where he had experienced that chill before, twice before, in the palace and in the cellar of the House of Willows. He felt the hair on the back of his neck stand on end and knew with dread certainty that some magic was being visited upon them. He leapt away from the rock and looked about the glade. Pointing, he shouted, Then we'd better start now. Look! The body of a black slayer began to move. Martin said, Can we cut their hearts out? Too late, cried Lorry. They're armoured and we should have acted at once. A dozen black slayers were slowly rising and turning to face Aretha's party, weapons in hand. With tentative steps, they began to advance upon the prince. Carlin shouted orders, and elves grabbed up the near-exhausted and wounded men. Two carried Baru between them, and they started to run. The dead warriors staggered after, their wounds still bleeding, and, as they moved, their movements smoothed out, as if some agency was perfecting its control over them. With increasing speed, the undead followed. Elven bowmen ran, halted, turned, and fired to no effect. The shafts struck the dead Moradel and would rock them, knocking a few to the ground, but they would only rise again. Jimmy looked back, and somehow the view of these creatures running through the bright morning light in the lovely forests was far more horrible than anything he had seen at the palace or in the sewers of Crondor. Their movements were surprisingly smooth as they ran after, weapons at the ready. Those elves carrying the injured and fatigued humans kept running while Carlin ordered others to slow the Moradel. Elven warriors drew swords and engaged the undead creatures, after a few parries, they would retreat. The rear guard slowed the Black Slayers, but they could not be halted. The elves worked themselves into a pattern. They would turn, fight, retreat a little, fight again, then flee. But the inability to visit harm on their foes served only to delay these, not to end their threat. Panting, fatigued elves laboured to halt an inexorable flood. After several minutes, the humans were being half-carried, half-dragged across a small stream. Carlin said, We enter our forests. Here we will stand. The elves drew swords and waited. Aretha, Martin, Lorry and Rold readied weapons and waited. The first Moradel entered the water, sword in hand, splashing towards them. He reached the shore as an elf made ready to strike. But the moment the undead creature placed his foot upon the shore, it seemed to sense something behind the elves. The elf struck it to no effect, but the dead black slayer staggered back, raising its hands as if seeking protection. Suddenly, a rider sped past the defenders, 
a figure resplendent in white and gold. Upon the back of a white elf steed, a legendary mystic horse of Elvendar, Tomas charged the Moradel. The elf steed reared, and Tomas leapt down from its back and, with a golden arc of his sword, nearly split the Black Slayer in twain. Like a raging flame incarnate, Tomas sped along the shore, visiting destruction upon each Black Slayer as they set foot across the stream. Despite their arcane origin, each was helpless before the combined might of his arm and Valheru power. Several managed single blows, which he easily turned aside, answering with terrible swiftness. His golden sword lashed out, and black armour was cracked as if little more than brittle hide. But none of the undead sought to flee. Each came on, and each was quickly dispatched. Of those with Aratha, only Martin alone had seen Tomas in battle before, and even he had never seen such a display. Soon it was over, and only Tomas stood upon the edge of the stream. Then came the sound of more horses. Aratha looked behind and saw more elf steeds approaching, ridden by Tathar and the other spell weavers. Tathar said, Greetings, Prince of Krondor. Aratha looked up and smiled weakly. Thanks to you all. Tomas resheathed his sword and said, I could not travel with you, but once these dared cross the boundaries of our forests, I could act. Elvendar is mine to preserve. Any who dares invade will be treated as these. To Carlin he said, Build a funeral pyre. Those black demons shall never rise again. And he said to the others, When it is done, we shall return to Elvendar. Jimmy fell back upon the grass of the stream bank, his body too sore and tired to move. Within moments he was asleep. They feasted the next night. Queen Aglarana and Prince Tomas hosted Aratha and his companions. Gawain approached where Martin and Aratha sat and said, Baru will live. Our healer says he's the toughest human he's seen. How long before he's up again? asked Aratha. A long time, said Gawain. You'll have to leave him with us. By rights he should have died an hour before we got here. He's lost a lot of blood and some of those cuts are severe. Murad almost crushed his spine and his windpipe. But other than that, he'll be as good as new, said Rold across the table. Laurie said, When I get home to Carline, I promise never to leave again. Jimmy came to sit next to the prince. You look thoughtful for one who's pulled off the impossible. I thought you'd be happy. Aratha ventured a smile. I won't be until Anita is cured. When do we ride home? We go to Criddy in the morning. The elves will escort us there. Then we take ship to Crondor. We should be back in time for the festival of Banapis, if Mamandamus can't find me with his magic. A ship should be safe enough. Unless you'd prefer riding back the way we came. Jimmy said, not likely. There might be still more of those black slayers about. I'll take drowning over another running with them any time. Martin said, it will be good to see Criddy again. I'll have much to see to getting my house in order. Old Samuel will be at his wit's end with the estate management, though I'm sure the Baron Bellamy has done well enough running things in my absence. But there will be much to do before we leave. Leave for where? said Aratha. In an innocent tone, Martin said, Why? For Crondor, of course. But his gaze travelled northwards, and silently he echoed his brother's thoughts. Up there was Mamandamus, and a battle yet unjoined. The issue was not decided, only the first skirmish. With the death of Murad, the forces of the darkness had lost a captain, had been pushed back, retiring in disorder, but they were not vanquished, and they would return, if not tomorrow, then some other day. Aratha said, Jimmy, 
you have acted with wit and bravery beyond what is required of a squire. What reward shall you have? Biting a large rib of elk, the boy replied, Well, you still need a Duke of Crondor. Chapter 19 Continuation The riders reined in. Staring upwards, they studied the mountain tops that marked the boundary of their lands, the great peaks of the high wall. For two weeks, twelve riders had picked their way through the mountains until they had journeyed beyond the normal limits of Surani patrols, above the timber line. They moved slowly through a pass it had taken days to locate. They were seeking something no Surani had searched for in ages, a way through the high wall into the northern tundra. It was cold in the mountains, an alien experience for most of the riders, except those who had served on Midkemia during the years of the Rift War. To the younger soldiers of the Shinzawai household guard, this cold was a strange and almost frightening thing. But they showed no sign of their discomfort, except to absently draw their cloaks more tightly about their shoulders as they studied the odd whiteness on the peaks, hundreds of feet yet above their heads. They were Tsurani. Pug, still in the black robes of a great one, turned to his companion. A short way from here, I think, Hokanu. The young officer nodded and signalled his patrol forward. For weeks the younger son of the Lord of the Shinzawai had led this escort beyond the limits of the Empire's northern borders. Following the river Gargajin to its highest source, a nameless lake in the mountains, the hand-picked warriors had passed the trails followed by patrols of the Empire of Suraruani. Here were the wild, rock-strewn, seemingly desolate lands between the Empire and the tundra of the north, home of the Thyun nomads. Even with a great one in attendance, Hokanu felt vulnerable. Should a Thyun tribe be migrating nearby when they came out of the mountains, there would be a score or more of their young warriors running as flankers, seeking any excuse to take a Surani head as a trophy. They rounded a bend in the trail, and a narrow gap in the mountains provided a glimpse of the lands beyond. For the first time they could see the vast expanse of the tundra. Vaguely perceived in the distance, a long, low, white barrier could be made out. What is that? said Pug. Hokanu shrugged, his face an implacable Surani mask. I do not know, Great One. I suspect it is another range of mountains across the tundra. Or perhaps it is that thing you described, the Wall of Ice. A glacier? Hokanu said... Whatever, it lies to the north, where you said the Watchers may be. Pug looked behind him at the ten silent riders. Then he asked, How far? Hokanu laughed. Farther than we can ride in another month without starving. We shall have to stop to hunt. I doubt there is a great deal of game about. More than one would think, Great One. The Thun struggle to reach their traditional southern ranges every winter, the lands we have held for over a thousand years, but they still somehow survive the winters here. Those of us who have wintered on your world know how to forage in snow country. There will be creatures like your rabbits and deer once we drop back down below the timber line. We shall survive. Pug weighed his choices. After a moment of silent consideration, he said, I don't think so, Hakanu. You may be right, but if what I hope to find is only a legend, then we shall have all come for no good reason. I may return to your father's home by my arts, and I could manage to take a few of you with me, three or even four, but the rest... No, I think it is time for a parting. Hakanu began to object for his father had ordered him to protect Pug, but Pug wore the black robe. Your will, great one, he signalled to his men. Pass up half your food, he said to Pug. There will be enough here to keep you fed for a few more days if you eat sparingly, great one. 
When the food had been gathered in two large travel bags and hung behind Pug's saddle, Hokanu motioned his men to wait. The magician and the officer rode forward a short way, and the son of the Shinzawai said, "'Great one, I have given thought to the warning you bring and your quest.' He seemed to find it difficult to speak his mind. "'You have brought much into my family's life, not all of it good, but, like my father, I have always believed you to be a man of honour, one without guile.' If you believe this legendary enemy to be the cause behind all the troubles on your homeworld you have spoken of, and if you think it about to find your world and ours, I must also believe. I admit to fear, Great One. I am ashamed. Pug shook his head. There is no shame, Hokanu. The enemy is something beyond any of our understanding. I know you think it a thing of legend, something spoken of when you were a small boy and your teachers began to instruct you in the history of the Empire. Even I, who have seen it in mystic vision, even I do not fathom it, save to count it the greatest threat to our worlds imaginable. No, Hokanu, there is no shame. I fear its coming. I fear its power and its madness, for it is a thing mindless in rage and hate. I doubt the sanity of any who did not fear it. Okanu lowered his head in agreement, then looked the magician in the eyes. Melamba, Pug, I thank you for the ease you brought to my father. He spoke of the message Pug had carried from Kasumi. May the gods of both worlds watch over you, great one. He bowed his head as a sign of respect, and then silently turned his mount around. In a short while, Pug sat alone atop the pass through which no Tsurani had ridden in ages. Below him lay the forests of the north slope of the high wall, and beyond them the ranges of the Thun. And beyond the tundra? A dream, or legend perhaps. The alien creatures seen briefly in a vision each magician endured as he passed his final testing for the black robe. Those creatures known only as the Watchers. It was Pug's hope they possessed some knowledge of the enemy, some knowledge that might prove the difference in the coming battle. For as Pug sat atop his tired mount on the windswept heights of the greatest mountains on Kelowan's largest continent, he was certain some great struggle had begun, a struggle that could mean the destruction of two worlds. Pug urged his horse forward, and the animal began moving downwards towards the tundra and the unknown. Pug pulled back on the reins. Since leaving Hokanu's patrol, he had seen nothing in the hills as he rode down towards the tundra. Now, a day out of the foothills, a band of Thun was speeding to meet him. The centaur-like creatures hooted their battle songs as they ran, their powerful hooves beating the tundra in rhythmic concussion. But... Unlike the legendary centaur, the upper portion of this creature looked as if some form of lizard had grown to man's shape above the torso of a heavy horse or mule. Like all other native life forms on Kelowan, they were hexapedal, and as with the other intelligent native race, the insectoid Choja, the upper limbs had developed into arms. Unlike humans, they had six fingers. Pug waited quietly until the Thun were almost upon him. Then he erected a mystic barrier and watched as they crashed into it. The Thun were all large warrior males, though Pug couldn't really imagine what a female of the species must look like. Still, these creatures, for all their alien appearance, acted as Pug would have expected young human warriors to act under the same circumstance, confused and angry. Several beat ineffectively against the barrier, while the others retreated a short way off to observe. Then Pug removed the cape the Shinzawai lord had given him for the journey. Through the haze of the mystic barrier, one of the young Thuns saw him wearing the black robe and shouted to his companions. They turned and fled. For three days they followed him at a respectful distance. Some ran off, and, for a time, those remaining were joined by other Thun. 
This leaving and returning with Sumthun always behind him continued unabated. At night, Pug erected a circle of protection about himself and his mount, and when he awoke next morning, the Thun still watched. Then, on the fourth day, the Thun finally made peaceful contact. A single Thun trotted towards him, awkwardly holding his hands above his head, palms together in the Surani Pali sign. Pug could see as he came up to him that they had sent an elder. Honours to your tribe, said Pug, hoping the creature could speak Surani. An almost human chuckle answered, Eh, for status, black one, never honour have man given to me. The speech was heavily accented but understandable, and the strange Saurian features were surprisingly expressive. The Thun was unarmed, but old scars showed it had once been a powerful warrior. Now age had robbed it of much of its vigour. Pug expressed a suspicion. You are the sacrifice. My life is yours to take. Bring down your sky fire, if that is your wish. But not, I think, your wish. Again the chuckle. Black ones that you have faced, and why a one near the age of living should you take, when sky fire can a whole band burn? No, you move for purposes your own, do you not? Troubling those soon left to face the ice hunters, the pack killers, a purpose of yours is not? Pug studied the Thun. He was almost at the day when he would be too old to keep pace with the moving band, when the tribe would abandon him to the predators of the tundra. Your age brings wisdom. I have no contention with the Thun. I simply seek to pass to the north. <laughs> Thun! A Surani word. We are Lasura, the people. Black ones I have a sin. You a troublesome lot. Fight almost one, then black ones sky fire bring. Surani fight bravely, and Surani head a great trophy is. But black ones, leaving Lasura in peace, your business usually is not. Why our ranges seek you to cross? There is a grave danger, from ages long gone. It is a danger to all on Kelawan, to Thun as well as Tsurani. I think there are those who may know how that danger may be met. Those who live high in the ice, he pointed to the north. The old warrior reared up like a startled horse, and Pug's own mount shied away. Then... Mad, black one, northwards go. Death waits there. Find that out you shall. Those who in the ice live, none welcome, and the Lasura no contest with madmen seek. Those who do a mad one harm are by the gods harm done. Touched by the gods you are. He dashed off. Pug felt both relief and fear. For the Thun to know those who live in the ice showed there was a chance the Watchers were neither fiction nor long vanished into the past. But the Thun's warning caused him to fear for his mission. What waited for him high in the ice of the north? Pug moved away as the Thun band vanished over the horizon. Winds blew down off the ice and he pulled his cloak about him. Never had he felt this alone. More weeks had passed, and the horse had died. It was not the first time Pug had subsisted on horse meat. Pug used his arts to transport himself short distances, but mostly he walked. Vagueness about time disturbed him more than any danger. He had no sense of the enemy's imminent attack. For all he knew, the enemy might need years to actually enter mid -Kemia. Whatever else, he knew it couldn't still possess the power it displayed in the vision of the time of the Golden Bridge, otherwise it would have swept into mid -Kemia and no power on the planet could have stopped it. Pug's routine became dully monotonous as he continued northwards. 
He would walk until he topped some slight rise and would fix his vision on a distant point. With concentration, he could transport himself there, but it was tiring and a little dangerous. Fatigue dulled the mind, and any mistake in the spell used to gather the energy needed to move him could cause him harm or even kill him. So he would walk until he felt sufficiently alert and at a place conducive to such spell casting. Then, one day, he had seen something strange in the distance. An odd feature seemed to rear up above the icy cliff. It appeared vague, too far away to be seen clearly. He sat down. There was a spell of far seeing, one used by magicians of the lesser path. He remembered it as if he had read it a moment before, a faculty of his mind that had somehow been enhanced by his torture by the warlord, and the odd spell fashioned to keep him from his magic. But he lacked the strenuous stimulation, the fear of death, that had allowed him to use a lesser magic, and he could not cause the spell to work for him. Sighing, he stood, and began again to trudge northwards. For three days he had seen the ice spire rising high into the sky above the leading edge of a great glacier. Now he trudged up to a high rise and gauged his distance. Transporting himself without a known location, a pattern to focus his mind upon, was dangerous unless he could see his destination. He picked a small outcropping of rock before what seemed to be an entrance and encanted a spell. Suddenly, he stood before what was clearly a door into an ice tower, fashioned by some arcane art. At the door appeared a robed figure. It moved silently and with grace and was tall, but nothing of its features could be seen in the deep dark of its hood. Pug waited and said nothing. The Thun were obviously frightened of these creatures, and while Pug had little fear for himself... A blunder could cost him the only source of aid he could think of to help stem the enemy. Still, he was ready to defend himself instantly if necessary. As winds whipped snowflakes in swirls about him, the robed figure motioned for Pug to follow and turned back into the door. Pug hesitated a moment, then followed the robed figure into the spire. Inside the spire were stairs, carved into its walls. The spire itself seemed to be fashioned from ice, but somehow there was no cold here. In fact, the spire seemed almost warm after the bitter wind of the tundra. The stairs led up, towards the pinnacle of the spire, and down into the ice. The figure was vanishing down the stairs, almost out of sight when Pug entered. Pug followed. They descended what seemed an impossible distance, as if their destination lay far below the glacier. When they halted, Pug was certain they were many hundreds of feet below the surface. At the bottom of the stairs they came to a large door, fashioned from the same warm ice as the walls. The figure moved through the door, and again Pug followed. What he saw on the other side caused him to halt, dumbfounded. Below the mighty edifice of ice, in the frozen wastes of the Arctic of Kelowan, was a forest. Moreover, it was a forest like none upon Kelowan, and Pug's heart raced as he beheld mighty oaks and elms, ash and pine. Dirt, not ice, lay under his boots, and all around a soft, gentle light was diffused by the green branches and bowers. Pug's guide pointed towards a path and again took the lead. Deep in the forest, they came to a large clearing. Puck had never seen the like of the sight before him, but he knew there was another place, a far distant place that looked much as this did. In the centre of the clearing, gigantic trees rose with mighty platforms erected amid them, connected by roads upon the backs of branches. Silver, white, gold and green leaves all seemed to glow with mystic light. Pug's guide raised his hands to his hood and slowly lowered it. Pug's eyes widened in wonder, for before him stood a creature unmistakable to one reared upon Midkemia. 
Pug's expression was one of open disbelief, and he was nearly speechless. Before him stood an old elf, who, with a slight smile, said, Welcome to Elvardane, Milamba of the Assembly. Or would you prefer to be called Pug of Critty? We have been expecting you. I prefer Pug, he half whispered. He was able to muster up only a shred of his composure, so shocked was he to find Midkemia's second most ancient race living among this impossible forest, deep in the ice of an alien planet. What is this place? Who are you, and how did you know I was coming here? We know many things, son of Criddy. You are here because it is time for you to face that greatest of terrors, what you call the enemy. You are here to learn. We are here to teach. Who are you? The elf motioned Pug towards a gigantic platform. There is much you must learn. A year shall you abide with us, and when you leave, you will come to power and understanding you only glimpse now. Without that teaching, you will not be able to survive the coming battle. With it, you may save two worlds. Nodding, as Pug moved forwards, the elf fell in beside him. We are a race of elven kind long vanished from Midkemia. We are the eldest race of that world, servants to the Valheru, those whom men call the Dragon Lords. Long ago did we come to this world, and for reasons you shall learn we chose to abide here. We watch for the return of that which has brought you to us. We prepare against the day we see the return of the enemy. We are the Eldar. Stunned by this, Pug could only wonder. Silently, he entered the twin of the City of Elves, Elvendar, the place deep in the ice that the Eldar had called Elvardane. Aratha strode down the hall. Liam walked at his side. Behind them hurried Volney, Father Nathan and Father Tully, Fanon, Gardan and Kasumi, Jimmy and Martin, Rold and Dominic, Laurie and Carline, all followed in a pack. The prince still had on the stained and tattered travel clothing he had worn on the ship from Criddy. They had had a fast and blessedly uneventful journey. Two guards still waited without the room Pug had ensorcelled. Aratha motioned for them to open the door. When it was open, he waved them aside and, with the hilt of his sword, he smashed the seal as Pug had instructed. The prince and the two priests hurried to the princess's bedside. Liam and Volney kept the rest outside. Nathan opened the vial containing the curative fashioned by the elven spellweavers. As instructed, he poured a drop upon Anita's lips. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the princess's lips flickered. Her mouth moved and she licked the drop from her lips. Tully and Aratha held her up. Nathan raised the vial to her mouth and poured. She drank it all. Before their eyes, colour returned to Anita's cheeks. As Aratha knelt at her side, her eyes fluttered and opened. She turned her head slightly and said, Aratha, in almost a silent whisper. Her hand gently came and touched his cheek as tears of thanks ran unashamedly down his face. He took her hand and kissed it. Then Liam and the others were in the room. Father Nathan rose and Tully barked, Only a minute now. She has to rest. Liam laughed his loud, happy laugh. <laughs> Listen to him. Tully, I'm still the king. Tully said, They may make you Emperor of Kesh, King of Queg, and Grand Master of the Brothers of the Shield of Dala as well, for all I care. To me, you'll always be one of my less gifted students. A moment. Then out you go. He turned away, but, as with the others, 
His face was wet. The Princess Anita looked around at all the smiling faces and said, What happened? She sat up and with a wince said, Oh, I hurt. Then smiled an embarrassed smile. Aretha, what did happen? All I remember was turning to you at the wedding. I'll explain later. You rest and I'll see you again soon. She smiled and yawned, covering her mouth. Excuse me, but I am sleepy. She snuggled down and was soon asleep. Tully began shooing them from the room. Outside, Liam said, Father, how soon before we can finish this wedding? In a few days, said Tully. The restorative powers of that mixture are phenomenal. Two weddings, said Carline. Liam said, I, I was going to wait until we returned to Rilanon. Not on your best horse's rump, snapped Carline. I'm taking no chances. Well, your grace, said the king to Lorry, I guess it's been decided. Lorry said, Your grace. With a laugh and a wave as he walked away, Liam said, Of course, didn't she tell you? I can't have any sister married to a commoner. I'm naming you Duke of Salador. Lorry looked more shaken than before. Come along, love, said Carline, taking him by the hand. You'll survive. Aretha and Martin laughed, and Martin said, Have you noticed the peerage has been going to hell lately? Aretha turned to Roald. You were in this for gold, but my thanks go beyond mere gold. A bonus you shall have. Volney? This man is to have a bag of a hundred gold sovereigns, our agreed-upon price. Then he is to have ten times that as bonus, and then another thousand for thanks. Roald grinned. You are generous, Highness. And, if you'll accept, you're welcome to be my guest here as long as you wish. You might even find it in your heart to consider joining my guard. I've a captaincy about to open. Roald saluted. Thanks. But no, Your Highness, I've thought of late it was time to settle down, especially after this last business, but I have no ambitions to enlist. Then feel free to guest with us as long as you desire. I'll instruct the royal steward to prepare a suite for your use. With a grin, Roald said, My thanks, Highness. Gardan said, does that remark about a new captaincy mean I'm finally done with this duty and can return to Criddy with his grace? Aretha shook his head. Sorry, Gardan. Sergeant Valdis will become captain of my guard, but no retirement for you yet. From those reports of pugs you brought from Stardock, I'm going to need you around. Liam is about to name you Knight Marshal of Crondor. Kasumi clapped Gardan upon the back. "'Congratulations, Marshal!' Gardan said, "'But!' Jimmy cleared his throat in expectation. Aretha turned and said, "'Yes, Squire?' "'Well, I thought... "'You had something to ask?' Jimmy looked from Aretha's face to Martin's. "'Well, I, I just thought, as long as you were passing out rewards...' "'Oh, yes, of course.' Turning... Aretha spotted one of the squires and shouted, Locklear! The young squire came running to bow before his prince. Highness! Escort squire Jimmy back to Master de Lacey and inform the master of ceremonies that Jimmy is now senior squire. Jimmy grinned as he and Locklear walked away. He seemed about to say something, then thought better of it and followed Locklear. Martin put his hand on Aretha's shoulder. Keep an eye on that boy. He seriously means to be Duke of Crondor some day. Aretha said, Damn me if he just might not do it. Epilogue Retreat The Muradel silently raged. To the three chieftains before him, he betrayed no hint of his anger. They were leaders of the most important lowland confederations. 
As they approached, he knew what they would say before it was spoken. He listened patiently, the light from the large bonfire before his throne casting a flicker across his chest, giving the illusion of movement to the birthmark dragon there. Master, said the centermost chieftain, my warriors grow restless. They chafe and they complain. When shall we invade the Southlands? The Pantathian hissed, but a restraining gesture from the leader quieted him. Mermandamus sat back in his throne and silently brooded on his setback. His finest general lay dead, irretrievable even to those powers at his command. The balking clans of the north were demanding action, while the mountain clans were drifting away by the day, confounded by Murad's death. Those who had come from the southern forests whispered among themselves of travelling the lesser passes back into the lands of men and dwarves, seeking to return to their homelands in the foothills near the Green Heart and among the highland meadows of the Grey Towers. Only the hill clans and the black slayers remained steadfast, and they were too small a force despite their ferocity. No, the first battle had been lost. The chieftains before him demanded some promise, some sign or portent to reassure their nervous alliances before old feuds erupted. Mamandmus knew he could hold the armies here for only a few more weeks without marching. This far north, there were only two short months of warm weather left before the fall, then quickly the harsh northern winter would strike. If war was not forthcoming to bring booty and plunder, the warriors would soon need to return to their homes. Finally, Mermandamus spoke. Oh, my children, the auguries are not in fruition. Pointing above, to stars seen faintly against the glare of the camp's fires, he continued, The cross of fire heralds only the beginning, but we have not reached the time. Cathos says the fourth bloodstone is not yet properly aligned. The lowest star will be in proper position at the summer solstice next year. We cannot hurry the stars. Inwardly, he raged at the dead Murad for having failed him in so critical a mission. We trusted our fate to one who acted too swiftly, who may have been uncertain in his resolve. The chieftains exchanged glances. All knew Murad as one above reproach in visiting destruction on the hated humans. As if reading their minds, Mamandamus said, For all his might, Murad underestimated the Lord of the West. That is why this human is to be feared, why he must be destroyed. With his death, the way south becomes open, for then shall we visit destruction upon all who oppose our will. Standing, he said, But the time is not yet. We shall wait. Send home your warriors. Let them prepare against winter. But carry forth the word. Let all the tribes and clans gather here next summer. Let the confederations march with the sun when it again begins its journey south. For next midsummer's day, the Lord of the West shall die. His voice rose in volume. We were tested against the powers of our forefathers and found wanting. We were judged guilty of failing in our resolve. We shall not again so fail. He struck fist to palm, his voice rising to a near shriek. In a year's time, we shall bring forth the news that the hated Lord of the West is destroyed. Then shall we march, and we shall not march alone. We shall call our servants, the goblins, the mountain trolls, the land-striding giants. All shall come to serve us. We shall march. 
hearts into human lands and burn their cities. I shall erect my throne upon a mountain of their bodies. Then all my children shall we spill blood. Mermandamus gave permission for the chieftains to withdraw. This year's campaign was at an end. Mermandamus signalled to his guards to attend him as he swept past the crooked form of the serpent priest. Silently, he brooded upon Murad's death and the loss that death had caused. The cross of fire would look much as it did now for the next year and a bit more, so the lie about the configuration would hold. But time was now an enemy. A winter would be spent in preparation and remembrance. No, this defeat would rankle as the freezing nights of winter slowly passed, but those nights would see the birth of another plan, which would bring the death of the Lord of the West, he who was the bane of darkness. And with that death, the onslaught against the nations of men would begin, and the killing would not halt until all lay prostrate at the feet of the Moradel, as was proper. And the Moradel would serve one master, Mermandamus. He turned and faced those most loyal to him, in the flickering light of their torches, madness danced in his eyes. His voice was the only sound in the ancient halls, a harsh whisper that grated upon the ear. How many human slaves have our raiders captured to pull our siege engines? One of the captains said, Several hundred, master. Kill them all, at once. The captain ran to carry out the order, and Mamandamus felt a lessening of the rage within as the prisoner's deaths atoned for Murad's failure. In near hissing tones, Mamandamus said, We have erred, oh my children. Too soon did we gather to regain that which is rightfully our heritage. In a year when the snows again have melted from the peaks, we again will gather, and then shall all who oppose us know terror. He paced about the hall, a figure of stunning power, a fey brilliant surrounding him in an almost perceptible halo. His magnetism was nearly palpable. After a silent time, he spun towards the Pantathian. We leave. Prepare the gate. The serpent nodded, while the black slayers took their positions along the wall. When each was situated in a niche, a field of green energy surrounded them. Each became rigid, a statue in his private nook, awaiting the summons that would come next summer. The Pantathian finished a long incantation, and a shimmering silver field appeared in the air. Without another word, Mamandamus and the Pantathian stepped through the gate, leaving Sar Sargoth for some place known only to himself and Kathos. The gate winked out of existence. Silence dominated the hall. Then, outside, the screams of the dying prisoners began to fill the night. End.